Book Six, Chapter Six, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Six. During the first weeks of his stay in Petersburg, Prince Andrew felt the whole trend of thought he had formed during his life of seclusion quite overshadowed by the trifling cares that engrossed him in that city. On returning home in the evening, he would jot down in his notebook four or five necessary calls or appointments for certain hours. The mechanism of life, the arrangement of the day so as to be in time everywhere, absorbed the greater part of his vital energy. He did nothing, did not even think or find time to think, but only talked, and talked successfully, of what he had thought while in the country. He sometimes noticed with dissatisfaction that he repeated the same remark on the same day in different circles. But he was so busy for whole days together that he had no time to notice that he was thinking of nothing. As he had done on their first meeting at Kochebe's, Speransky produced a strong impression on Prince Andrew on the Wednesday when he received him tete-a-tete -at, -tete at his own house and talked to him long and confidentially. To Bolkonsky so many people appeared contemptible and insignificant creatures, and he so longed to find in someone the living ideal of that perfection toward which he strove, that he readily believed that in Speransky he had found this ideal of a perfectly rational and virtuous man. Had Speransky sprung from the same class as himself and possessed the same breeding and traditions, Bolkonsky would soon have discovered his weak, human, unheroic sides. But as it was, Speransky's strange and logical turn of mind inspired him with respect all the more because he did not quite understand him. Moreover, Speransky, either because he appreciated the other's capacity, or because he considered it necessary to win him to his side, showed off his dispassionate calm reasonableness before Prince Andrew, and flattered him with that subtle flattery which goes hand in hand with self-assurance and consists in a tacit assumption that one's companion is the only man besides oneself capable of understanding the folly of the rest of mankind, and the reasonableness and profundity of one's own ideas. During their long conversation on Wednesday evening, Speransky more than once remarked, "'We regard everything that is above the common level of rooted custom,' or, with a smile, "'But we want the wolves to be fed and the sheep to be safe.' or, they cannot understand this, and all in a way that seemed to say, we, you and I, understand what they are and who we are. This first long conversation with Speransky only strengthened in Prince Andrew the feeling he had experienced toward him at their first meeting. He saw in him a remarkable, clear-thinking man of vast intellect, who by his energy and persistence had attained power, which he was using solely for the welfare of Russia. In Prince Andrew's eyes, Speransky was the man he would himself have wished to be, one who explained all the facts of life reasonably, considered important only what was rational, and was capable of applying the standard of reason to everything. Everything seemed so simple and clear in Speransky's exposition that Prince Andrew involuntarily agreed with him about everything. If he replied and argued, it was only because he wished to maintain his independence and not submit to Speransky's opinions entirely. Everything was right, and everything was as it should be. Only one thing disconcerted Prince Andrew. This was Speransky's cold, mirror-like look, which did not allow one to penetrate to his soul, and his delicate white hands, which Prince Andrew involuntarily watched as one does watch the hands of those who possess power. This mirror-like gaze and those delicate hands irritated Prince Andrew. He knew not why. He was unpleasantly struck, too, by the excessive contempt for others that he observed in Speransky, and by the diversity of lines of argument he used to support his opinions. He made use of every kind of mental device, except analogy, and passed too boldly, it seemed to Prince Andrew, from one to another. Now he would take up the position of a practical man and condemn dreamers, now that of a satirist and laugh ironically at his opponents, now grow severely logical 
or suddenly rise to the realm of metaphysics. This last resource was one he very frequently employed. He would transfer a question to metaphysical heights, pass on to definitions of space, time and thought, and having deduced the refutation he needed, would again descend to the level of the original discussion. In general, the trait of Speransky's mentality which struck Prince Andrew most was his absolute and unshakable belief in the power and authority of reason. It was evident that the thought could never occur to him which to Prince Andrew seemed so natural, namely, that it is after all impossible to express all one thinks, and that he had never felt the doubt, is not all I think and believe nonsense? And it was just this peculiarity of Speransky's mind that particularly attracted Prince Andrew. During the first period of their acquaintance, Bolkonsky felt a passionate admiration for him, similar to that which he had once felt for Bonaparte. The fact that Speransky was the son of a village priest, and that stupid people might meanly despise him on account of his humble origin, as in fact many did, caused Prince Andrew to cherish his sentiment for him the more, and unconsciously to strengthen it. On that first evening Bolkonsky spent with him, having mentioned the commission for the revision of the Code of Laws, Speransky told him sarcastically that the commission had existed for a hundred and fifty years, had cost millions, and had done nothing, except that Rosenkamp had stuck labels on the corresponding paragraphs of the different codes. "'And that is all the State has for the millions it has spent,' said he. "'We want to give the Senate new juridical powers, but we have no laws.' That is why it is a sin for men like you, Prince, not to serve in these times." Prince Andrew said that for that work an education in jurisprudence was needed which he did not possess. But nobody possesses it, so what would you have? It is a vicious circle from which we must break a way out. A week later Prince Andrew was a member of the Committee on Army Regulations, and, what he had not at all expected, was chairman of a section of the Committee for the Revision of Laws. At Speransky's request, he took the first part of the Civil Code that was being drawn up, and with the aid of the Code Napoleon and the Institutes of Justinian, he worked at formulating the section on personal rights. End of Book Six, Chapter Six Book Six, Chapter Seven, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Seven. Nearly two years before this, in 1808, Pierre, on returning to Petersburg after visiting his estates, had involuntarily found himself in a leading position among the Petersburg Freemasons. He arranged dining and funeral lodge meetings, enrolled new members, and busied himself uniting various lodges and acquiring authentic charters. He gave money for the erection of temples, and supplemented as far as he could the collection of alms, in regard to which the majority of members were stingy and irregular. He supported almost single-handed a poorhouse the order had founded in Petersburg. His life, meanwhile, continued as before, with the same infatuations and dissipations. He liked to dine and drink well, and though he considered it immoral and humiliating, could not resist the temptations of the bachelor circles in which he moved. Amid the turmoil of his activities and distractions, however, Pierre at the end of a year began to feel that the more firmly he tried to rest upon it, the more Masonic ground on which he stood gave way under him. At the same time he felt that the deeper the ground sank under him, the closer bound he involuntarily became to the order. When he had joined the Freemasons, he had experienced the feeling of one who confidently steps onto the smooth surface of a bog. When he put his foot down, it sank in. To make quite sure of the firmness of the ground, he put his other foot down, and sank deeper still, became stuck in it, and involuntarily waded knee-deep in the bog. Joseph Alexeyevich was not in Petersburg. He had of late stood aside from the affairs of the Petersburg lodges, and lived almost entirely in Moscow. All the members of the lodges were men Pierre knew in ordinary life. 
and it was difficult for him to regard them merely as brothers in Freemasonry, and not as Prince B. or Ivan Vasilievich D., whom he knew in society mostly as weak and insignificant men. Under the Masonic aprons and insignia he saw the uniforms and decorations at which they aimed in ordinary life. Often after collecting alms, and reckoning up twenty to thirty roubles received for the most part in promises from a dozen members, of whom half were as well able to pay as himself, Pierre remembered the Masonic vow in which each brother promised to devote all his belongings to his neighbor, and doubts on which he tried not to dwell arose in his soul. He divided the brothers he knew into four categories. In the first he put those who did not take an active part in the affairs of the lodges or in human affairs, but were exclusively occupied with the mystical science of the order, with questions of the threefold designation of God, the three primordial elements, sulphur, mercury, and salt, or the meaning of the square and all the various figures of the Temple of Solomon. Pierre respected this class of brothers to which the elder ones chiefly belonged, including, Pierre thought, Joseph Alexeyevich himself but he did not share their interests. His heart was not in the mystical aspect of Freemasonry. In the second category Pierre reckoned himself and others like him, seeking and vacillating, who had not yet found in Freemasonry a straight and comprehensible path but hoped to do so. In the third category he included those brothers, the majority, who saw nothing in Freemasonry but the external forms and ceremonies and prized the strict performance of these forms without troubling about their purport or significance. Such were Wolarski and even the Grand Master of the Principal Lodge. Finally, to the fourth category also a great many brothers belonged, particularly those who had lately joined. These, according to Pierre's observations, were men who had no belief in anything, nor desire for anything but joined the Freemasons merely to associate with the wealthy young brothers who were influential through their connections or rank, and of whom there were very many in the lodge. Pierre began to feel dissatisfied with what he was doing. Freemasonry, at any rate as he saw it here, sometimes seemed to him based merely on externals. He did not think of doubting Freemasonry itself but suspected that Russian masonry had taken a wrong path and deviated from its original principles. And so, toward the end of the year, he went abroad to be initiated into the higher secrets of the order. In the summer of 1809 Pierre returned to Petersburg. Our Freemasons knew from correspondence with those abroad that Bezukhov had obtained the confidence of many highly placed persons, had been initiated into many mysteries, had been raised to a higher grade and was bringing back with him much that might conduce to the advantage of the Masonic cause in Russia. The Petersburg Freemasons all came to see him, tried to ingratiate themselves with him, and it seemed to them all that he was preparing something for them and concealing it. A solemn meeting of the Lodge of the Second Degree was convened, at which Pierre promised to communicate to the Petersburg brothers what he had to deliver to them from the highest leaders of their order. The meeting was a full one. After the usual ceremonies Pierre rose and began his address. "'Dear brothers,' he began blushing and stammering, with a written speech in his hand, "'it is not sufficient to observe our mysteries in the seclusion of our lodge. We must act, act. We are drowsing, but we must act.' Pierre raised his notebook and began to read. For the dissemination of pure truth and to secure the triumph of virtue, he read, we must cleanse men from prejudice, diffuse principles in harmony with the spirit of the times, undertake the education of the young, unite ourselves in indissoluble bonds with the wisest men, boldly yet prudently overcome superstitions, infidelity and folly, and form of those devoted to us a body linked together by unity of purpose and possessed of authority and power. To attain this end we must secure a preponderance of virtue over vice, and must endeavor to secure that the honest man may, even in this world, receive a lasting reward for his virtue. But in these great endeavors we are gravely hampered by the political institutions of today. What is to be done in these circumstances? To favor revolutions, overthrow everything, repel force by force? 
No. We are very far from that. Every violent reform deserves censure, for it quite fails to remedy evil while men remain what they are, and also because wisdom needs no violence. The whole plan of our order should be based on the idea of preparing men of firmness and virtue bound together by unity of conviction, aiming at the punishment of vice and folly, and patronizing talent and virtue, raising worthy men from the dust and attaching them to our brotherhood. Only then will our order have the power unobtrusively to bind the hands of the protectors of disorder and to control them without their being aware of it. In a word, we must found a form of government holding universal sway, which should be diffused over the whole world without destroying the bonds of citizenship, and beside which all other governments can continue in their customary course and do everything except what impedes the great aim of our order, which is to obtain for virtue the victory over vice. This aim was that of Christianity itself. It taught men to be wise and good and for their own benefit to follow the example and instruction of the best and wisest men. At that time, when everything was plunged in darkness, preaching alone was of course sufficient. The novelty of truth endowed her with special strength, but now we need much more powerful methods. It is now necessary that man, governed by his senses, should find in virtue a charm palpable to those senses. It is impossible to eradicate the passions, but we must strive to direct them to a noble aim, and it is therefore necessary that everyone should be able to satisfy his passions within the limits of virtue. Our order should provide means to that end. As soon as we have a certain number of worthy men in every state, each of them again training to others and all being closely united, everything will be possible for our order, which has already in secret accomplished much for the welfare of mankind." This speech not only made a strong impression, but created excitement in the lodge. The majority of the brothers, seeing in it dangerous signs of Illuminism, the Illuminati sought to substitute Republican for monarchical institutions, met it with a coldness that surprised Pierre. The Grand Master began answering him, and Pierre began developing his views with more and more warmth. It was long since there had been so stormy a meeting. Parties were formed, some accusing Pierre of Illuminism, others supporting him. At that meeting he was struck for the first time by the endless variety of men's minds, which prevents a truth from ever presenting itself identically to two persons. Even those members who seemed to be on his side understood him in their own way with limitations and alterations he could not agree to, as what he always wanted most was to convey his thought to others just as he himself understood it. At the end of the meeting the Grand Master with irony and ill-will reproved Bazukov for his vehemence, and said it was not love of virtue alone, but also a love of strife that had moved him in the dispute. Pierre did not answer him, and asked briefly whether his proposal would be accepted. He was told that it would not, and without waiting for the usual formalities he left the lodge and went home. End of Book Six, Chapter Seven Book Six, Chapter Eight of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Eight. Again, Pierre was overtaken by the depression he so dreaded. For three days after the delivery of his speech at the lodge, he lay on a sofa at home, receiving no one and going nowhere. It was just then that he received a letter from his wife, who implored him to see her telling him how grieved she was about him and how she wished to devote her whole life to him. At the end of the letter she informed him that in a few days she would return to Petersburg from abroad. Following this letter, one of the Masonic brothers, whom Pierre respected less than the others, forced his way in to see him, and turning the conversation upon Pierre's matrimonial affairs, by way of fraternal advice expressed the opinion that his severity to his wife was wrong and that he was neglecting one of the first rules of Freemasonry by not forgiving the penitent. 
at the same time his mother-in-law, Prince Vasily's wife, sent to him imploring him to come, if only for a few minutes, to discuss a most important matter. Pierre saw that there was a conspiracy against him, and that they wanted to reunite him with his wife, and in the mood he then was, this was not even unpleasant to him. Nothing mattered to him, nothing in life seemed to him of much importance, and under the influence of the depression that possessed him he valued neither his liberty nor his resolution to punish his wife. No one is right, and no one is to blame. So she too is not to blame, he thought. If he did not at once give his consent to a reunion with his wife, it was only because in his state of depression he did not feel able to take any step. Had his wife come to him, he would not have turned her away. Compared to what preoccupied him, was it not a matter of indifference whether he lived with his wife or not? Without replying either to his wife or his mother-in-law, Pierre late one night prepared for a journey and started from Moscow to see Joseph Alexeyevich. This is what he noted in his diary. Moscow, 17th November. I have just returned from my benefactor and hastened to write down what I have experienced. Joseph Alexeyevich is living poorly and has for three years been suffering from a painful disease of the bladder. No one has ever heard him utter a groan or a word of complaint. From morning till late at night, except when he eats his very plain food, he is working at science. He received me graciously and made me sit down on the bed on which he lay. I made the sign of the Knights of the East and of Jerusalem, and he responded in the same manner, asking me with a mild smile what I had learned and gained in the Prussian and Scottish lodges. I told him everything as best I could, and told him what I had proposed to our Petersburg lodge, of the bad reception I had encountered, and of my rupture with the brothers. Joseph Alexeyevich, having remained silent and thoughtful for a good while, told me his view of the matter, which at once lit up for me my whole past and the future path I should follow. He surprised me by asking whether I remembered the threefold aim of the order. One, the preservation and study of the mystery. Two, the purification and reformation of oneself for its reception. And three, the improvement of the human race by striving for such purification. Which is the principal aim of these three? Certainly, self-reformation and self-purification. Only to this aim can we always strive independently of circumstances. But at the same time, just this aim demands the greatest efforts of us. And so, led astray by pride, losing sight of this aim, we occupy ourselves either with the mystery which in our impurity we are unworthy to receive, or seek the reformation of the human race while ourselves setting an example of baseness and profligacy. Illuminism is not a pure doctrine, just because it is attracted by social activity and puffed up by pride. On this ground, Joseph Alexeyevich condemned my speech and my whole activity, and in the depth of my soul I agreed with him. Talking of my family affairs, he said to me, The chief duty of a true mason, as I have told you, lies in perfecting himself. We often think that, by removing all the difficulties of our life, we shall more quickly reach our aim, but on the contrary, my dear sir, it is only in the midst of worldly cares that we can attain our three chief aims. One, self-knowledge, for man can only know himself by comparison. Two, self-perfecting, which can only be attained by conflict. And three, the attainment of the chief virtue, love of death. Only the vicissitudes of life can show us its vanity and develop our innate love of death or of rebirth to a new life. These words are all the more remarkable because, in spite of his great physical sufferings, Joseph Alexeyevich is never weary of life, though he loves death, for which, in spite of the purity and loftiness of his inner man, he does not yet feel himself sufficiently prepared. My benefactor then explained to me fully the meaning of the great square of creation, and pointed out to me that the numbers three and seven are the basis of everything. He advised me not to avoid intercourse with the Petersburg brothers, but to take up only second-grade posts in the lodge, to try, while diverting the brothers from pride, to turn them toward the true path, self-knowledge, and self-perfecting. Besides this, 
he advised me for myself personally, above all to keep a watch over myself, and to that end he gave me a notebook, the one I am now writing in, and in which I will in future note down all my actions. Petersburg, 23rd November I am again living with my wife. My mother-in-law came to me in tears, and said that Elaine was here and that she implored me to hear her, that she was innocent and unhappy at my desertion, and much more. I knew that if I once let myself see her, I should not have strength to go on refusing what she wanted. In my perplexity I did not know whose aid and advice to seek. Had my benefactor been here, he would have told me what to do. I went to my room and re-read Joseph Alexeyevich's letters, and recalled my conversations with him, and deduced from it all that I ought not to refuse a supplicant, and ought to reach a helping hand to every one, especially to one so closely bound to me, and that I must bear my cross. But if I forgive her for the sake of doing right, then let union with her have only a spiritual aim. That is what I decided, and what I wrote to Joseph Alexeyevich. I told my wife that I begged her to forget the past, to forgive me whatever wrong I may have done her, and that I had nothing to forgive. It gave me joy to tell her this. She did not know how hard it was for me to see her again. I have settled on the upper floor of this big house and am experiencing a happy feeling of regeneration. End of Book Six, Chapter Eight Book Six, Chapter Nine of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Nine. At that time, as always happens, the highest society that met at court and at the grand balls was divided into several circles, each with its own particular tone. The largest of these was the French circle of the Napoleonic alliance, the circle of Count Romyantsev and Kolinkor. In this group Hélène, as soon as she had settled in Petersburg with her husband, took a very prominent place. She was visited by the members of the French embassy, and by many belonging to that circle and noted for their intellect and polished manners. Elaine had been at Erfurt during the famous meeting of the emperors, and had brought from there these connections with the Napoleonic notabilities. At Erfurt her success had been brilliant. Napoleon himself had noticed her in the theatre and said of her, C'est un superbe animal. That's a superb animal. Her success as a beautiful and elegant woman did not surprise Pierre, for she had become even handsomer than before. What did surprise him was that during these last two years his wife had succeeded in gaining the reputation d'une femme charmante aussi spirituelle que belle, of a charming woman as witty as she is lovely. The distinguished Prince de Ligne wrote her eight-page letters. Belieben saved up his epigrams to produce them in Countess Bezukhova's presence. To be received in the Countess Bezukhova's salon was regarded as a diploma of intellect. Young men read books before attending Elaine's evenings, to have something to say in her salon, and secretaries of the embassy and even ambassadors confided diplomatic secrets to her, so that in a way Elaine was a power. Pierre, who knew she was very stupid, sometimes attended, with a strange feeling of perplexity and fear her evenings and dinner-parties where politics, poetry, and philosophy were discussed. At these parties his feelings were like those of a conjurer who always expects his trick to be found out any moment. But whether because stupidity was just what was needed to run such a salon, or because those who were deceived found pleasure in the deception, at any rate it remained unexposed and Elaine Bezukhova's reputation as a lovely and clever woman became so firmly established that she could say the emptiest and stupidest things, and everybody would go into raptures over every word of hers and look for a profound meaning in it of which she herself had no conception. Pierre was just the husband needed for a brilliant society woman. He was that absent-minded crank 
a grand seigneur husband who was in no one's way, and far from spoiling the high tone and general impression of the drawing-room, he served by the contrast he presented to her as an advantageous background to his elegant and tactful wife. Pierre, during the last two years, as a result of his continual absorption in abstract interests and his sincere contempt for all else, had acquired in his wife's circle, which did not interest him, that air of unconcern, indifference, and benevolence toward all, which cannot be acquired artificially, and therefore inspires involuntary respect. He entered his wife's drawing-room as one enters a theater, was acquainted with everybody, equally pleased to see everyone, and equally indifferent to them all. Sometimes he joined in a conversation which interested him, and regardless of whether any gentlemen of the embassy were present or not, lispingly expressed his views, which were sometimes not at all in accord with the accepted tone of the moment. But the general opinion concerning the queer husband of the most distinguished woman in Petersburg was so well established that no one took his freak seriously. Among the many young men who frequented her house every day, Boris Drubetskoy, who had already achieved great success in the service, was the most intimate friend of the Bazukov household since Elaine's return from Erfurt. Elaine spoke of him as Montpage and treated him like a child. Her smile for him was the same as for everybody, but sometimes that smile made Pierre uncomfortable. Toward him Boris behaved with a particularly dignified and sad deference. This shade of deference also disturbed Pierre. He had suffered so painfully three years before from the mortification to which his wife had subjected him that he now protected himself from the danger of its reputation, first by not being a husband to his wife, and secondly by not allowing himself to suspect. No, now that she has become a blue-stocking, she has finally renounced her former infatuations, he told himself. There has never been an instance of a blue-stocking being carried away by affairs of the heart. A statement which, though gathered from an unknown source, he believed implicitly. Yet, strange to say, Boris's presence in his wife's drawing-room, and he was almost always there, had a physical effect upon Pierre. It constricted his limbs and destroyed the unconsciousness and freedom of his movements. What a strange antipathy, thought Pierre. Yet I used to like him very much. In the eyes of the world Pierre was a great gentleman, the rather blind and absurd husband of a distinguished wife, a clever crank, who did nothing but harm nobody and was a first-rate, good-natured fellow. But a complex and difficult process of internal development was taking place all this time in Pierre's soul, revealing much to him and causing him many spiritual doubts and joys. End of Book Six, Chapter Nine. Book Six, Chapter Ten of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Ten. Pierre went on with his diary, and this is what he wrote in it during that time. 24th November. Got up at eight, read the scriptures, then went to my duties. By Joseph Alexeyevich's advice, Pierre had entered the service of the state and served on one of the committees. Returned home for dinner and dined alone. The countess had many visitors I do not like. I ate and drank moderately, and after dinner copied out some passages for the brothers. In the evening I went down to the countess and told a funny story about B., and only remember that I ought not to have done so when everybody laughed loudly at it. I am going to bed with a happy and tranquil mind. Great God, help me to walk in thy paths, one, to conquer anger by calmness and deliberation, two, to vanquish lust by self-restraint and repulsion, three, to withdraw from worldliness, but not to avoid, a, the service of the state, b, family duties, see relations with my friends, and the management of my affairs. 27th November I got up late. On waking I lay long in bed yielding to sloth. 
O God, help and strengthen me that I may walk in Thy ways. Read the scriptures, but without proper feeling. Brother Yurusov came and we talked about worldly vanities. He told me of the Emperor's new projects. I began to criticize them, but remembered my rules and my benefactor's words, that a true Freemason should be a zealous worker for the State when his aid is required, and a quiet onlooker when not called on to assist. My tongue is my enemy. Brothers G, V, and O visited me, and we had a preliminary talk about the reception of a new brother. They laid on me the duty of a redder. I feel myself weak and unworthy. Then our talk turned to the interpretation of the seven pillars and steps of the temple, the seven sciences, the seven virtues, the seven vices, and the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Brother O was very eloquent. In the evening the admission took place. The new decoration of the premises contributed much to the magnificence of the spectacle. It was Boris Drubetskoy who was admitted. I nominated him and was the redder. A strange feeling agitated me all the time I was alone with him in the dark chamber. I caught myself harboring a feeling of hatred toward him, which I vainly tried to overcome. That is why I should really like to save him from evil and lead him into the path of truth, but evil thoughts of him did not leave me. It seemed to me that his object in entering the Brotherhood was merely to be intimate and in favor with members of our lodge. Apart from the fact that he had asked me several times whether N and S were members of our lodge, a question to which I could not reply, and that, according to my observation, he is incapable of feeling respect for our holy order and is too preoccupied and satisfied with the outer man to desire spiritual improvement, I had no cause to doubt him, but he seemed to me insincere and all the time I stood alone with him in the dark temple it seemed to me that he was smiling contemptuously at my words, and I wished really to stab his bare breast with the sword I held to it. I could not be eloquent, nor could I frankly mention my doubts to the brothers and to the Grand Master. Great architect of nature, help me to find the true path out of the labyrinth of lies. After this three pages were left blank in the diary and then the following was written. I have had a long and instructive talk alone with Brother V, who advised me to hold fast by Brother A. Though I am unworthy, much was revealed to me. Adonai is the name of the Creator of the world. Elohim is the name of the Ruler of all. The third name is the name unutterable which means the All. Talks with Brother V strengthen, refresh, and support me in the path of virtue. In his presence doubt has no place. The distinction between the poor teachings of mundane science and our sacred all-embracing teaching is clear to me. Human sciences dissect everything to comprehend it, and kill everything to examine it. In the holy science of our order all is one, all is known in its entirety and life. The Trinity, the three elements of matter are sulfur, mercury, and salt. Sulfur is of an oily and fiery nature. In combination with salt, by its fiery nature, it arouses a desire in the latter by means of which it attracts mercury, seizes it, holds it, and in combination produces other bodies. Mercury is a fluid, volatile, spiritual essence. Christ, the Holy Spirit, Him. 3rd December. Awoke late, read the scriptures, but was apathetic. Afterwards went and paced up and down the large hall. I wished to meditate, but instead my imagination pictured an occurrence of four years ago, when Dolokhov, meeting me in Moscow after our duel, said he hoped I was enjoying perfect peace of mind in spite of my wife's absence. At the time I gave no answer. Now I recalled every detail of that meeting, and in my mind gave him the most malevolent and bitter replies. I recollected myself and drove away that thought only when I found myself glowing with anger, but I did not sufficiently repent. Afterwards Boris Drubetskoy came and began relating various adventures. His coming vexed me from the first, and I said something disagreeable to him. He replied, 
I flared up and said much that was unpleasant and even rude to him. He became silent, and I recollected myself only when it was too late. My God, I cannot get on with him at all. The cause of this is my egotism. I set myself above him, and so become much worse than he, for he is lenient to my rudeness, while I, on the contrary, nourish contempt for him. O oh God, grant that in his presence I may rather see my own vileness, and behave so that he too may benefit. After dinner I fell asleep, and as I was drowsing off, I clearly heard a voice saying in my left ear, Thy day. I dreamed that I was walking in the dark, and was suddenly surrounded by dogs, but I went on undismayed. Suddenly a smallish dog seized my left thigh with its teeth and would not let go. I began to throttle it with my hands. Scarcely had I torn it off before another bigger one began biting me. I lifted it up, but the higher I lifted it, the bigger and heavier it grew. And suddenly Brother A came, and taking my arm, led me to a building, to enter which we had to pass along a narrow plank. I stepped on it, but it bent and gave way, and I began to clamber up a fence which I could scarcely reach with my hands. After much effort I dragged myself up, so that my leg hung down on one side and my body on the other. I looked round and saw Brother A standing on the fence and pointing me to a broad avenue and garden, and in the garden was a large and beautiful building. I woke up. O oh Lord, great architect of nature, help me to tear from myself these dogs, my passions, especially the last, which unites in itself the strength of all the former ones, and aid me to enter that temple of virtue to a vision of which I attained in my dream. 7th December I dreamed that Joseph Alexeyevich was sitting in my house, and that I was very glad and wished to entertain him. It seemed as if I chattered incessantly with other people and suddenly remembered that this could not please him, and I wished to come close to him and embrace him. But as soon as I drew near I saw that his face had changed and grown young, and he was quietly telling me something about the teaching of our order, but so softly that I could not hear it. Then it seemed that we all left the room and something strange happened. We were sitting or lying on the floor. He was telling me something, and I wished to show him my sensibility, and not listening to what he was saying, I began picturing to myself the condition of my inner man and the grace of God sanctifying me. And tears came into my eyes, and I was glad he noticed this. But he looked at me with vexation and jumped up, breaking off his remarks. I felt abashed, and asked whether what he had been saying did not concern me, but he did not reply gave me a kind look, and then we suddenly found ourselves in my bedroom where there is a double bed. He lay down on the edge of it, and I burned with longing to caress him and lie down too. And he said, Tell me frankly what is your chief temptation. Do you know it? I think you know it already. Abashed by this question, I replied that sloth was my chief temptation. He shook his head incredulously, and even more abashed, I said that, though I was living with my wife as he advised, I was not living with her as her husband. To this he replied that one should not deprive a wife of one's embraces, and gave me to understand that that was my duty. But I replied that I should be ashamed to do it, and suddenly everything vanished. And I awoke, and found in my mind the text from the Gospel, The life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Joseph Alexeyevich's face had looked young and bright. That day I received a letter from my benefactor in which he wrote about conjugal duties. 9th December I had a dream from which I awoke with a throbbing heart. I saw that I was in Moscow in my house, in the big sitting-room, and Joseph Alexeyevich came in from the drawing-room. I seemed to know at once that the process of regeneration had already taken place in him, and I rushed to meet him. I embraced him and kissed his hands, and he said, Hast thou noticed that my face is different? 
I looked at him, still holding him in my arms, and saw that his face was young, but that he had no hair on his head, and his features were quite changed. And I said, I should have known you had I met you by chance. And I thought to myself, am I telling the truth? And suddenly I saw him lying like a dead body. Then he gradually recovered and went with me into my study carrying a large book of sheets of drawing paper. I said, I drew that, and he answered by bowing his head. I opened the book, and on all the pages there were excellent drawings. And in my dream I knew that these drawings represented the love adventures of the soul with its beloved. And on its pages I saw a beautiful representation of a maiden in transparent garments and with a transparent body flying up to the clouds. And I seemed to know that this maiden was nothing else than a representation of the Song of Songs. And looking at those drawings, I dreamed I felt that I was doing wrong, but could not tear myself away from them. Lord, help me! My God, if thy forsaking me is thy doing, thy will be done! But if I am myself the cause, teach me what I should do! I shall perish of my debauchery if thou utterly desertest me! End of Book Six, Chapter Ten Book Six, Chapter Eleven of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Eleven. The Rostovs' monetary affairs had not improved during the two years they had spent in the country. Though Nicholas Rostov had kept firmly to his resolution and was still serving modestly in an obscure regiment, spending comparatively little, the way of life at Otradno, Matenka's management of affairs in particular, was such that the debts inevitably increased every year. The only resource obviously presenting itself to the old count was to apply for an official post, so he had come to Petersburg to look for one, and also, as he said, to let the lassies enjoy themselves for the last time. Soon after their arrival in Petersburg, Berg proposed to Vera and was accepted. Though in Moscow the Rostovs belonged to the best society without themselves giving it a thought, yet in Petersburg their circle of acquaintances was a mixed and indefinite one. In Petersburg they were provincials, and the very people they had entertained in Moscow without inquiring to what set they belonged, here looked down on them. The Rostovs lived in the same hospitable way in Petersburg as in Moscow, and the most diverse people met at their suppers. Country neighbors from Otradno, impoverished old squires and their daughters, Perinskaya, a maid of honor, Pierre Bezukhov, and the son of their district postmaster who had obtained a post in Petersburg. Among the men who very soon became frequent visitors at the Rostovs' house in Petersburg were Boris, Pierre, whom the Count had met in the street and dragged home with him, and Berg, who spent whole days at the Rostovs and paid the eldest daughter, Countess Vera, the attentions a young man pays when he intends to propose. Not in vain had Berg shown everybody his right hand wounded at Austerlitz and held a perfectly unnecessary sword in his left. He narrated that episode so persistently and with so important an air that everyone believed in the merit and usefulness of his deed, and he had obtained two decorations for Austerlitz. In the Finnish war he also managed to distinguish himself. He had picked up the scrap of a grenade that had killed an aide-de-camp standing near the commander-in-chief, and had taken it to his commander. Just as he had done after Austerlitz, he related this occurrence at such length and so insistently that everyone again believed it had been necessary to do this, and he received two decorations for the Finnish war also. In 1809 he was a captain in the guards, wore medals, and held some special lucrative posts in Petersburg. Though some skeptics smiled when told of Berg's merits, it could not be denied that he was a painstaking and brave officer, on excellent terms with his superiors, and a moral young man with a brilliant career before him and an assured position in society. Four years before, meeting a German comrade in the stalls of a Moscow theatre, 
Berg had pointed out Vera Rostova to him and had said in German, Das soll mein Weib werden, that girl shall be my wife, and from that moment had made up his mind to marry her. Now in Petersburg, having considered the Rostovs' position and his own, he decided that the time had come to propose. Berg's proposal was at first received with a perplexity that was not flattering to him. At first it seemed strange that the son of an obscure Livonian gentleman should propose marriage to a Countess Rostova. But Berg's chief characteristic was such a naive and good-natured egotism that the Rostovs involuntarily came to think it would be a good thing, since he himself was so firmly convinced that it was good, indeed excellent. Moreover, the Rostovs' affairs were seriously embarrassed, as the suitor could not but know. And above all, Vera was twenty-four, had been taken out everywhere, and though she was certainly good-looking and sensible, no one up to now had proposed to her. So they gave their consent. "'You see,' said Berg to his comrade, whom he called friend only because he knew that everyone has friends, "'you see, I have considered it all and should not marry if I had not thought it all out, or if it were in any way unsuitable. But on the contrary, my papa and mamma are now provided for. I have arranged that rent for them in the Baltic provinces, and I can live in Petersburg on my pay, and with her fortune and my good management we can get along nicely. I am not marrying for money. I consider that dishonorable. But a wife should bring her share and a husband his. I have my position in the service. She has connections and some means. In our times that is worth something, isn't it? But, above all, she is a handsome, estimable girl, and she loves me." Berg blushed and smiled. And I love her, because her character is sensible and very good. Now the other sister, though they are the same family, is quite different an unpleasant character, and has not the same intelligence. She is so, you know, unpleasant. But my fiancé, well, you will be coming, he was going to say, to dine, but changed his mind and said, to take tea with us. And quickly doubling up his tongue, he blew a small round ring of tobacco smoke, perfectly embodying his dream of happiness. After the first feeling of perplexity aroused in the parents by Berg's proposal, the holiday tone of joyousness usual at such times took possession of the family, but the rejoicing was external and insincere. In the family's feeling toward this wedding a certain awkwardness and constraint was evident, as if they were ashamed of not having loved Vera sufficiently, and of being so ready to get her off their hands. The old Count felt this most he would probably have been unable to state the cause of his embarrassment, but it resulted from the state of his affairs. He did not know at all how much he had, what his debts amounted to, or what dowry he could give Vera. When his daughters were born, he had assigned to each of them, for her dowry, an estate with three hundred serfs. But one of these estates had already been sold, and the other was mortgaged and the interest so much in arrears that it would have to be sold, so that it was impossible to give it to Vera. Nor had he any money. Berg had already been engaged a month, and only a week remained before the wedding, but the Count had not yet decided in his own mind the question of the dowry, nor spoken to his wife about it. At one time the Count thought of giving her the Riazan estate, or of selling a forest. At another time of borrowing money on a note of hand. A few days before the wedding, Berg entered the Count's study early one morning, and with a pleasant smile respectfully asked his future father-in-law to let him know what Vera's dowry would be. The Count was so disconcerted by this long-foreseen inquiry that without consideration he gave the first reply that came into his head. "'I like your being businesslike about it. I like it. You shall be satisfied.' and patting Berg on the shoulder he got up, wishing to end the conversation. But Berg, smiling pleasantly, explained that if he did not know for certain how much Vera would have and did not receive at least part of the dowry in advance, he would have to break matters off. "'Because, consider, Count, 
If I allowed myself to marry now without having definite means to maintain my wife, I should be acting badly." The conversation ended by the Count, who wished to be generous and to avoid further importunity, saying that he would give a note of hand for eighty thousand roubles. Berg smiled meekly, kissed the Count on the shoulder, and said that he was very grateful, but that it was impossible for him to arrange his new life without receiving thirty thousand in ready money. Or at least twenty thousand, Count, he added, and then a note of hand for only sixty thousand. Yes, yes, all right, said the Count hurriedly. Only, excuse me, my dear fellow, I'll give you twenty thousand and a note of hand for eighty thousand as well. Yes, yes, kiss me. End of Book Six, Chapter Eleven. Book Six, Chapter Twelve, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twelve. Natasha was sixteen, and it was the year eighteen o nine the very year to which she had counted on her fingers with Boris after they had kissed four years ago. Since then she had not seen him. Before Sonia and her mother, if Boris happened to be mentioned, she spoke quite freely of that episode as of some childish, long-forgotten matter that was not worth mentioning. But in the secret depths of her soul the question whether her engagement to Boris was a jest or an important binding promise tormented her. Since Boris left Moscow in 1805 to join the army, he had not seen the Rostovs. He had been in Moscow several times, and had passed near Otradno, but had never been to see them. Sometimes it occurred to Natasha that he did not wish to see her, and this conjecture was confirmed by the sad tone in which her elders spoke of him. "'Nowadays old friends are not remembered,' the Countess would say when Boris was mentioned. Anna Mikhailovna also had of late visited them less frequently, seemed to hold herself with particular dignity, and always spoke rapturously and gratefully of the merits of her son and the brilliant career on which he had entered. When the Rostovs came to Petersburg, Boris called on them. He drove to their house in some agitation. The memory of Natasha was his most poetic recollection but he went with the firm intention of letting her and her parents feel that the childish relations between himself and Natasha could not be binding either on her or on him. He had a brilliant position in society thanks to his intimacy with Countess Bezukhova, a brilliant position in the service thanks to the patronage of an important personage whose complete confidence he enjoyed, and he was beginning to make plans for marrying one of the richest heiresses in Petersburg plans which might very easily be realized. When he entered the Rostovs' drawing-room, Natasha was in her own room. When she heard of his arrival she almost ran into the drawing-room, flushed and beaming with a more than cordial smile. Boris remembered Natasha in a short dress, with dark eyes shining from under her curls and boisterous childish laughter, as he had known her four years before. And so he was taken aback when quite a different Natasha entered and his face expressed rapturous astonishment. This expression on his face pleased Natasha. "'Well, do you recognize your little madcap playmate?' asked the Countess. Boris kissed Natasha's hand and said that he was astonished at the change in her. "'How handsome you have grown!' "'I should think so,' replied Natasha's laughing eyes. "'And is Papa older?' she asked. Natasha sat down and, without joining in Boris's conversation with the Countess, silently and minutely studied her childhood suitor. He felt the weight of that resolute and affectionate scrutiny and glanced at her occasionally. Boris's uniform, spurs, tie, and the way his hair was brushed were all comme faux and in the latest fashion. This Natasha noticed at once. He sat rather sideways in the armchair next to the Countess arranging with his right hand the cleanest of gloves that fitted his left hand like a skin, and he spoke with a particularly refined compression of his lips about the amusements of the highest Petersburg society, recalling with mild irony old times in Moscow and Moscow acquaintances. It was not accidentally, Natasha felt, that he alluded, when speaking of the highest aristocracy, to an ambassador's ball he had attended, 
and to invitations he had received from N.N. and S.S. All this time Natasha sat silent, glancing up at him from under her brows. This gaze disturbed and confused Boris more and more. He looked round more frequently toward her and broke off in what he was saying. He did not stay more than ten minutes, then rose and took his leave. The same inquisitive, challenging, and rather mocking eyes still looked at him. After his first visit, Boris said to himself that Natasha attracted him just as much as ever, but that he must not yield to that feeling, because to marry her, a girl almost without fortune, would mean ruin to his career, while to renew their former relations without intending to marry her would be dishonorable. Boris made up his mind to avoid meeting Natasha, but despite that resolution he called again a few days later, and began calling often and spending whole days at the Rostovs. It seemed to him that he ought to have an explanation with Natasha and tell her that the old times must be forgotten, that in spite of everything she could not be his wife, that he had no means and they would never let her marry him. But he failed to do so and felt awkward about entering on such an explanation. From day to day he became more and more entangled. It seemed to her mother and Sonia that Natasha was in love with Boris as of old. She sang him his favorite songs, showed him her album, making him write in it, did not allow him to allude to the past, letting it be understood how delightful was the present. And every day he went away in a fog, without having said what he meant to, and not knowing what he was doing, or why he came, or how it would all end. He left off visiting Elaine, and received reproachful notes from her every day, and yet he continued to spend whole days with the Rostovs. End of Book Six, Chapter Twelve. Book Six, Chapter Thirteen, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Thirteen. One night. When the old countess, in nightcap and dressing jacket, without her false curls and with her poor little knob of hair showing under her white cotton cap, knelt sighing and groaning on a rug and bowing to the ground in prayer, her door creaked, and Natasha, also in a dressing jacket with slippers on her bare feet and her hair in curl papers, ran in. The countess, her prayerful mood dispelled, looked round and frowned. She was finishing her last prayer. Can it be that this couch will be my grave? Natasha, flushed and eager, seeing her mother in prayer, suddenly checked her rush, half sat down, and unconsciously put out her tongue as if chiding herself. Seeing that her mother was still praying, she ran on tiptoe to the bed, and, rapidly slipping one little foot against the other, pushed off her slippers and jumped onto the bed the Countess had feared might become her grave. This couch was high, with a feather bed and five pillows each smaller than the one below. Natasha jumped on it, sank into the feather bed, rolled over to the wall, and began snuggling up the bedclothes as she settled down, raising her knees to her chin, kicking out and laughing almost inaudibly, now covering herself up head and all, and now peeping at her mother. The countess finished her prayers and came to the bed with a stern face, but seeing that Natasha's head was covered, she smiled in her kind, weak way. "'Now then, now then,' said she. Mama, can we have a talk, yes? said Natasha. Now just one on your throat and another, that'll do. And seizing her mother round the neck, she kissed her on the throat. In her behavior to her mother, Natasha seemed rough, but she was so sensitive and tactful that however she clasped her mother, she always managed to do it without hurting her or making her feel uncomfortable or displeased. Well, what is it tonight? said the mother, having arranged her pillows and waited until Natasha, after turning over a couple of times, had settled down beside her under the quilt, spread out her arms, and assumed a serious expression. These visits of Natasha's at night before the Count returned from his club were one of the greatest pleasures of both mother and daughter. "'What is it tonight? But I have to tell you—' Natasha put her hand on her mother's mouth. "'About Boris, I know,' she said seriously. That's what I have come about. Don't say it. I know. No, do tell me. And she removed her hand. Tell me, Mama. 
He's nice? Natasha, you are sixteen. At your age I was married. You say Boris is nice. He is very nice, and I like him like a son. But what then? What are you thinking about? You have quite turned his head, I can see that." As she said this the Countess looked round at her daughter. Natasha was lying looking steadily straight before her at one of the mahogany sphinxes carved on the corners of the bedstead, so that the Countess only saw her daughter's face in profile. That face struck her by its peculiarly serious and concentrated expression. Natasha was listening and considering. "'Well, what then?' said she. "'You have quite turned his head, and why? What do you want of him? You know you can't marry him.' "'Why not?' said Natasha, without changing her position. "'Because he is young, because he is poor, because he is a relation, and because you yourself don't love him. How do you know?' "'I know. It is not right, darling.' "'But if I want to,' said Natasha. "'Leave off talking nonsense,' said the Countess. "'But if I want to—' "'Natasha, I am in earnest.' Natasha did not let her finish. She drew the Countess' large hand to her, kissed it on the back and then on the palm, then again turned it over and began kissing first one knuckle, then the space between the knuckles, then the next knuckle, whispering, "'January? February? March?' April, May. Speak, Mama. Why don't you say anything? Speak," said she, turning to her mother, who was tenderly gazing at her daughter, and in that contemplation seemed to have forgotten all she had wished to say. It won't do, my love. Not every one will understand this friendship dating from your childish days, and to see him so intimate with you may injure you in the eyes of other young men who visit us, and above all it torments him for nothing. He may already have found a suitable and wealthy match, and now he's half crazy." "'Crazy?' repeated Natasha. "'I'll tell you some things about myself. I had a cousin. I know, Cyril Matveitch, but he is old. He was not always old. But this is what I'll do, Natasha. I'll have a talk with Boris. He'll need not come so often. Why not, if he likes to?' because I know it will end in nothing. How can you know? No, Mama, don't speak to him. What nonsense!" said Natasha, in the tone of one being deprived of her property. Well, I won't marry, but let him come if he enjoys it and I enjoy it. Natasha smiled and looked at her mother. Not to marry, but just so, she added. How so, my pet? Just so! There's no need for me to marry him, but just so." "'Just so, just so,' repeated the Countess, and shaking all over, she went off into a good-humoured, unexpected, elderly laugh. "'Don't laugh! Stop!' cried Natasha. "'You're shaking the whole bed! You're awfully like me, just such another giggler! Wait!' And she seized the Countess' hands and kissed a knuckle of the little finger, saying, "'June!' and continued kissing. July, August. On the other hand. But, Mama, is he very much in love? What do you think? Was anybody ever so much in love with you? And he's very nice, very, very nice. Only not quite my taste. He is so narrow, like the dining-room clock. Don't you understand? Narrow, you know. Gray, light gray. What rubbish you're talking! said the Countess. Natasha continued. Don't you really understand? Nicholas would understand. Bazukov now is blue, dark blue and red, and is square. You flirt with him, too, said the Countess, laughing. No, he is a Freemason, I have found out. He is fine, dark blue and red. How can I explain it to you? Little Countess, the Count's voice called from behind the door. You're not asleep?" Natasha jumped up, snatched up her slippers, and ran barefoot to her own room. It was a long time before she could sleep. She kept thinking that no one could understand all that she understood and all there was in her. "'Sonia?' 
she thought, glancing at her curled-up, sleeping little kitten with her enormous plate of hair. No, how could she? She's virtuous. She fell in love with Nicholas and does not wish to know anything more. Even Mama does not understand. It is wonderful how clever I am and how charming she is," she went on, speaking of herself in the third person, and imagining it was some very wise man, the wisest and best of men, who was saying it of her. "'There is everything, everything in her,' continued this man. "'She is unusually intelligent, charming, and then she is pretty, uncommonly pretty, and agile. She swims and rides splendidly, and her voice, one can really say it's a wonderful voice.' She hummed a scrap from her favorite opera by Cherubini, threw herself on her bed, laughed at the pleasant thought that she would immediately fall asleep, called Dunyasha the maid to put out the candle, and before Dunyasha had left the room had already passed into yet another happier world of dreams, where everything was as light and beautiful as in reality, and even more so because it was different. Next day the Countess called Boris aside and had a talk with him, after which he ceased coming to the Rostovs. End of Book Six, Chapter Thirteen Book Six, Chapter Fourteen Of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Fourteen. On the thirty-first of December, New Year's Eve, eighteen o nine ten, an old grandee of Catherine's day was giving a ball at midnight supper. The diplomatic corps and the emperor himself were to be present. The grandee's well-known mansion on the English Quay glittered with innumerable lights. Police were stationed at the brightly lit entrance, which was carpeted with red baize and not only gendarmes, but dozens of police officers and even the police master himself stood at the porch. Carriages kept driving away, and fresh ones arriving, with red liveried footmen and footmen in plumed hats. From the carriages emerged men wearing uniforms, stars, and ribbons, while ladies in satin and ermine cautiously descended the carriage steps which were let down for them with a clatter, and then walked hurriedly and noiselessly over the bays at the entrance. Almost every time a new carriage drove up, a whisper ran through the crowd and caps were doffed. "'The Emperor? No, a minister. Prince. Ambassador. Don't you see the plumes?' was whispered among the crowd. One person, better dressed than the rest, seemed to know everyone and mentioned by name the greatest dignitaries of the day. A third of the visitors had already arrived, but the Rostovs, who were to be present, were still hurrying to get dressed. There had been many discussions and preparations for this ball in the Rostov family, many fears that the invitation would not arrive, that the dresses would not be ready, or that something would not be arranged as it should be. Maria Ignatevna Peronskaya, a thin and shallow maid of honor at the court of the Dowager Empress, who was a friend and relation of the Countess and piloted the provincial Rostovs in Petersburg high society, was to accompany them to the ball. They were to call for her at her house in the Tarita Gardens at ten o'clock, but it was already five minutes to ten and the girls were not yet dressed. Natasha was going to her first grand ball. She had got up at eight that morning and had been in a fever of excitement and activity all day. All her powers since morning had been concentrated on ensuring that they all, she herself, Mama, and Sonia, should be as well dressed as possible. Sonia and her mother put themselves entirely in her hands. The Countess was to wear a claret-colored velvet dress, and the two girls white gauze over pink silk slips, with roses on their bodices and their hair dressed a la grecque. Everything essential had already been done. Feet, hands, necks, and ears, washed, perfumed, and powdered, as befits a ball. The open-work silk stockings and white satin shoes with ribbons were already on. The hairdressing was almost done. Sonia was finishing dressing, and so was the Countess. But Natasha, who had bustled about helping them all, was behindhand. She was still sitting before a looking-glass with a dressing-jacket thrown over her slender shoulders. Sonia stood ready-dressed in the middle of the room, 
and pressing the head of a pin till it hurt her dainty finger, was fixing on a last ribbon that squeaked as the pin went through it. "'That's not the way, that's not the way, Sonia," cried Natasha, turning her head and clutching with both hands at her hair, which the maid who was dressing it had not time to release. "'That bow is not right. Come here!' Sonia sat down, and Natasha pinned the ribbon on differently. "'Allow me, miss. I can't do it like that,' said the maid who was holding Natasha's hair. "'Oh, dear. Well, then, wait. That's right, Sonia.' "'Aren't you ready? It's nearly ten. came the Countess' voice. "'Directly! Directly! And you, Mama? I have only my cap to pin on.' "'Don't do it without me,' called Natasha. "'You won't do it right.' "'But it's nearly ten. They had decided to be at the ball by half-past ten, and Natasha had still to get dressed and they had to call at the Tarita Gardens. When her hair was done, Natasha, in her short petticoat from under which her dancing shoes showed and in her mother's dressing jacket, ran up to Sonia, scrutinized her, and then ran to her mother. Turning her mother's head this way and that, she fastened on the cap, and hurriedly kissing her gray hair, ran back to the maids who were turning up the hem of her skirt. The cause of the delay was Natasha's skirt, which was too long. Two maids were turning up the hem and hurriedly biting off the ends of thread. A third, with pins in her mouth, was running about between the Countess and Sonia, and a fourth held the whole of the gossamer garment up high on one uplifted hand. "'Mavra, quicker, darling. Give me my thimble, miss, from there.' "'Whenever will you be ready?' asked the Count, coming to the door. "'Here is some scent. Peronskaya must be tired of waiting.' "'It's ready, miss,' said the maid, holding up the shortened gauze dress with two fingers and blowing and shaking something off it, as if by this to express a consciousness of the airiness and purity of what she held. Natasha began putting on the dress. "'In a minute! In a minute! Don't come in, Papa!' she cried to her father as he opened the door, speaking from under the filmy skirt which still covered her whole face. Sonia slammed the door, too. A minute later they let the Count in. He was wearing a blue swallowtail coat, shoes and stockings, and was perfumed and his hair pomaded. "'Oh, Papa, how nice you look! Charming!' cried Natasha, as she stood in the middle of the room smoothing out the folds of the gauze. "'If you please, miss, allow me,' said the maid, who on her knees was pulling the skirt straight and shifting the pins from one side of her mouth to the other with her tongue. "'Say what you like!' exclaimed Sonia in a despairing voice as she looked at Natasha. "'Say what you like. It's still too long.' Natasha stepped back to look at herself in the pier-glass. The dress was too long. "'Really, madam, it is not at all too long,' said Mavra, crawling on her knees after her young lady. "'Well, if it's too long, we'll tack it up. We'll tack it up in one minute,' said the resolute Dunyasha taking a needle that was stuck on the front of her little shawl and still kneeling on the floor, set to work once more. At that moment, with soft steps, the Countess came in shyly, in her cap and velvet gown. "'Oh, my beauty!' exclaimed the Count. "'She looks better than any of you!' He would have embraced her, but blushing, she stepped aside, fearing to be rumpled. "Mamma, your cap! More to this side!' said Natasha. I'll arrange it." And she rushed forward so that the maids who were tacking up her skirt could not move fast enough and a piece of gauze was torn off. "'Oh, goodness! What has happened? Really, it was not my fault.' "'Never mind. I'll run it up. It won't show,' said Dunyasha. "'What a beauty! A very queen!' said the nurse as she came to the door. "'And Sonia! They are lovely!' At a quarter past ten, they at last got into their carriages and started, but they had still to call at the Tarita Gardens. Perinskaya was quite ready. In spite of her age and plainness she had gone through the same process as the Rostovs, but with less flurry, for to her it was a matter of routine. Her ugly old body was washed, perfumed, and powdered in just the same way. 
She had washed behind her ears just as carefully, and when she entered her drawing-room in her yellow dress, wearing her badge as maid of honor, her old lady's maid was as full of rapturous admiration as the Rostov servants had been. She praised the Rostov's toilettes. They praised her taste in toilette, and at eleven o'clock, careful of their coiffures and dresses, they settled themselves in their carriages and drove off. End of Book Six, Chapter Fourteen Book Six, Chapter Fifteen of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Fifteen Natasha had not had a moment free since early morning, and had not once had time to think of what lay before her. In the damp chill air and crowded closeness of the swaying carriage, she for the first time vividly imagined what was in store for her there at the ball, in those brightly lighted rooms, with music, flowers, dances, the Emperor, and all the brilliant young people of Petersburg. The prospect was so splendid that she hardly believed it would come true, so out of keeping was it with the chill darkness and closeness of the carriage. She understood all that awaited her only when, after stepping over the red bays at the entrance, she entered the hall, took off her fur cloak, and beside Sonia, in front of her mother, mounted the brightly illuminated stairs between the flowers. Only then did she remember how she must behave at a ball, and try to assume the majestic air she considered indispensable for a girl on such an occasion. But fortunately for her, she felt her eyes growing misty, she saw nothing clearly, her pulse beat a hundred to the minute, and the blood throbbed at her heart. She could not assume that pose, which would have made her ridiculous, and she moved on almost fainting from excitement, and trying with all her might to conceal it. And this was the very attitude that became her best. Before and behind them other visitors were entering, also talking in low tones and wearing ball-dresses. The mirrors on the landing reflected ladies in white, pale blue, and pink dresses, with diamonds and pearls on their bare necks and arms. Natasha looked in the mirrors and could not distinguish her reflection from the others. All was blended into one brilliant procession. On entering the ballroom, the regular hum of voices, footsteps and greetings deafened Natasha, and the light and glitter dazzled her still more. The host and hostess, who had already been standing at the door for half an hour repeating the same words to the various arrivals, Charme de vous voir, delighted to see you, greeted the Rostovs and Perinskaya in the same manner. The two girls in their white dresses, each with a rose in her black hair, both curtsied in the same way, but the hostess' eye involuntarily rested longer on the slim Natasha. She looked at her and gave her alone a special smile in addition to her usual smile as hostess. Looking at her, she may have recalled the golden, irrecoverable days of her own girlhood and her own first ball. The host also followed Natasha with his eyes and asked the Count which was his daughter. "'Charming,' said he, kissing the tips of his fingers. In the ballroom, guests stood crowding at the entrance doors awaiting the Emperor. The Countess took up a position in one of the front rows of that crowd. Natasha heard and felt that several people were asking about her and looking at her. She realized that those noticing her liked her, and this observation helped to calm her. "'There are some like ourselves, and some worse,' she thought. Perinskaya was pointing out to the Countess the most important people at the ball. "'That is the Dutch ambassador, do you see? That grey-haired man,' she said, indicating an old man with a profusion of silver-gray curly hair, who was surrounded by ladies laughing at something he said. "'Ah, here she is, the Queen of Petersburg, Countess Bezukhova,' said Perinskaya, indicating Elaine, who had just entered. "'How lovely! She is quite equal to Maria Antonovna. See how the men, young and old, pay court to her, beautiful and clever. They say Prince is quite mad about her. But see, those two, though not good-looking, are even more run after." She pointed to a lady who was crossing the room, followed by a very plain daughter. "'She is a splendid match, 
a millionairess," said Peronskaya. "'And look, here come her suitors.' "'That is Bezakova's brother, Anatol Kuragin," she said, indicating a handsome officer of the horse-guards, who was passing by them with head erect, looking at something over the heads of the ladies. "'He's handsome, isn't he? I hear they will marry him to that rich girl. But your cousin, Drubetskoy, is also very attentive to her. They say she has millions.' "'Oh, yes, that's the French ambassador himself.' she replied to the countess inquiry about Collincourt. Looks as if he were a king. All the same, the French are charming, very charming. No one more charming in society. Ah, here she is. Yes, she is still the most beautiful of them all, our Maria Antonovna. And how simply she is dressed. Lovely. And that stout one in spectacles is the universal Freemason, she went on, indicating Pierre. Put him beside his wife, and he looks a regular buffoon." Pierre, swaying his stout body, advanced, making way through the crowd and nodding to right and left as casually and good-naturedly as if he were passing through a crowd at a fair. He pushed through, evidently looking for someone. Natasha looked joyfully at the familiar face of Pierre, the buffoon, as Peronskaya had called him, and knew he was looking for them, and for her in particular he had promised to be at the ball and introduce partners to her. But before he reached them, Pierre stopped beside a very handsome, dark man of middle height, and in a white uniform, who stood by a window talking to a tall man wearing stars and a ribbon. Natasha at once recognized the shorter and younger man in the white uniform. It was Bolkonsky, who seemed to her to have grown much younger, happier, and better looking. "'There's someone else we know. Bolkonsky, do you see, Mama?" said Natasha, pointing out Prince Andrew. "'You remember, he stayed a night with us at Otradno.' "'Oh, you know him,' said Peronskaya. "'I can't bear him. Il fait à présent la pluie et le beau temps. He is all the rage just now. He's too proud for anything. Takes after his father. And he's hand in glove with Speransky, writing some project or other. Just look how he treats the ladies.' There's one talking to him, and he has turned away," she said, pointing at him. I'd give it to him if he treated me as he does those ladies. End of Book Six, Chapter Fifteen Book Six, Chapter Sixteen of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Sixteen. Suddenly, everybody stirred, began talking, and pressed forward and then back. And between the two rows, which separated, the emperor entered to the sounds of music that had immediately struck up. Behind him walked his host and hostess. He walked in rapidly, bowing to right and left as if anxious to get the first moments of the reception over. The band played the Polonaise in vogue at that time on account of the words that had been said to it, beginning, Alexander, Elisaveta, all our hearts you ravish quite. The Emperor passed on to the drawing-room, the crowd made a rush for the doors, and several persons with excited faces hurried there and back again. Then the crowd hastily retired from the drawing-room door, at which the Emperor reappeared talking to the hostess. A young man, looking distraught, pounced down on the ladies, asking them to move aside. Some ladies, with faces betraying complete forgetfulness of all the rules of decorum, pushed forward to the detriment of their toilettes. The men began to choose partners and take their places for the polonaise. Everyone moved back, and the emperor came smiling out of the drawing-room leading his hostess by the hand, but not keeping time to the music. The host followed with Maria Antonovna Nereshkina. Then came ambassadors, ministers, and various generals, whom Peronskaya diligently named. More than half the ladies already had partners and were taking up, or preparing to take up, their positions for the Polonaise. Natasha felt that she would be left with her mother and Sonia among a minority of women who crowded near the wall, not having been invited to dance. She stood with her slender arms hanging down, her scarcely defined bosom rising and falling regularly 
and with bated breath and glittering frightened eyes gazed straight before her, evidently prepared for the height of joy or misery. She was not concerned about the Emperor or any of those great people whom Peronskaya was pointing out. She had but one thought. Is it possible no one will ask me that I shall not be among the first to dance? Is it possible that not one of all these men will notice me? They do not even seem to see me, or if they do, they look as if they were saying, Ah, she's not the one I'm after, so it's not worth looking at her. No, it's impossible, she thought. They must know how I long to dance, how splendidly I dance, and how they would enjoy dancing with me. The strains of the Polonaise, which had continued for a considerable time, had begun to sound like a sad reminiscence to Natasha's ears. She wanted to cry. Peronskaya had left them. The Count was at the other end of the room. She and the Countess and Sonia were standing by themselves as in the depths of a forest amid that crowd of strangers, with no one interested in them and not wanted by anyone. Prince Andrew with the lady passed by, evidently not recognizing them. The handsome Anatole was smilingly talking to a partner on his arm and looked at Natasha as one looks at a wall. Boris passed them twice and each time turned away. Berg and his wife, who were not dancing, came up to them. This family gathering seemed humiliating to Natasha, as if there were nowhere else for the family to talk but here at the ball. She did not listen to or look at Vera, who was telling her something about her own green dress. At last the Emperor stopped beside his last partner, he had danced with three, and the music ceased. A worried aide-de-camp ran up to the Rostovs, requesting them to stand farther back, though as it was they were already close to the wall, and from the gallery resounded the distinct, precise, enticingly rhythmical strains of a waltz. The Emperor looked smilingly down the room. A minute passed, but no one had yet begun dancing. An aide-de-camp, the master of ceremonies, went up to Countess Bezukhova and asked her to dance. She smilingly raised her hand and laid it on his shoulder without looking at him. The aide-de-camp, an adept in his art, grasping his partner firmly round her waist, with confident deliberation started smoothly, gliding first round the edge of the circle. Then at the corner of the room he caught Elaine's left hand and turned her, the only sound audible, apart from the ever-quickening music, being the rhythmic click of the spurs on his rapid, agile feet, while at every third beat his partner's velvet dress spread out and seemed to flash as she whirled round. Natasha gazed at them and was ready to cry because it was not she who was dancing that first turn of the waltz. Prince Andrew, in the white uniform of a cavalry colonel, wearing stockings and dancing shoes, stood looking animated and bright in the front row of the circle not far from the Rostovs. Baron Furhoff was talking to him about the first sitting of the Council of State to be held next day. Prince Andrew, as one closely connected with Speransky and participating in the work of the Legislative Commission, could give reliable information about that sitting, concerning which various rumors were current. But not listening to what Furhoff was saying, he was gazing now at the sovereign and now at the men intending to dance, who had not yet gathered courage to enter the circle. Prince Andrew was watching these men abashed by the Emperor's presence, and the women who were breathlessly longing to be asked to dance. Pierre came up to him and caught him by the arm. "'You always dance. I have a protégé, the young Rostova here. Ask her,' he said. "'Where is she?' asked Bolkonsky. "'Excuse me.' he added, turning to the baron, we will finish this conversation elsewhere. At a ball one must dance." He stepped forward in the direction Pierre indicated. The despairing, dejected expression of Natasha's face caught his eye. He recognized her, guessed her feelings, saw that it was her debut, remembered her conversation at the window, and with an expression of pleasure on his face approached Countess Rostova. Allow me to introduce you to my daughter," said the Countess, with heightened color. "'I have the pleasure of being already acquainted, if the Countess remembers me,' said Prince Andrew, with a low and courteous bow, quite belying Peronskaya's remarks about his rudeness, and approaching Natasha, he held out his arm to grasp her waist before he had completed his invitation. He asked her to waltz. 
that tremulous expression on Natasha's face, prepared either for despair or rapture, suddenly brightened into a happy, grateful, childlike smile. "'I have long been waiting for you,' that frightened, happy little girl seemed to say by the smile that replaced the threatened tears, as she raised her hand to Prince Andrew's shoulder. They were the second couple to enter the circle. Prince Andrew was one of the best dancers of his day, and Natasha danced exquisitely. Her little feet in their white satin dancing shoes did their work swiftly, lightly, and independently of herself, while her face beamed with ecstatic happiness. Her slender bare arms and neck were not beautiful, compared to Elaine's, her shoulders looked thin and her bosom undeveloped. But Elaine seemed, as it were, hardened by a varnish left by the thousands of looks that had scanned her person, while Natasha was like a girl exposed for the first time, who would have felt very much ashamed had she not been assured that this was absolutely necessary. Prince Andrew liked dancing, and wishing to escape as quickly as possible from the political and clever talk which everyone addressed to him, wishing also to break up the circle of restraint he disliked caused by the Emperor's presence, he danced, and had chosen Natasha because Pierre pointed her out to him and because she was the first pretty girl who caught his eye. But scarcely had he embraced that slender, supple figure and felt her stirring so close to him and smiling so near him than the wine of her charm rose to his head, and he felt himself revived and rejuvenated when, after leaving her, he stood breathing deeply and watching the other dancers. End of Book Six, Chapter Sixteen Book Six, Chapter Seventeen, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Seventeen. After Prince Andrew, Boris came up to ask Natasha for a dance, and then the aide de camp who had opened the ball, and several other young men so that, flushed and happy, and passing on her superfluous partners to Sonia, she did not cease dancing all the evening. She noticed and saw nothing of what occupied everyone else. Not only did she fail to notice that the Emperor talked a long time with the French ambassador, and how particularly gracious he was to a certain lady, or that Prince so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so did and said this and that, and that Elaine had great success and was honored by the special attention of so-and-so, but she did not even see the Emperor, and only noticed that he had gone because the ball became livelier after his departure. For one of the merry cotillions before supper, Prince Andrew was again her partner. He reminded her of their first encounter in the Otradno Avenue, and how she had been unable to sleep that moonlight night, and told her how he had involuntarily overheard her. Natasha blushed at that recollection and tried to excuse herself, as if there had been something to be ashamed of in what Prince Andrew had overheard. Like all men who had grown up in society, Prince Andrew liked meeting someone there not of the conventional society stamp. And such was Natasha, with her surprise, her delight, her shyness, and even her mistakes in speaking French. With her he behaved with special care and tenderness, sitting beside her and talking of the simplest and most unimportant matters. He admired her shy grace. In the middle of the cotillion, having completed one of the figures, Natasha, still out of breath, was returning to her seat when another dancer chose her. She was tired and panting, and evidently thought of declining, but immediately put her hand gaily on the man's shoulder, smiling at Prince Andrew. "'I'd be glad to sit beside you and rest. I'm tired. But you see how they keep asking me, and I'm glad of it. I'm happy, and I love everybody, and you and I understand it all." And much, much more was said in her smile. When her partner left her, Natasha ran across the room to choose two ladies for the figure. "'If she goes to her cousin first, and then to another lady, she will be my wife,' said Prince Andrew to himself, quite to his own surprise, as he watched her. She did go first to her cousin. What rubbish sometimes enters one's head, thought Prince Andrew. But what is certain is that that girl is so charming, so original, that she won't be dancing here a month before she will be married. Such as she are rare here, 
he thought, as Natasha, readjusting a rose that was slipping on her bodice, settled herself beside him. When the cotillion was over, the old Count in his blue coat came up to the dancers. He invited Prince Andrew to come and see them, and asked his daughter whether she was enjoying herself. Natasha did not answer at once, but only looked up with a smile that said reproachfully, "'How can you ask such a question?' "'I have never enjoyed myself so much before,' she said, and Prince Andrew noticed how her thin arms rose quickly as if to embrace her father and instantly dropped again. Natasha was happier than she had ever been in her life. She was at that height of bliss when one becomes completely kind and good and does not believe in the possibility of evil, unhappiness, or sorrow. At that ball, Pierre for the first time felt humiliated by the position his wife occupied in court circles. He was gloomy and absent-minded. A deep furrow ran across his forehead, and standing by a window he stared over his spectacles, seeing no one. On her way to supper Natasha passed him. Pierre's gloomy, unhappy look struck her. She stopped in front of him. She wished to help him, to bestow on him the superabundance of her own happiness. "'How delightful it is, Count,' said she. "'Isn't it?' Pierre smiled absent-mindedly, evidently not grasping what she said. "'Yes, I am very glad,' he said. "'How can people be dissatisfied with anything?' thought Natasha. "'Especially such a capital fellow as Bazukov.' In Natasha's eyes all the people at the ball alike were good, kind, and splendid people loving one another none of them capable of injuring another, and so they ought all to be happy. End of Book Six, Chapter Seventeen Book Six, Chapter Eighteen Of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Eighteen. Next day, Prince Andrew thought of the ball, but his mind did not dwell on it long. Yes, it was a very brilliant ball, and then, yes, that little Rostova is very charming. There's something fresh, original, un-Petersburg-like about her that distinguishes her. That was all he thought about yesterday's ball, and after his morning tea, he set to work but either from fatigue or want of sleep he was ill-disposed for work and could get nothing done. He kept criticizing his own work as he often did, and was glad when he heard someone coming. The visitor was Bitsky, who served on various committees, frequented all the societies in Petersburg, and was a passionate devotee of the new ideas and of Speransky, and a diligent Petersburg newsmonger one of those men who choose their opinions like their clothes, according to the fashion, but who for that very reason appeared to be the warmest partisans. Hardly had he got rid of his hat before he ran into Prince Andrew's room with a preoccupied air and at once began talking. He had just heard particulars of that morning sitting of the Council of State opened by the Emperor, and he spoke of it enthusiastically. The Emperor's speech had been extraordinary it had been a speech such as only constitutional monarchs can deliver. The Sovereign plainly said that the Council and Senate are estates of the realm. He said that the government must rest not on authority, but on secure bases. The Emperor said that the fiscal system must be reorganized and the accounts published, recounted Bitsky, emphasizing certain words and opening his eyes significantly. Ah, yes, Today's events mark an epoch, the greatest epoch in our history," he concluded. Prince Andrew listened to the account of the opening of the Council of State, which he had so impatiently awaited and to which he had attached such importance, and was surprised that this event, now that it had taken place, did not affect him, and even seemed quite insignificant. He listened with quiet irony to Bitsky's enthusiastic account of it. A very simple thought occurred to him. What does it matter to me or to Bitsky what the Emperor was pleased to say at the Council? Can all that make me any happier or better?" And this simple reflection suddenly destroyed all the interest Prince Andrew had felt in the impending reforms. He was going to dine that evening at Speransky's, with only a few friends, as the host had said when inviting him. 
The prospect of that dinner in the intimate home circle of the man he so admired had greatly interested Prince Andrew, especially as he had not yet seen Speransky in his domestic surroundings, but now he felt disinclined to go to it. At the appointed hour, however, he entered the modest house Speransky owned in the Tarita Gardens. In the parquet dining-room of this small house, remarkable for its extreme cleanliness, suggesting that of a monastery, Prince Andrew, who was rather late, found the friendly gathering of Speransky's intimate acquaintances already assembled at five o'clock. There were no ladies present except Speransky's little daughter, long-faced like her father, and her governess. The other guests were Gervaise, Magnitsky, and Stolipin. While still in the anteroom, Prince Andrew heard loud voices and a ringing staccato laugh, a laugh such as one hears on the stage. Someone, it sounded like Speransky, was distinctly ejaculating, Ha! 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 Prince Andrew had never before heard Speransky's famous laugh, and this ringing, high-pitched laughter from a statesman made a strange impression on him. He entered the dining-room. The whole company were standing between two windows at a small table laid with hors d'oeuvres. Speransky, wearing a grey swallow-tail coat with a star on the breast, and evidently still the same waistcoat and high white stock he had worn at the meeting of the Council of State, stood at the table with a beaming countenance. His guests surrounded him. Magnitsky, addressing himself to Speransky, was relating an anecdote, and Speransky was laughing in advance at what Magnitsky was going to say. When Prince Andrew entered the room, Magnitsky's words were again crowned by laughter. Stolipin gave a deep bass guffaw as he munched a piece of bread and cheese. Gervaise laughed softly with a hissing chuckle, and Speransky in a high-pitched staccato manner. Still laughing, Speransky held out his soft white hand to Prince Andrew. "'Very pleased to see you, Prince,' he said. "'One moment,' he went on, turning to Magnitsky and interrupting his story. "'We have agreed that this is a dinner for recreation, with not a word about business.' and turning again to the narrator he began to laugh afresh. Prince Andrew looked at the laughing Speransky with astonishment, regret, and disillusionment. It seemed to him that this was not Speransky but someone else. Everything that had formerly appeared mysterious and fascinating in Speransky suddenly became plain and unattractive. At dinner the conversation did not cease for a moment and seemed to consist of the contents of a book of funny anecdotes. Before Magnitsky had finished his story, someone else was anxious to relate something still funnier. Most of the anecdotes, if not relating to the state service, related to people in the service. It seemed that in this company the insignificance of those people was so definitely accepted that the only possible attitude toward them was one of good-humored ridicule. Speransky related how at the council that morning a deaf dignitary, when asked his opinion, replied that he thought so too. Gervaise gave a long account of an official revision, remarkable for the stupidity of everybody concerned. Stolipin, stuttering, broke into the conversation and began excitedly talking of the abuses that existed under the former order of things, threatening to give a serious turn to the conversation. Magnitsky started quizzing Stolipin about his vehemence. Gervaise intervened with a joke and the talk reverted to its former lively tone. Evidently, Speransky liked to rest after his labors and find amusement in a circle of friends, and his guests, understanding his wish, tried to enliven him and amuse themselves. But their gaiety seemed to Prince Andrew mirthless and tiresome. Speransky's high-pitched voice struck him unpleasantly, and the incessant laughter grated on him like a false note. Prince Andrew did not laugh, and feared that he would be a damper on the spirits of the company, but no one took any notice of his being out of harmony with the general mood. They all seemed very gay. He tried several times to join in the conversation, but his remarks were tossed aside each time like a cork thrown out of the water, and he could not jest with them. There was nothing wrong or unseemly in what they said, it was witty and might have been funny, but it lacked just that something which is the salt of mirth, and they were not even aware that such a thing existed. After dinner Speransky's daughter and her governess rose. He patted the little girl with his white hand and kissed her. And that gesture, too, seemed unnatural to Prince Andrew. 
The men remained at table over their port, English fashion. In the midst of a conversation that was started about Napoleon's Spanish affairs, which they all agreed in approving, Prince Andrew began to express a contrary opinion. Speransky smiled, and with an evident wish to prevent the conversation from taking an unpleasant course, told a story that had no connection with the previous conversation. For a few moments all were silent. Having sat at some time at table, Speransky corked a bottle of wine, and remarking, "'Nowadays good wine rides in a carriage and pair,' passed it to the servant and got up. All rose, and continuing to talk loudly went into the drawing-room. Two letters brought by a courier were handed to Speransky, and he took them to his study. As soon as he had left the room the general merriment stopped, and the guests began to converse sensibly and quietly with one another. "'Now for the recitation,' said Speransky on returning from his study. "'A wonderful talent,' he said to Prince Andrew and Magnitsky immediately assumed a pose and began reciting some humorous verses in French which he had composed about various well-known Petersburg people. He was interrupted several times by applause. When the verses were finished, Prince Andrew went up to Speransky and took his leave. "'Where are you off to so early?' asked Speransky. "'I promised to go to a reception.' They said no more. Prince Andrew looked closely into those mirror-like, impenetrable eyes, and felt that it had been ridiculous of him to have expected anything from Speransky and from any of his own activities connected with him, or ever to have attributed importance to what Speransky was doing. That precise, mirthless laughter rang in Prince Andrew's ears long after he had left the house. When he reached home, Prince Andrew began thinking of his life in Petersburg during those last four months as if it were something new. He recalled his exertions and solicitations, and the history of his project of army reform, which had been accepted for consideration, and which they were trying to pass over in silence, simply because another, a very poor one, had already been prepared and submitted to the Emperor. He thought of the meetings of a committee of which Berg was a member. He remembered how carefully and at what length everything relating to form and procedure was discussed at those meetings, and how sedulously and promptly all that related to the gist of the business was evaded. He recalled his labors on the legal code, and how painstakingly he had translated the articles of the Roman and French codes into Russian, and he felt ashamed of himself. Then he vividly pictured to himself Bogacharovo, his occupations in the country, his journey to Ryazan. He remembered the peasants and drawn the village elder, and mentally applying to them the personal rights he had divided into paragraphs, he felt astonished that he could have spent so much time on such useless work. End of Book Six, Chapter Eighteen Book Six, Chapter Nineteen of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Nineteen. Next day, Prince Andrew called at a few houses he had not visited before, and among them at the Rostovs, with whom he had renewed acquaintance at the ball. Apart from considerations of politeness which demanded the call, he wanted to see that original eager girl who had left such a pleasant impression on his mind in her own home. Natasha was one of the first to meet him. She was wearing a dark blue house-dress in which Prince Andrew thought her even prettier than in her ball-dress. She and all the Rostov family welcomed him as an old friend, simply and cordially. The whole family, whom he had formerly judged severely, now seemed to him to consist of excellent, simple, and kindly people. The old Count's hospitality and good nature, which struck one especially in Petersburg as a pleasant surprise, were such that Prince Andrew could not refuse to stay to dinner. "'Yes,' he thought, "'they are capital people, who, of course, have not the slightest idea what a treasure they possess in Natasha. But they are kindly folk and form the best possible setting for this strikingly poetic, charming girl overflowing with life.' In Natasha, Prince Andrew was conscious of a strange world completely alien to him and brimful of joys unknown to him, a different world, 
that in the Otradno Avenue and at the window that moonlight night had already begun to disconcert him. Now this world disconcerted him no longer, and was no longer alien to him, but he himself, having entered it, found in it a new enjoyment. After dinner Natasha, at Prince Andrew's request, went to the clavichord and began singing. Prince Andrew stood by a window talking to the ladies and listening to her. In the midst of a phrase he ceased speaking and suddenly felt tears choking him, a thing he had thought impossible for him. He looked at Natasha as she sang, and something new and joyful stirred in his soul. He felt happy and at the same time sad. He had absolutely nothing to weep about, yet he was ready to weep. What about? His former love? The little princess? His disillusionments? His hopes for the future? Yes and no. The chief reason was a sudden, vivid sense of the terrible contrast between something infinitely great and illimitable within him and that limited and material something that he and even she was. This contrast weighed on and yet cheered him while she sang. As soon as Natasha had finished, she went up to him and asked him how he liked her voice. She asked this and then became confused, feeling that she ought not to have asked it. He smiled, looking at her, and said he liked her singing as he liked everything she did. Prince Andrew left the Rostovs late in the evening. He went to bed from habit, but soon realized that he could not sleep. Having lit his candle, he sat up in bed, then got up, then lay down again, not at all troubled by his sleeplessness. His soul was as fresh and joyful as if he had stepped out of a stuffy room into God's own fresh air. It did not enter his head that he was in love with Natasha. He was not thinking about her, but only picturing her to himself, and in consequence all life appeared in a new light. Why do I strive? Why do I toil in this narrow, confined frame, when life, all life, with all its joys, is open to me? said he to himself. And for the first time for a very long while he began making happy plans for the future. He decided that he must attend to his son's education by finding a tutor and putting the boy in his charge. Then he ought to retire from the service and go abroad, and see England, Switzerland, and Italy. I must use my freedom while I feel so much strength and youth in me, he said to himself. Pierre was right when he said one must believe in the possibility of happiness in order to be happy, and now I do believe in it. Let the dead bury their dead, but while one has life one must live and be happy," thought he. End of Book Six, Chapter Nineteen Book Six, Chapter Twenty Of War and Peace Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty. One morning, Colonel Berg, whom Pierre knew as he knew everybody in Moscow and Petersburg, came to see him. Berg arrived in an immaculate, brand new uniform, with his hair pomaded and brushed forward over his temples, as the Emperor Alexander wore his hair. I have just been to see the Countess, your wife. Unfortunately, she could not grant my request, but I hope, Count, I shall be more fortunate with you," he said with a smile. What is it you wish, Colonel? I am at your service. I have now quite settled in my new rooms, Count, Berg said with his perfect conviction that this information could not but be agreeable, and so I wish to arrange just a small party for my own and my wife's friends. He smiled still more pleasantly. I wish to ask the Countess and you to do me the honor of coming to tea and to supper. Only Countess Elaine, considering the society of such people as the Bergs beneath her, could be cruel enough to refuse such an invitation. Berg explained so clearly why he wanted to collect at his house a small but select company, and why this would give him pleasure, and why, though he grudged spending money on cards or anything harmful, he was prepared to run into some expense for the sake of good society, that Pierre could not refuse and promised to come. But don't be late, Count, if I may venture to ask. About ten minutes to eight, please. We shall make up a rubber. 
Our general is coming. He is very good to me. We shall have supper, Count, so you will do me the favor." Contrary to his habit of being late, Pierre on that day arrived at the Berg's house not at ten, but at fifteen minutes to eight. Having prepared everything necessary for the party, the Bergs were ready for their guests' arrival. In their new clean and light study, with its small busts and pictures and new furniture, sat Berg and his wife. Berg, closely buttoned up in his new uniform, sat beside his wife explaining to her that one always could and should be acquainted with people above one, because only then does one get satisfaction from acquaintances. "'You can get to know something. You can ask for something. See how I managed from my first promotion.' Berg measured his life not by years but by promotions. My comrades are still nobodies, while I am only waiting for a vacancy to command a regiment and have the happiness to be your husband." He rose and kissed Vera's hand, and on the way to her straightened out a turned-up corner of the carpet. And how have I obtained all this? Chiefly by knowing how to choose my acquaintances. It goes without saying that one must be conscientious and methodical. Berg smiled with a sense of superiority over a weak woman, and paused, reflecting that this dear wife of his was, after all, but a weak woman, who could not understand all that constitutes a man's dignity, what it was ein Mann zu sein, to be a man. Vera, at the same time, smiling with a sense of superiority over her good, conscientious husband, who all the same understood life wrongly, as according to Vera all men did. Berg, judging by his wife, thought all women weak and foolish. Vera, judging only by her husband and generalizing from that observation, supposed that all men, though they understand nothing and are conceited and selfish, ascribe common sense to themselves alone. Berg rose and embraced his wife carefully, so as not to crush her lace fichu, for which she had paid a good price, kissing her straight on the lips. The only thing is, we mustn't have children too soon," he continued, following an unconscious sequence of ideas. Yes, answered Vera, I don't at all want that. We must live for society. Princess Yusupova wore one exactly like this," said Berg, pointing to the fichu with a happy and kindly smile. Just then Count Bezukhov was announced. Husband and wife glanced at one another both smiling with self-satisfaction, and each mentally claiming the honor of this visit. "'This is what comes of knowing how to make acquaintances,' thought Berg. "'This is what comes of knowing how to conduct oneself.' "'But please don't interrupt me when I am entertaining the guests,' said Vera, "'because I know what interests each of them and what to say to different people.' Berg smiled again. "'It can't be helped.' Men must sometimes have masculine conversation," said he. They received Pierre in their small, new drawing-room, where it was impossible to sit down anywhere without disturbing its symmetry, neatness, and order. So it was quite comprehensible and not strange that Berg, having generously offered to disturb the symmetry of an armchair or of the sofa for his dear guest, but being apparently painfully undecided on the matter himself, eventually left the visitor to settle the question of selection. Pierre disturbed the symmetry by moving a chair for himself, and Berg and Vera immediately began their evening party, interrupting each other in their efforts to entertain their guest. Vera, having decided in her own mind that Pierre ought to be entertained with conversation about the French embassy, at once began accordingly. Berg, having decided that masculine conversation was required, interrupted his wife's remarks and touched on the question of the war with Austria, and unconsciously jumped from the general subject to personal considerations as to the proposals made him to take part in the Austrian campaign, and the reasons why he had declined them. Though the conversation was very incoherent, and Vera was angry at the intrusion of the masculine element, both husband and wife felt with satisfaction that, even if only one guest was present, their evening had begun very well and was as like as two peas to every other evening party with its talk, tea, and lighted candles. Before long, Boris, Berg's old comrade, arrived. There was a shade of condescension and patronage in his treatment of Berg and Vera. 
After Boris came a lady with the colonel, then the general himself, then the Rostovs, and the party became unquestionably exactly like all other evening parties. Berg and Vera could not repress their smiles of satisfaction at the sight of all this movement in their drawing-room, at the sound of the disconnected talk, the rustling of dresses, and the bowing and scraping. Everything was just as everybody always has it, especially so the general, who admired the apartment, patted Berg on the shoulder, and with parental authority superintended the setting out of the table for Boston. The general sat down by Count Ilya Rostov, who was, next to himself, the most important guest. The old people sat with the old, the young with the young, and the hostess at the tea-table, on which stood exactly the same kind of cakes in a silver cake-basket as the Pannons had at their party. Everything was just as it was everywhere else. End of Book Six, Chapter Twenty Book Six, Chapter Twenty One Of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty One Pierre, as one of the principal guests, had to sit down to Boston with Count Rostov, the general, and the colonel. At the card-table he happened to be directly facing Natasha, and was struck by a curious change that had come over her since the ball. She was silent, and not only less pretty than at the ball, but only redeemed from plainness by her look of gentle indifference to everything around. "'What's the matter with her?' thought Pierre, glancing at her. She was sitting by her sister at the tea-table, and reluctantly, without looking at him, made some reply to Boris who sat down beside her. After playing out a whole suit and to his partner's delight taking five tricks, Pierre, hearing greetings on the steps of someone who had entered the room while he was picking up his tricks, glanced again at Natasha. "'What has happened to her?' he asked himself with still greater surprise. Prince Andrew was standing before her, saying something to her with a look of tender solicitude. She, having raised her head, was looking up at him, flushed and evidently trying to master her rapid breathing. And the bright glow of some inner fire that had been suppressed was again a light in her. She was completely transformed, and from a plain girl had again become what she had been at the ball. Prince Andrew went up to Pierre, and the latter noticed a new and youthful expression on his friend's face. Pierre changed places several times during the game, sitting now with his back to Natasha and now facing her, but during the hold of the six rubbers he watched her and his friend. "'Something very important is happening between them,' thought Pierre, and a feeling that was both joyful and painful agitated him and made him neglect the game. After six rubbers the general got up, saying that it was no use playing like that, and Pierre was released. Natasha on one side was talking with Sonia and Boris, and Vera, with a subtle smile, was saying something to Prince Andrew. Pierre went up to his friend, and, asking whether they were talking secrets, sat down beside them. Vera, having noticed Prince Andrew's attention to Natasha, decided that, at a party, a real evening party, subtle allusions to the tender passion were absolutely necessary, and seizing a moment when Prince Andrew was alone, began a conversation with him about feelings in general and about her sister. With so intellectual a guest as she considered Prince Andrew to be, she felt that she had to employ her diplomatic tact. When Pierre went up to them he noticed that Vera was being carried away by her self-satisfied talk, but that Prince Andrew seemed embarrassed, a thing that rarely happened with him. "'What do you think?' Vera was saying with an arch smile. You are so discerning, Prince, and understand people's character so well at a glance. What do you think of Natalie? Could she be constant in her attachments? Could she, like other women, Vera met herself, love a man once for all and remain true to him forever? That is what I consider true love. What do you think, Prince? I know your sister too little replied Prince Andrew, with a sarcastic smile under which he wished to hide his embarrassment, to be able to solve so delicate a question. And then I have noticed that the less attractive a woman is, the more constant she is likely to be. 
he added, and looked up at Pierre, who was just approaching them. "'Yes, that is true, Prince. In our days,' continued Vera, mentioning our days as people of limited intelligence are fond of doing, imagining that they have discovered and appraised the peculiarities of our days, and that human characteristics change with the times. In our days a girl has so much freedom that the pleasure of being courted often stifles real feeling in her, and it must be confessed that Natalie is very susceptible." This return to the subject of Natalie caused Prince Andrew to knit his brows with discomfort. He was about to rise, but Vera continued with a still more subtle smile. "'I think no one has been more courted than she,' she went on. "'But till quite lately she never cared seriously for anyone. "'Now, you know, Count,' she said to Pierre, "'even our dear cousin Boris, who, between ourselves, was very far gone in the land of tenderness.' alluding to a map of love much in vogue at that time. Prince Andrew frowned and remained silent. "'You are friendly with Boris, aren't you?' asked Vera. "'Yes, I know him. I expect he has told you of his childish love for Natasha?' "'Oh, there was childish love?' suddenly asked Prince Andrew, blushing unexpectedly. "'Yes, you know between cousins intimacy often leads to love. Le cousinage est un dangereux voisinage. Cousinhood is a dangerous neighborhood. Don't you think so? Oh, undoubtedly, said Prince Andrew. And with sudden and unnatural liveliness, he began chafing Pierre about the need to be very careful with his fifty year old Moscow cousins, and in the midst of these jesting remarks, he rose, taking Pierre by the arm, and drew him aside. Well, asked Pierre, seeing his friend's strange animation with surprise, and noticing the glance he turned on Natasha as he rose. "'I must—I must have a talk with you,' said Prince Andrew. "'You know that pair of women's gloves?' He referred to the Masonic gloves given to a newly initiated brother to present to the woman he loved. "'I—but no, I will talk to you later on.' And with a strange light in his eyes and restlessness in his movements, Prince Andrew approached Natasha and sat down beside her. Pierre saw how Prince Andrew asked her something, and how she flushed as she replied. But at that moment Berg came to Pierre and began insisting that he should take part in an argument between the general and the colonel on the affairs in Spain. Berg was satisfied and happy. The smile of pleasure never left his face. The party was very successful, and quite like other parties he had seen. Everything was similar the lady's subtle talk, the cards, the general raising his voice at the card-table, and the samovar and the tea-cakes. Only one thing was lacking that he had always seen at the evening parties he wished to imitate. They had not yet had a loud conversation among the men and a dispute about something important and clever. Now the general had begun such a discussion, and so Berg drew Pierre to it. End of Book Six, Chapter Twenty One Book Six, Chapter Twenty Two of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty Two. Next day, having been invited by the Count, Prince Andrew dined with the Rostovs and spent the rest of the day there. Everyone in the house realized for whose sake Prince Andrew came, and without concealing it, he tried to be with Natasha all day. Not only in the soul of the frightened yet happy and enraptured Natasha, but in the whole house there was a feeling of awe at something important that was bound to happen. The Countess looked with sad and sternly serious eyes at Prince Andrew when he talked to Natasha and timidly started some artificial conversation about trifles as soon as he looked her away. Sonia was afraid to leave Natasha, and afraid of being in the way when she was with them. Natasha grew pale, in a panic of expectation, when she remained alone with him for a moment. Prince Andrew surprised her by his timidity. She felt that he wanted to say something to her, but could not bring himself to do so. In the evening, when Prince Andrew had left, the Countess went up to Natasha and whispered, "'Well, what?' "'Mama!' 
For heaven's sake, don't ask me anything now. One can't talk about that," said Natasha. But all the same, that night Natasha, now agitated and now frightened, lay a long time in her mother's bed gazing straight before her. She told her how he had complimented her, how he told her he was going abroad, asked her where they were going to spend the summer, and then how he had asked her about Boris. "'But such a... such a... never happened to me before,' she said. "'Only I feel afraid in his presence. I am always afraid when I'm with him. What does that mean? Does it mean that it's the real thing? Yes? Mama, are you asleep?' "'No, my love, I am frightened myself,' answered her mother. "'Now go. All the same, I shan't sleep. What silliness to sleep! Mummy, mummy, such a thing never happened to me before,' she said, surprised and alarmed at the feeling she was aware of in herself. "'And could we ever have thought—' It seemed to Natasha that, even at the time she first saw Prince Andrew at Otrodno, she had fallen in love with him. It was as if she feared this strange, unexpected happiness of meeting again the very man she had then chosen, she was firmly convinced she had done so, and of finding him, as it seemed, not indifferent to her. And it had to happen that he should come specially to Petersburg while we are here. And it had to happen that we should meet at that ball. It is fate. Clearly it is fate that everything led up to this. Already then, Directly I saw him, I felt something peculiar. "'What else did he say to you? What are those verses? Read them,' said her mother, thoughtfully referring to some verses Prince Andrew had written in Natasha's album. "'Mama, one need not be ashamed of his being a widower.' "'Don't, Natasha. Pray to God. Marriages are made in heaven,' said her mother. "'Darling mummy, how I love you!' How happy I am!" cried Natasha, shedding tears of joy and excitement and embracing her mother. At that very time Prince Andrew was sitting with Pierre and telling him of his love for Natasha and his firm resolve to make her his wife. That day Countess Hélène had a reception at her house. The French ambassador was there, and a foreign prince of the blood who had of late become a frequent visitor of hers and many brilliant ladies and gentlemen. Pierre, who had come downstairs, walked through the rooms and struck everyone by his preoccupied, absent-minded, and morose air. Since the ball he had felt the approach of a fit of nervous depression, and had made desperate efforts to combat it. Since the intimacy of his wife with the royal prince, Pierre had unexpectedly been made a gentleman of the bedchamber and from that time he had begun to feel oppressed and ashamed in court society, and dark thoughts of the vanity of all things human came to him oftener than before. At the same time, the feeling he had noticed between his protégé Natasha and Prince Andrew accentuated his gloom by the contrast between his own position and his friend's. He tried equally to avoid thinking about his wife and about Natasha and Prince Andrew and again everything seemed to him insignificant in comparison with eternity. Again the question, for what, presented itself, and he forced himself to work day and night at Masonic labors, hoping to drive away the evil spirit that threatened him. Toward midnight, after he had left the Countess' apartments, he was sitting upstairs in a shabby dressing-gown, copying out the original transaction of the Scottish Lodge of Freemasons at a table in his low room cloudy with tobacco smoke, when someone came in. It was Prince Andrew. "'Ah, it's you,' said Pierre with a preoccupied, dissatisfied air. "'And I, you see, am hard at it.' He pointed to his manuscript book with that air of escaping from the ills of life with which unhappy people look at their work. Prince Andrew, with a beaming, ecstatic expression of renewed life on his face, paused in front of Pierre, and, not noticing his sad look, smiled at him with the egotism of joy. "'Well, dear heart,' said he, "'I wanted to tell you about it yesterday, and I have come to do so today. I never experienced anything like it before. I am in love, my friend.' Suddenly Pierre heaved a deep sigh and dumped his heavy person down on the sofa beside Prince Andrew. "'With Natasha Rostova, yes,' said he. 
Yes, yes. Who else should it be? I should never have believed it, but the feeling is stronger than I. Yesterday I tormented myself and suffered, but I would not exchange even that torment for anything in the world. I have not lived till now. At last I live, but I can't live without her. But can she love me? I am too old for her. Why don't you speak? I? I? What did I tell you? said Pierre, suddenly, rising and beginning to pace up and down the room. I always thought it. That girl is such a treasure. She is a rare girl. My dear friend, I entreat you, don't philosophize, don't doubt. Marry, 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 and I am sure there will not be a happier man than you. But what of her? She loves you. Don't talk rubbish, said Prince Andrew, smiling and looking into Pierre's eyes. She does, I know, Pierre cried fiercely. But do listen, returned Prince Andrew, holding him by the arm. Do you know the condition I am in? I must talk about it to someone. Well, go on, go on. I am very glad, said Pierre, and his face really changed. His brow became smooth, and he listened gladly to Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew seemed, and really was, quite a different, quite a new man. Where was his spleen, his contempt for life, his disillusionment? Pierre was the only person to whom he made up his mind to speak openly, and to him he told all that was in his soul. Now he boldly and lightly made plans for an extended future, said he could not sacrifice his own happiness to his father's caprice, and spoke of how he would either make his father consent to this marriage and love her, or would do without his consent. Then he marveled at the feeling that had mastered him as at something strange apart from and independent of himself. I should not have believed anyone who told me that I was capable of such love, said Prince Andrew. It is not at all the same feeling that I knew in the past. The whole world is now for me divided into two halves. One half is she, and there is all joy, hope, light. The other half is everything where she is not, and there is all gloom and darkness." "'Darkness and gloom,' reiterated Pierre. "'Yes, yes, I understand that. I cannot help loving the light. It is not my fault. And I am very happy. You understand me? I know you are glad for my sake.' "'Yes, yes,' Pierre assented, looking at his friend with a touched and sad expression in his eyes. The brighter Prince Andrew's lot appeared to him, the gloomier seemed his own. End of Book Six, Chapter Twenty Two. Book Six, Chapter Twenty Three, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty Three. Prince Andrew needed his father's consent to his marriage, and to obtain this, he started for the country next day. His father received his son's communication with external composure, but inward wrath. He could not comprehend how anyone could wish to alter his life or introduce anything new into it, when his own life was already ending. If only they would let me end my days as I want to, thought the old man, then they might do as they please. With his son, however, he employed the diplomacy he reserved for important occasions, and, adopting a quiet tone, discussed the whole matter. In the first place, the marriage was not a brilliant one as regards birth, wealth, or rank. Secondly, Prince Andrew was no longer as young as he had been, and his health was poor. The old man laid special stress on this, while she was very young. Thirdly, he had a son, whom it would be a pity to entrust to a chit of a girl. Fourthly, and finally, the father said, looking ironically at his son, I beg you to put it off for a year. Go abroad, take a cure, look out as you wanted to for a German tutor for Prince Nicholas. Then, if your love or passion or obstinacy, as you please, is still as great, marry. And that's my last word on it. Mind the last. 
concluded the prince, in a tone which showed that nothing would make him alter his decision. Prince Andrew saw clearly that the old man hoped that his feelings, or his fiancée's, would not stand a year's test, or that he, the old prince himself, would die before then, and he decided to conform to his father's wish, to propose and postpone the wedding for a year. Three weeks after the last evening he had spent with the Rostovs, Prince Andrew returned to Petersburg. Next day after her talk with her mother, Natasha expected Bolkonsky all day, but he did not come. On the second and third day it was the same. Pierre did not come either, and Natasha, not knowing that Prince Andrew had gone to see his father, could not explain his absence to herself. Three weeks passed in this way. Natasha had no desire to go out anywhere, and wandered from room to room like a shadow, idle and listless. She wept secretly at night and did not go to her mother in the evenings. She blushed continually and was irritable. It seemed to her that everybody knew about her disappointment and was laughing at her and pitying her. Strong as was her inward grief, this wound to her vanity intensified her misery. Once she came to her mother, tried to say something, and suddenly began to cry. Her tears were those of an offended child who does not know why it is being punished. The countess began to soothe Natasha, who, after first listening to her mother's words, suddenly interrupted her. "'Leave off, mamma. I don't think and don't want to think about it. He just came and then left off, left off.' Her voice trembled, and she again nearly cried, but recovered and went on quietly. And I don't at all want to get married. And I am afraid of him. I have now become quite calm, quite calm." The day after this conversation Natasha put on the old dress which she knew had the peculiar property of conducing to cheerfulness in the mornings, and that day she returned to the old way of life, which she had abandoned since the ball. Having finished her morning tea, she went to the ballroom, which she particularly liked for its loud resonance, and began singing her solfeggio. When she had finished her first exercise, she stood still in the middle of the room and sang a musical phrase that particularly pleased her. She listened joyfully, as though she had not expected it, to the charm of the notes reverberating, filling the whole empty ballroom, and slowly dying away. And all at once she felt cheerful. What's the good of making so much of it? Things are nice as it is," she said to herself, and she began walking up and down the room, not stepping simply on the resounding parquet, but treading with each step from the heel to the toe she had on a new and favorite pair of shoes, and listening to the regular tap of the heel and creak of the toe as gladly as she had to the sounds of her own voice. Passing a mirror, she glanced into it. There! That's me! the expression on her face seemed to say as she caught sight of herself. Well, and very nice, too. I need nobody." A footman wanted to come in to clear away something in the room, but she would not let him, and having closed the door behind him, continued her walk. That morning she had returned to her favorite mood, love of and delight in herself. "'How charming that Natasha is!' she said again, speaking as some third collective male person pretty, a good voice, young and in nobody's way if only they leave her in peace. But however much they left her in peace, she could not now be at peace, and immediately felt this. In the hall the porch door opened, and someone asked, At home? And then footsteps were heard. Natasha was looking at the mirror, but did not see herself. She listened to the sounds in the hall. When she saw herself, her face was pale. It was he. She knew this for certain, though she hardly heard his voice through the closed doors. Pale and agitated, Natasha ran into the drawing-room. "'Mama! Bolkonsky has come!' she said. "'Mama! It's awful! It's unbearable! I don't want... to be tormented! What am I to do?' Before the Countess could answer, Prince Andrew entered the room with an agitated and serious face. As soon as he saw Natasha, his face brightened. He kissed the Countess' hand and Natasha's, and sat down beside the sofa. 
"'It is long since we had the pleasure,' began the Countess. But Prince Andrew interrupted her by answering her intended question, obviously in haste to say what he had to. "'I have not been to see you all this time because I have been at my father's. I had to talk over a very important matter with him. I only got back last night.' he said, glancing at Natasha. "'I want to have a talk with you, Countess,' he added after a moment's pause. The Countess lowered her eyes, sighing deeply. "'I am at your disposal,' she murmured. Natasha knew that she ought to go away, but was unable to do so. Something gripped her throat, and regardless of manners she stared straight at Prince Andrew with wide-open eyes. "'At once? This instant?' No, it can't be, she thought. Again he glanced at her, and that glance convinced her that she was not mistaken. Yes, at once, that very instant, her fate would be decided. Go, Natasha, I will call you, said the countess in a whisper. Natasha glanced with frightened, imploring eyes at Prince Andrew and at her mother and went out. I have come, countess, to ask for your daughter's hand said Prince Andrew. The Countess' face flushed hotly, but she said nothing. "'Your offer,' she began at last sedately. He remained silent, looking into her eyes. "'Your offer,' she grew confused, "'is agreeable to us, and I accept your offer. I am glad. And my husband, I hope. But it will depend on her.' I will speak to her when I have your consent. Do you give it to me?" said Prince Andrew. "'Yes,' replied the Countess. She held out her hand to him, and with a mixed feeling of estrangement and tenderness pressed her lips to his forehead as he stooped to kiss her hand. She wished to love him as a son, but felt that to her he was a stranger and a terrifying man. "'I am sure my husband will consent,' said the Countess. But your father—" My father, to whom I have told my plans, has made it an express condition of his consent that the wedding is not to take place for a year. And I wish to tell you of that," said Prince Andrew. It is true that Natasha is still young, but so long as that— It is unavoidable," said Prince Andrew with a sigh. I will send her to you," said the Countess, and left the room. Lord, have mercy upon us," she repeated while seeking her daughter. Sonia said that Natasha was in her bedroom. Natasha was sitting on the bed, pale and dry-eyed, and was gazing at the icons and whispering something as she rapidly crossed herself. Seeing her mother, she jumped up and flew to her. "'Well, Mama, well?' "'Go, go to him. He is asking for your hand,' said the Countess, coldly it seemed to Natasha. Go, go," said the mother, sadly and reproachfully, with a deep sigh, as her daughter ran away. Natasha never remembered how she entered the drawing-room. When she came in and saw him, she paused. "'Is it possible that this stranger has now become everything to me?' she asked herself, and immediately answered, "'Yes, everything. He alone is now dearer to me than everything in the world.' Prince Andrew came up to her with downcast eyes. "'I have loved you from the very first moment I saw you. May I hope?' He looked at her and was struck by the serious impassioned expression of her face. Her face said, "'Why ask? Why doubt what you cannot but know? Why speak when words cannot express what one feels?' She drew near to him and stopped. He took her hand and kissed it. Do you love me?" Yes, yes," Natasha murmured as if in vexation. Then she sighed loudly and, catching her breath more and more quickly, began to sob. What is it? What's the matter? Oh, I am so happy," she replied, smiled through her tears, bent over close to him, paused for an instant as if asking herself whether she might, and then kissed him. Prince Andrew held her hands, looked into her eyes, and did not find in his heart his former love for her. Something in him had suddenly changed. 
There was no longer the former poetic and mystic charm of desire, but there was pity for her feminine and childish weakness, fear at her devotion and trustfulness, and an oppressive yet joyful sense of the duty that now bound him to her forever. The present feeling, though not so bright and poetic as the former, was stronger and more serious. "'Did your mother tell you that it cannot be for a year?' asked Prince Andrew, still looking into her eyes. "'Is it possible that I, the chit of a girl, as everybody called me,' thought Natasha, "'is it possible that I am now to be the wife and the equal of this strange, dear, clever man whom even my father looks up to? Can it be true? Can it be true that there can be no more playing with life, that now I am grown up, that on me now lies a responsibility for my every word and deed? Yes, but what did he ask me? No, she replied, but she had not understood his question. Forgive me he said, but you are so young, and I have already been through so much in life. I am afraid for you. You do not yet know yourself. Natasha listened with concentrated attention, trying but failing to take in the meaning of his words. Hard as this year which delays my happiness will be, continued Prince Andrew, it will give you time to be sure of yourself. I ask you to make me happy in a year but you are free. Our engagement shall remain a secret, and should you find that you do not love me, or should you come to love—' said Prince Andrew with an unnatural smile. "'Why do you say that?' Natasha interrupted him. "'You know that from the very day you first came to Atrodno I have loved you,' she cried, quite convinced that she spoke the truth. "'In a year you will learn to know yourself.' A whole year, Natasha repeated suddenly, only now realizing that the marriage was to be postponed for a year. But why a year? Why a year? Prince Andrew began to explain to her the reasons for this delay. Natasha did not hear him. And it can't be helped? she asked. Prince Andrew did not reply, but his face expressed the impossibility of altering that decision. It's awful! Oh, it's awful! Awful! Natasha suddenly cried and again burst into sobs. I shall die, waiting a year. It's impossible. It's awful. She looked into her lover's face and saw in it a look of commiseration and perplexity. No, no, I'll do anything, she said, suddenly checking her tears. I am so happy. The father and mother came into the room and gave the betrothed couple their blessing. From that day Prince Andrew began to frequent the Rostovs as Natasha's affianced lover. End of Book 6, Chapter 23《Book 6, Chapter 24 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty Four. No betrothal ceremony took place, and Natasha's engagement to Bolkonsky was not announced. Prince Andrew insisted on that. He said that as he was responsible for the delay, he ought to bear the whole burden of it, that he had given his word and bound himself forever, but that he did not wish to bind Natasha and gave her perfect freedom. If after six months she felt that she did not love him, she would have full right to reject him. Naturally, neither Natasha nor her parents wished to hear of this, but Prince Andrew was firm. He came every day to the Rostovs, but did not behave to Natasha as an affianced lover. He did not use the familiar thou, but said you to her, and kissed only her hand. After their engagement, quite different, intimate, and natural relations sprang up between them. It was as if they had not known each other till now. Both liked to recall how they had regarded each other when as yet they were nothing to one another. They felt themselves now quite different beings. Then they were artificial, now natural and sincere. At first the family felt some constraint in intercourse with Prince Andrew. He seemed a man from another world, 
and for a long time Natasha trained the family to get used to him, proudly assuring them all that he only appeared to be different, but was really just like all of them, and that she was not afraid of him and no one else ought to be. After a few days they grew accustomed to him, and without restraint in his presence pursued their usual way of life, in which he took his part. He could talk about rural economy with the Count, fashions with the Countess and Natasha, and about albums and fancy work with Sonia. Sometimes the household, both among themselves and in his presence, expressed their wonder at how it had all happened, and at the evident omens there had been of it. Prince Andrew's coming to Otradno and their coming to Petersburg, and the likeness between Natasha and Prince Andrew, which her nurse had noticed on his first visit, and Andrew's encounter with Nicholas in 1805, and many other incidents betokening that it had to be. In the house that poetic dullness and quiet reigned which always accompanies the presence of a betrothed couple. Often, when all sitting together, everyone kept silent. Sometimes the others would get up and go away, and the couple, left alone, still remained silent. They rarely spoke of their future life. Prince Andrew was afraid and ashamed to speak of it. Natasha shared this as she did all his feelings, which she constantly divined. Once she began questioning him about his son. Prince Andrew blushed, as he often did now, Natasha particularly liked it in him, and said that his son would not live with them. "'Why not?' asked Natasha in a frightened tone. "'I cannot take him away from his grandfather. And besides—' "'How I should have loved him!' said Natasha, immediately guessing his thought. "'But I know you wish to avoid any pretext for finding fault with us.' Sometimes the old Count would come up, kiss Prince Andrew, and ask his advice about Petya's education or Nicholas' service. The old Countess sighed as she looked at them. Sonia was always getting frightened lest she should be in the way, and tried to find excuses for leaving them alone even when they did not wish it. When Prince Andrew spoke, he could tell a story very well, Natasha listened to him with pride. When she spoke, she noticed with fear and joy that he gazed attentively and scrutinizingly at her. She asked herself in perplexity, "'What does he look for in me? He is trying to discover something by looking at me. What if what he seeks in me is not there?' Sometimes she fell into one of the mad, merry moods characteristic of her, and then she particularly loved to hear and see how Prince Andrew laughed. He seldom laughed but when he did he abandoned himself entirely to his laughter, and after such a laugh she always felt nearer to him. Natasha would have been completely happy if the thought of the separation awaiting her and drawing near had not terrified her, just as the mere thought of it made him turn pale and cold. On the eve of his departure from Petersburg Prince Andrew brought with him Pierre, who had not been to the Rostovs once since the ball. Pierre seemed disconcerted and embarrassed. He was talking to the Countess, and Natasha sat down beside a little chess-table with Sonia, thereby inviting Prince Andrew to come too. He did so. "'You have known Bazukov a long time?' he asked. "'Do you like him?' "'Yes, he's a dear, but very absurd.' And as usual when speaking of Pierre, she began to tell anecdotes of his absent-mindedness, some of which had even been invented about him. Do you know I have entrusted him with our secret? I have known him from childhood. He has a heart of gold. I beg you, Natalie," Prince Andrew said with sudden seriousness, I am going away, and heaven knows what may happen. You may cease to—all right, I know I'm not to say that—only this, then. Whatever may happen to you when I am not here, what can happen? Whatever trouble may come," Prince Andrew continued, I beg you, Mademoiselle Sophie, whatever may happen, to turn to him alone for advice and help. He is a most absent-minded and absurd fellow, but he has a heart of gold." Neither her father, nor her mother, nor Sonia, nor Prince Andrew himself could have foreseen how the separation from her lover would act on Natasha. 
Flushed and agitated, she went about the house all that day, dry-eyed, occupied with most trivial matters, as if not understanding what awaited her. She did not even cry when, on taking leave, he kissed her hand for the last time. "'Don't go,' she said, in a tone that made him wonder whether he really ought not to stay, which he remembered long afterwards. Nor did she cry when he was gone. But for several days she sat in her room dry-eyed, taking no interest in anything, and only saying now and then, "'Oh, why did he go away?' But a fortnight after his departure, to the surprise of those around her, she recovered from her mental sickness just as suddenly and became her old self again, but with a change in her moral physiognomy, as a child gets up after a long illness with a changed expression of face. End of Book Six, Chapter Twenty Four Book Six, Chapter Twenty Five Of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty Five During that year after his son's departure, Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky's health and temper became much worse. He grew still more irritable and it was Princess Mary who generally bore the brunt of his frequent fits of unprovoked anger. He seemed carefully to seek out her tender spots so as to torture her mentally as harshly as possible. Princess Mary had two passions and consequently two joys, her nephew, little Nicholas, and religion, and these were the favorite subjects of the prince's attacks and ridicule. Whatever was spoken of he would bring round to the superstitiousness of old maids, or the petting and spoiling of children. "'You want to make him, little Nicholas, into an old maid like yourself. A pity! Prince Andrew wants a son and not an old maid,' he would say. Or, turning to Mademoiselle Bourienne, he would ask her in Princess Mary's presence how she liked our village priests and icons and would joke about them. He continually hurt Princess Mary's feelings and tormented her, but it cost her no effort to forgive him. Could he be to blame toward her, or could her father, whom she knew loved her in spite of it all, be unjust? And what is justice? The princess never thought of that proud word justice. All the complex laws of man centered for her in one clear and simple law, the law of love and self-sacrifice taught us by him who lovingly suffered for mankind though he himself was God. What had she to do with the justice or injustice of other people? She had to endure and love, and that she did. During the winter Prince Andrew had come to Bald Hills, and had been gay, gentle, and more affectionate than Princess Mary had known him for a long time past. She felt that something had happened to him but he said nothing to her about his love. Before he left he had a long talk with his father about something, and Princess Mary noticed that before his departure they were dissatisfied with one another. Soon after Prince Andrew had gone, Princess Mary wrote to her friend Julie Karagina in Petersburg, whom she had dreamed, as all girls dream, of marrying to her brother, and who was at that time in mourning for her own brother killed in Turkey. Sorrow, it seems, is our common lot, my dear, tender friend, Julie. Your loss is so terrible that I can only explain it to myself as a special providence of God, who, loving you, wishes to try you and your excellent mother. Oh, my friend, religion and religion alone can, I will not say comfort us, but save us from despair. Religion alone can explain to us what without its help man cannot comprehend. Why, for what cause, kind and noble beings able to find happiness in life, not merely harming no one, but necessary to the happiness of others, are called away to God, while cruel, useless, harmful persons, or such as are a burden to themselves and to others, are left living? The first death I saw, and one I shall never forget, that of my dear sister-in-law, left that impression on me. Just as you asked Destiny why your splendid brother had to die, so I asked why that angel Lisa, who not only never wronged anyone, but in whose soul there were never any unkind thoughts, had to die. 
and what do you think, dear friend? Five years have passed since then, and already I, with my petty understanding, begin to see clearly why she had to die, and in what way that death was but an expression of the infinite goodness of the Creator, whose every action, though generally incomprehensible to us, is but a manifestation of His infinite love for His creatures. Perhaps, I often think, she was too angelically innocent to have the strength to perform all a mother's duties. As a young wife she was irreproachable. Perhaps she could not have been so as a mother. As it is, not only has she left us, and particularly Prince Andrew, with the purest regrets and memories, but probably she will there receive a place I dare not hope for myself. But do not speak of her alone. That early and terrible death has had the most beneficent influence on me and on my brother, in spite of all our grief. Then, at the moment of our loss, these thoughts could not occur to me. I should then have dismissed them with horror, but now they are very clear and certain. I write all this to you, dear friend, only to convince you of the gospel truth which has become for me a principle of life. Not a single hair of our heads will fall without His will. And His will is governed only by infinite love for us, and so whatever befalls us is for our good. You ask whether we shall spend next winter in Moscow. In spite of my wish to see you, I do not think so, and do not want to do so. You will be surprised to hear that the reason for this is Bonaparte. The case is this. My father's health is growing noticeably worse. He cannot stand any contradiction and is becoming irritable. This irritability is, as you know, chiefly directed to political questions. He cannot endure the notion that Bonaparte is negotiating on equal terms with all the sovereigns of Europe, and particularly with our own, the grandson of the great Catherine. As you know, I am quite indifferent to politics, but from my father's remarks and his talks with Michael Ivanovitch, I know all that goes on in the world, and especially about the honors conferred on Bonaparte, who only at Bald Hills in the whole world, it seems, is not accepted as a great man, still less as Emperor of France. And my father cannot stand this. It seems to me that it is chiefly because of his political views that my father is reluctant to speak of going to Moscow for he foresees the encounters that would result from his way of expressing his views regardless of anybody. All the benefit he might derive from a course of treatment he would lose as a result of the disputes about Bonaparte, which would be inevitable. In any case, it will be decided very shortly. Our family life goes on in the old way except for my brother Andrew's absence. He, as I wrote you before, has changed very much of late. After his sorrow, he only this year quite recovered his spirits. He has again become, as I used to know him when a child, kind, affectionate, with that heart of gold to which I know no equal. He has realized, it seems to me, that life is not over for him. But together with his mental change he has grown physically much weaker. He has become thinner and more nervous. I am anxious about him and glad he is taking this trip abroad which the doctors recommended long ago. I hope it will cure him. You write that in Petersburg he is spoken of as one of the most active, cultivated, and capable of the young men. Forgive my vanity as a relation, but I never doubted it. The good he has done to everybody here, from his peasants up to the gentry, is incalculable. On his arrival in Petersburg, he received only his due. I always wonder at the way rumors fly from Petersburg to Moscow, especially such false ones as that you write about. I mean the report of my brother's betrothal to the little Rostova. I do not think my brother will ever marry again, and certainly not her. And this is why. First, I know that, though he rarely speaks about the wife he has lost, the grief of that loss has gone too deep in his heart for him ever to decide to give her a successor and our little angel a stepmother. Secondly, because, as far as I know, that girl is not the kind of girl who could please Prince Andrew. I do not think he would choose her for a wife, and, frankly, I do not wish it. 
but I am running on too long and am at the end of my second sheet. Good-bye, my dear friend. May God keep you in His holy and mighty care. My dear friend, Mademoiselle Bourienne, sends you kisses. Mary End of Book Six, Chapter Twenty-Five Book Six, Chapter Twenty-Six of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, Chapter Twenty-Six. In the middle of the summer, Princess Mary received an unexpected letter from Prince Andrew in Switzerland, in which he gave her strange and surprising news. He informed her of his engagement to Natasha Rostova. The whole letter breathed loving rapture for his betrothed, and tender and confiding affection for his sister. He wrote that he had never loved as he did now, and that only now did he understand and know what life was. He asked his sister to forgive him for not having told her of his resolve when he at last visited Bald Hills, though he had spoken of it to his father. He had not done so for fear Princess Mary should ask her father to give his consent, irritating him and having to bear the brunt of his displeasure without attaining her object. Besides, he wrote, the matter was not then so definitely settled as it is now. My father then insisted on a delay of a year, and now already six months, half of that period has passed, and my resolution is firmer than ever. If the doctors did not keep me here at the spas, I should be back in Russia, but as it is, I have to postpone my return for three months. You know me and my relations with father. I want nothing from him. I have been and always shall be independent but to go against his will and arouse his anger, now that he may perhaps remain with us such a short time, would destroy half my happiness. I am now writing to him about the same question, and beg you to choose a good moment to hand him the letter, and to let me know how he looks at the whole matter, and whether there is hope that he may consent to reduce the term by four months. After long hesitations, doubts, and prayers, Princess Mary gave the letter to her father. The next day the old prince said to her quietly, "'Write and tell your brother to wait till I am dead. It won't be long. I shall soon set him free.' The princess was about to reply, but her father would not let her speak, and raising his voice more and more cried, "'Mary, Mary, my boy! A good family! Clever people, eh? Rich, eh? Yes, a nice stepmother little Nicholas will have. Write and tell him he may marry tomorrow if he likes. She will be little Nicholas' stepmother, and I'll marry Burien. Ha, ha, ha! He mustn't be without a stepmother either. Only one thing. No more women are wanted in my house. Let him marry and live by himself. Perhaps you will go and live with him too," he added, turning to Princess Mary. "'Go in heaven's name! Go out into the frost! The frost! The frost!' After this outburst, the prince did not speak any more about the matter, but repressed vexation at his son's poor-spirited behavior found expression in his treatment of his daughter. To his former pretext for irony a fresh one was now added, allusions to stepmothers and amiabilities to Mademoiselle Bourienne. "'Why shouldn't I marry her?' he asked his daughter. "'She'll make a splendid princess!' And latterly, to her surprise and bewilderment, Princess Mary noticed that her father was really associating more and more with the Frenchwoman. She wrote to Prince Andrew about the reception of his letter, but comforted him with the hopes of reconciling their father to the idea. Little Nicholas and his education, her brother Andrew, and religion were Princess Mary's joys and consolations. But besides that, since everyone must have personal hopes, Princess Mary, in the profoundest depths of her heart, had a hidden dream and hope that supplied the chief consolation of her life. This comforting dream and hope were given her by God's folk, the half-witted and other pilgrims who visited her without the prince's knowledge. The longer she lived, the more experience and observation she had of life, 
the greater was her wonder at the short-sightedness of men who seek enjoyment and happiness here on earth, toiling, suffering, struggling, and harming one another to obtain that impossible, visionary, sinful happiness. Prince Andrew had loved his wife. She died, but that was not enough. He wanted to bind his happiness to another woman. Her father objected to this because he wanted a more distinguished and wealthier match for Andrew, and they all struggled and suffered and tormented one another and injured their souls, their eternal souls, for the attainment of benefits which endure but for an instant. Not only do we know this ourselves, but Christ, the Son of God, came down to earth and told us that this life is but for a moment and is a probation, yet we cling to it and think to find happiness in it. How is it that no one realizes this? thought Prince Mary. No one except these despised God's folk, who, wallet on back, come to me by the back door, afraid of being seen by the prince, not for fear of ill usage by him, but for fear of causing him to sin. To leave family, home, and all the cares of worldly welfare, in order, without clinging to anything, to wander in hempen rags from place to place under an assumed name, doing no one any harm but praying for all, for those who drive one away, as well as for those who protect one. Higher than that life and truth, there is no life or truth. There was one pilgrim, a quiet, pockmarked little woman of fifty called Theodosia, who for over thirty years had gone about barefoot and worn heavy chains. Princess Mary was particularly fond of her. Once, when in a room with a lamp dimly lit before the icon, Theodosia was talking of her life. The thought that Theodosia alone had found the true path of life suddenly came to Princess Mary with such force that she resolved to become a pilgrim herself. When Theodosia had gone to sleep, Princess Mary thought about this for a long time, and at last made up her mind that, strange as it might seem, she must go on a pilgrimage. She disclosed this thought to no one but to her confessor, Father Akinfi, the monk, and he approved of her intention. Under guise of a present for the pilgrims, Princess Mary prepared a pilgrim's complete costume for herself, a coarse smock, bast shoes, a rough coat, and a black kerchief. Often, approaching the chest of drawers containing this secret treasure, Princess Mary paused, uncertain whether the time had not already come to put her project into execution. Often, listening to the pilgrims' tales, she was so stimulated by their simple speech, mechanical to them but to her so full of deep meaning, that several times she was on the point of abandoning everything and running away from home. In imagination she already pictured herself by Theodosia's side, dressed in coarse rags, walking with a staff, a wallet on her back along the dusty road, directing her wanderings from one saint shrine to another free from envy, earthly love, or desire, and reaching at last the place where there is no more sorrow or sighing but eternal joy and bliss. I shall come to a place and pray there, and before having time to get used to it or getting to love it, I shall go farther. I will go on till my legs fail, and I lie down and die somewhere and shall at last reach that eternal, quiet haven where there is neither sorrow nor sighing," thought Princess Mary. But afterwards, when she saw her father, and especially little Coco, Nicholas, her resolve weakened. She wept quietly and felt that she was a sinner who loved her father and little nephew more than God. End of Book Six, Chapter Twenty Six Book Seven, Chapter One, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, eighteen ten, eighteen eleven. Chapter One. The Bible legend tells us that the absence of labor, idleness, was a condition of the first man's blessedness before the fall. Fallen man has retained a love of idleness, but the curse weighs on the race not only because we have to seek our bread in the sweat of our brows, 
but because our moral nature is such that we cannot be both idle and at ease. An inner voice tells us we are in the wrong if we are idle. If man could find a state in which he felt that, though idle, he was fulfilling his duty, he would have found one of the conditions of man's primitive blessedness. And such a state of obligatory and irreproachable idleness is the lot of a whole class, the military. The chief attraction of military service has consisted and will consist in this compulsory and irreproachable idleness. Nicholas Rostov experienced this blissful condition to the full, when, after 1807, he continued to serve in the Pavlograd Regiment, in which he already commanded the squadron he had taken over from Denisov. Rostov had become a bluff, good-natured fellow, whom his Moscow acquaintances would have considered rather bad form, but who was liked and respected by his comrades, subordinates, and superiors, and was well contented with his life. Of late, in 1809, he found in letters from home more frequent complaints from his mother that their affairs were falling into greater and greater disorder, and that it was time for him to come back to gladden and comfort his old parents. Reading these letters, Nicholas felt a dread of their wanting to take him away from surroundings in which, protected from all the entanglements of life, he was living so calmly and quietly. He felt that, sooner or later, he would have to re-enter that whirlpool of life, with its embarrassments and affairs to be straightened out, its accounts with stewards, quarrels, and intrigues, its ties, society, and with Sonia's love and his promise to her. It was all dreadfully difficult and complicated, and he replied to his mother in cold, formal letters in French, beginning, My dear Mama, and ending, Your obedient son, which said nothing of when he would return. In 1810, he received letters from his parents in which they told him of Natasha's engagement to Bolkonsky, and that the wedding would be in a year's time because the old prince made difficulties. This letter grieved and mortified Nicholas. In the first place, he was sorry that Natasha, for whom he cared more than for anyone else in the family, should be lost to the home. And secondly, from his hussar point of view, he regretted not to have been there to show that fellow Bolkonsky that connection with him was no such great honor after all, and that if he loved Natasha, he might dispense with permission from his dotard father. For a moment he hesitated whether he should not apply for leave in order to see Natasha before she was married. But then came the maneuvers, and considerations about Sonia and about the confusion of their affairs, and Nicholas again put it off. But in the spring of that year he received a letter from his mother, written without his father's knowledge, and that letter persuaded him to return. She wrote that if he did not come and take matters in hand, their whole property would be sold by auction and they would all have to go begging. The Count was so weak and trusted Matenka so much and was so good-natured that everybody took advantage of him, and things were going from bad to worse. For God's sake, I implore you, come at once if you do not wish to make me and the whole family wretched," wrote the Countess. This letter touched Nicholas. He had that common sense of a matter-of-fact man which showed him what he ought to do. The right thing now was, if not to retire from the service, at any rate to go home on leave. Why he had to go he did not know but after his after-dinner nap he gave orders to saddle Mars, an extremely vicious grey stallion that had not been ridden for a long time, and when he returned with the horse all in a lather, he informed Lavrushka, Denisov's servant who had remained with him, and his comrades who turned up in the evening, that he was applying for leave and was going home. Difficult and strange as it was for him to reflect that he would go away without having heard from the staff, and this interested him extremely, whether he was promoted to a captaincy or would receive the order of St. Anne for the last maneuvers. Strange as it was to think that he would go away without having sold his three roans to the Polish Count Golikovsky, who was bargaining for the horses Rostov had betted he would sell for two thousand roubles. Incomprehensible as it seemed that the ball the hussars were giving in honor of the Polish Mademoiselle Prazjeka out of rivalry to the Ulans, who had given one in honor of their Polish Mademoiselle Borzazowska, would take place without him. 
He knew he must go away from this good, bright world to somewhere where everything was stupid and confused. A week later he obtained his leave. His hussar comrades, not only those of his own regiment but the whole brigade, gave Rostov a dinner to which the subscription was fifteen roubles a head, and at which there were two bands and two choirs of singers. Rostov danced the trepak with Major Basov. The tipsy officers tossed, embraced, and dropped Rostov. The soldiers of the third squadron tossed him too and shouted hurrah, and then they put him in his sleigh and escorted him as far as the first post station. During the first half of the journey, from Kremenchug to Kiev, all Rostov's thoughts, as is usual in such cases, were behind him with the squadron. But when he had gone more than halfway, he began to forget his three rones and Dojaveko, his quartermaster, and to wonder anxiously how things would be at Otradno and what he would find there. Thoughts of home grew stronger the nearer he approached it, far stronger, as though this feeling of his was subject to the law by which the force of attraction is in inverse proportion to the square of the distance. At the last post-station before Otradno he gave the driver a three-rouble tip and on arriving he ran breathlessly like a boy up the steps of his home. After the rapture of meeting, and after that odd feeling of unsatisfied expectation, the feeling that, everything is just the same, so why did I hurry, Nicholas began to settle down in his old home world. His father and mother were much the same, only a little older. What was new in them was a certain uneasiness and occasional discord, which there used not to be and which, as Nicholas soon found out, was due to the bad state of their affairs. Sonia was nearly twenty. She had stopped growing prettier and promised nothing more than she was already, but that was enough. She exhaled happiness and love from the time Nicholas returned, and the faithful, unalterable love of this girl had a gladdening effect on him. Petya and Natasha surprised Nicholas most. Petya was a big handsome boy of thirteen, merry, witty, and mischievous, with a voice that was already breaking. As for Natasha, for a long while Nicholas wondered and laughed whenever he looked at her. "'You're not the same at all,' he said. "'How? Am I uglier?' "'On the contrary. But what dignity! A princess!' he whispered to her. "'Yes, yes, yes!' cried Natasha joyfully. She told him about her romance with Prince Andrew, and of his visit to Otradno, and showed him his last letter. "'Well, are you glad?' Natasha asked. "'I am so tranquil and happy now.' "'Very glad,' answered Nicholas. "'He is an excellent fellow. And you are very much in love?' "'How shall I put it?' replied Natasha. "'I was in love with Boris, with my teacher, and with Denisov, but this is quite different. I feel at peace and settled.' I know that no better man than he exists, and I am calm and contented now, not at all as before." Nicholas expressed his disapproval of the postponement of the marriage for a year, but Natasha attacked her brother with exasperation, proving to him that it could not be otherwise, and that it would be a bad thing to enter a family against the father's will, and that she herself wished it so. "'You don't at all understand,' she said. Nicholas was silent and agreed with her. Her brother often wondered as he looked at her. She did not seem at all like a girl in love and parted from her affianced husband. She was even-tempered and calm and quite as cheerful as of old. This amazed Nicholas and even made him regard Bolkonsky's courtship skeptically. He could not believe that her fate was sealed, especially as he had not seen her with Prince Andrew. It always seemed to him that there was something not quite right about this intended marriage. Why this delay? Why no betrothal? he thought. Once, when he had touched on this topic with his mother, he discovered to his surprise and somewhat to his satisfaction that in the depth of her soul she too had doubts about this marriage. You see, he writes, said she, showing her son a letter of Prince Andrew's, with that latent grudge a mother always has in regard to a daughter's future married happiness. He writes that he won't come before December. What can be keeping him? Illness, probably. His health is very delicate. 
Don't tell Natasha, and don't attach importance to her being so bright. That's because she's living through the last days of her girlhood, but I know what she is like every time we receive a letter from him. However, God grant that everything turns out well. She always ended with these words. He is an excellent man. End of Book 7, Chapter 1《Book Seven, Chapter Two, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Two. After reaching home, Nicholas was at first serious and even dull. He was worried by the impending necessity of interfering in the stupid business matters for which his mother had called him home to throw off this burden as quickly as possible, on the third day after his arrival, he went, angry and scowling and without answering questions as to where he was going, to Matinka's lodge and demanded an account of everything. But what an account of everything might be Nicholas knew even less than the frightened and bewildered Matinka. The conversation and the examination of the accounts with Matinka did not last long. The village elder, a peasant delegate, and the village clerk, who were waiting in the passage, heard with fear and delight first the young Count's voice roaring and snapping and rising louder and louder, and then words of abuse, dreadful words, ejaculated one after the other. "'Robber! Ungrateful wretch! I'll hack the dog to pieces! I'm not my father! Robbing us!' and so on. Then, with no less fear and delight, they saw how the young Count, red in the face and with bloodshot eyes, dragged Matenka out by the scruff of the neck, and applied his foot and knee to his behind with great agility at convenient moments between the words, shouting, "'Be off! Never let me see your face here again, you villain!' Matenka flew headlong down the six steps and ran away into the shrubbery. This shrubbery was a well-known haven of refuge for culprits at Otradno. Betenka himself, returning tipsy from the town, used to hide there, and many of the residents of Otradno, hiding from Matenka, knew of its protective qualities. Matenka's wife and sisters-in-law thrust their heads and frightened faces out of the door of a room where a bright samovar was boiling and where the steward's high bedstead stood with its patchwork quilt. The young Count paid no heed to them, but breathing hard, passed by with resolute strides and went into the house. The Countess, who heard at once from the maids what had happened at the lodge, was calmed by the thought that now their affairs would certainly improve, but on the other hand felt anxious as to the effect this excitement might have on her son. She went several times to his door and tiptoe and listened, as he lighted one pipe after another. Next day the old Count called his son aside, and with an embarrassed smile said to him, "'But you know, my dear boy,' It's a pity you got excited. Matenka has told me all about it." I knew, thought Nicholas, that I should never understand anything in this crazy world. You were angry that he had not entered those seven hundred roubles, but they were carried forward, and you did not look at the other page. Papa, he is a blackguard and a thief. I know he is. And what I have done, I have done but, if you like, I won't speak to him again." No, my dear boy. The Count, too, felt embarrassed. He knew he had mismanaged his wife's property and was to blame toward his children, but he did not know how to remedy it. No, I beg you to attend to the business. I am old. I... No, Papa. Forgive me if I have caused you unpleasantness. I understand it all less than you do devil take all these peasants and money matters and carryings forward from page to page, he thought. I used to understand what a corner and the stakes at cards meant, but carrying forward to another page I don't understand at all, said he to himself, and after that he did not meddle in business affairs. But once the countess called her son and informed him that she had a promissory note from Anna Mikhailovna for two thousand roubles, and asked him what he thought of doing with it. This," answered Nicholas. 
You say it rests with me. Well, I don't like Anna Mikhailovna, and I don't like Boris, but they were our friends, and poor. Well, then, this. And he tore up the note, and by so doing caused the old countess to weep tears of joy. After that, young Rostov took no further part in any business affairs, but devoted himself with passionate enthusiasm to what was to him a new pursuit, the chase, for which his father kept a large establishment. End of Book 7, Chapter 2《Book Seven, Chapter Three of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Three The weather was already growing wintry, and morning frosts congealed an earth saturated by autumn rains. The verdure had thickened and its bright green stood out sharply against the brownish strips of winter rye trodden down by the cattle, and against the pale yellow stubble of the spring buckwheat. The wooded ravines and the copses, which at the end of August had still been green islands amid black fields and stubble, had become golden and bright red islands amid the green winter rye. The hares had already half changed their summer coats, the fox cubs were beginning to scatter, and the young wolves were bigger than dogs. It was the best time of the year for the chase. The hounds of that ardent young sportsman Rostov had not merely reached hard winter condition, but were so jaded that at a meeting of the huntsmen it was decided to give them a three days' rest, and then, on the 16th of September, to go on a distant expedition, starting from the oak grove where there was an undisturbed litter of wolf cubs. All that day the hounds remained at home. It was frosty and the air was sharp, but toward evening the sky became overcast and it began to thaw. On the fifteenth, when young Rostov, in his dressing-gown, looked out of the window, he saw it was an unsurpassable morning for hunting. It was as if the sky were melting and sinking to the earth without any wind. The only motion in the air was that of the dripping, microscopic particles of drizzling mist. The bare twigs in the garden were hung with transparent drops which fell on the freshly fallen leaves. The earth in the kitchen garden looked wet and black and glistened like poppy-seed, and at a short distance merged into the dull, moist veil of mist. Nicholas went out into the wet and muddy porch. There was a smell of decaying leaves and of a dog. Milka, a black-spotted, broad-hunched bitch with prominent black eyes, got up on seeing her master stretched her hind legs, lay down like a hare, and then suddenly jumped up and licked him right on his nose and moustache. Another borzoi, a dog, catching sight of his master from the garden path, arched his back and rushing headlong toward the porch with lifted tail, began rubbing himself against his legs. "'Ohoy!' came at that moment, that inimitable huntsman's call which unites the deepest bass with the shrillest tenor and round the corner came Daniel, the head huntsman and head kennelman, a grey, wrinkled old man with hair cut straight over his forehead Ukrainian fashion, a long bent whip in his hand, and that look of independence and scorn of everything that is only seen in huntsmen. He doffed his Circassian cap to his master and looked at him scornfully. This scorn was not offensive to his master. Nicholas knew that this Daniel, disdainful of everybody and who considered himself above them, was all the same his serf and huntsman. "'Daniel,' Nicholas said timidly, conscious at the sight of the weather, the hounds and the huntsman, that he was being carried away by that irresistible passion for sport which makes a man forget all his previous resolutions, as a lover forgets in the presence of his mistress. "'What orders, Your Excellency?' said the huntsman, in his deep bass, deep as a protodeacon's and hoarse with hallooing, and two flashing black eyes gazed from under his brows at his master, who was silent. "'Can you resist it?' Those eyes seemed to be asking. "'It's a good day, eh? For a hunt and a gallop, eh?' asked Nicholas, scratching Milka behind the ears. Daniel did not answer, but winked instead. "'I sent Yuvarka at dawn to listen,' his bass boomed out after a minute's pause. He says, she's moved them into the Atradno enclosure. 
They were howling there. This meant that the she-wolf, about whom they both knew, had moved with her cub to the Otradno Copse, a small place a mile and a half from the house. "'We ought to go, don't you think so?' said Nicholas. "'Come to me with you, Varka. "'As you please. "'Then put off feeding them. "'Yes, sir.' Five minutes later Daniel and Uvarka were standing in Nicholas' big study. Though Daniel was not a big man, to see him in a room was like seeing a horse or a bear on the floor among the furniture and surroundings of human life. Daniel himself felt this, and as usual stood just inside the door, trying to speak softly and not move, for fear of breaking something in the master's apartment and he hastened to say all that was necessary so as to get from under that ceiling out into the open under the sky once more. Having finished his inquiries and extorted from Daniel an opinion that the hounds were fit, Daniel himself wished to go hunting, Nicholas ordered the horses to be saddled. But just as Daniel was about to go, Natasha came in with rapid steps, not having done up her hair or finished dressing, and with her old nurse's big shawl wrapped round her. Petya ran in at the same time. "'You are going?' asked Natasha. "'I knew you would. Sonya said you wouldn't go, but I knew that today is the sort of day when you couldn't help going.' "'Yes, we are going,' replied Nicholas reluctantly, for today, as he intended to hunt seriously, he did not want to take Natasha and Petya. "'We are going, but only wolf-hunting. It will be dull for you.' "'You know it is my greatest pleasure,' said Natasha. "'It's not fair. "'You are going by yourself, are having the horses saddled, "'and said nothing to us about it. "'No barrier bars a Russian's path. "'We'll go,' shouted Petya. "'But you can't. "'Mama said you mustn't,' said Nicholas to Natasha. "'Yes, I'll go. "'I shall certainly go,' said Natasha decisively. "'Daniel?' Tell them to saddle for us, and Michael must come with my dogs," she added to the huntsman. It seemed to Daniel irksome and improper to be in a room at all, but to have anything to do with the young lady seemed to him impossible. He cast down his eyes and hurried out as if it were none of his business, careful as he went not to inflict any accidental injury on the young lady. End of Book 7, Chapter 3Book Seven, Chapter Four, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Four. The old count, who had always kept up an enormous hunting establishment, but had now handed it all completely over to his son's care, being in very good spirits on this fifteenth of September, prepared to go out with the others. In an hour's time the whole hunting party was at the porch. Nicholas, with a stern and serious air which showed that now was no time for attending to trifles, went past Natasha and Petya, who were trying to tell him something. He had a look at all the details of the hunt, sent a pack of hounds and huntsmen on ahead to find the quarry, mounted his chestnut donets, and whistling to his own leash of borzois, set off across the threshing-ground to a field leading to the Atradno wood. The old Count's horse, a sorrel gelding called Viflankia, was led by the groom in attendance on him, while the Count himself was to drive in a small trap straight to a spot reserved for him. They were taking fifty-four hounds, with six hunt attendants and whippers in. Besides the family, there were eight Borzoi kennelmen and more than forty Borzois, so that, with the Borzois on the leash belonging to members of the family, there were about a hundred and thirty dogs and twenty horsemen. Each dog knew its master and its call. Each man in the hut knew his business, his place, what he had to do. As soon as they had passed the fence, they all spread out evenly and quietly, without noise or talk, along the road and field leading to the Atradno covert. The horses stepped over the field as over a thick carpet, now and then splashing into puddles as they crossed a road. The misty sky still seemed to descend evenly and imperceptibly toward the earth, The air was still, warm and silent. 
Occasionally the whistle of a huntsman, the snort of a horse, the crack of a whip, or the whine of a straggling hound could be heard. When they had gone a little less than a mile, five more riders with dogs appeared out of the mist, approaching the Rostovs. In front rode a fresh-looking, handsome old man with a large grey moustache. "'Good morning, uncle,' said Nicholas, when the old man drew near. "'That's it. Come on. I was sure of it.' began uncle. He was a distant relative of the Rostovs, a man of small means, and their neighbor. "'I knew you wouldn't be able to resist it, and it's a good thing you're going. That's it, come on!' This was uncle's favorite expression. "'Take the covert at once, for my Gurchik says the Alagods are at Korniki with their hounds. That's it, come on! They'll take the cubs from under your very nose!' "'That's where I'm going.' "'Shall we join up our packs?' asked Nicholas. The hounds were joined into one pack, and Uncle and Nicholas rode on side by side. Natasha, muffled up in shawls which did not hide her eager face and shining eyes, galloped up to them. She was followed by Petya, who always kept close to her, by Michael, a huntsman, and by a groom appointed to look after her. Petya, who was laughing, whipped and pulled at his horse. Natasha sat easily and confidently on her black Arabchik and reined him in without effort with a firm hand. Uncle looked round disapprovingly at Petya and Natasha. He did not like to combine frivolity with the serious business of hunting. "'Good morning, Uncle. We are going, too,' shouted Petya. "'Good morning, good morning, but don't go overriding the hounds,' said Uncle sternly. "'Nicholas!' What a fine dog Trunila is! She knew me," said Natasha, referring to her favorite hound. In the first place, Trunila is not a dog but a harrier, thought Nicholas, and looked sternly at his sister, trying to make her feel the distance that ought to separate them at that moment. Natasha understood it. You mustn't think we'll be in anyone's way, uncle, she said. We'll go to our places and won't budge. A good thing, too, little countess, said uncle. Only mind you don't fall off your horse, he added, because, that's it, come on, you've got nothing to hold on to. The oasis of the Atradno covert came in sight a few hundred yards off. The huntsmen were already nearing it. Rostov, having finally settled with Uncle where they should set on the hounds, and having shown Natasha where she was to stand, a spot where nothing could possibly run out, went round above the ravine. Well, nephew, you're going for a big wolf," said Uncle. Mind, don't let her slip. That's as may happen," answered Rostov. Caray, here!" he shouted, answering Uncle's remark by this call to his borzoi. Caray was a shaggy old dog with a hanging jowl, famous for having tackled a big wolf unaided. They all took up their places. The old count, knowing his son's ardor in the hunt, hurried so as not to be late and the huntsmen had not yet reached their places when Count Ilya Rostov, cheerful, flushed, and with quivering cheeks, drove up with his black horses over the winter rye to the place reserved for him, where a wolf might come out. Having straightened his coat and fastened on his hunting knives and horn, he mounted his good, sleek, well-fed and comfortable horse Viflyankya, which was turning gray, like himself. His horses and trap were sent home. Count Ilya Rostov, though not at heart a keen sportsman, knew the rules of the hunt well, and rode to the bushy edge of the road where he was to stand, arranged his reins, settled himself in the saddle, and feeling that he was ready, looked about with a smile. Beside him was Simon Chekmar, his personal attendant, an old horseman now somewhat stiff in the saddle. Chekmar held in leash three formidable wolfhounds, who had, however, grown fat like their master and his horse. Two wise old dogs lay down unleashed. Some hundred paces farther along the edge of the wood stood Mitka, the Count's other groom, a daring horseman and keen rider to hounds. Before the hunt, by old custom, the Count had drunk a silver cupful of mulled brandy, taken a snack, and washed it down with half a bottle of his favorite Bordeaux. He was somewhat flushed with the wine and the drive. His eyes were rather moist and glittered more than usual and as he sat in his saddle, wrapped up in his fur coat, he looked like a child taken out for an outing. 
The thin, hollow-cheeked Chekmar, having got everything ready, kept glancing at his master with whom he had lived on the best of terms for thirty years, and, understanding the mood he was in, expected a pleasant chat. A third person rode up circumspectly through the wood. It was plain that he had had a lesson, and stopped behind the Count. This person was a grey-bearded old man in a woman's cloak with a tall peaked cap on his head. He was the buffoon, who went by a woman's name, Nastasya Ivanovna. "'Well, Nastasya Ivanovna,' whispered the Count, winking at him, "'if you scare away the beast, Daniel'll give it to you.' "'I know a thing or two myself.' said Nastasya Ivanovna. "'Hush!' whispered the Count, and turned to Simon. "'Have you seen the young Countess?' he asked. "'Where is she?' "'With young Count Peter, by the Tsar of Rankgrass,' answered Simon, smiling. "'Though she's a lady, she's very fond of hunting.' "'And you're surprised at the way she rides, Simon, eh?' said the Count. "'She's as good as many a man.' "'Of course. It's marvellous. So bold, so easy.' And Nicholas? Where is he? By the Lyadov upland, isn't he? Yes, sir. He knows where to stand. He understands the matter so well that Daniel and I are often quite astounded, said Simon, well knowing what would please his master. Rides well, eh? And how well he looks on his horse, eh? A perfect picture. How he chased a fox out of the rank grass by the Zvarzink's thicket the other day! Leaped a fearful place! What a sight when they rush from the covert! The horse worth a thousand roubles, and the rider beyond all price! Yes, one would have to search far to find another as smart. To search far, repeated the Count, evidently sorry Simon had not said more. To search far, he said, turning back the skirt of his coat to get at his snuff-box. The other day, when he came out from Mass in full uniform, Michael Sidorich, Simon did not finish, for on the still air he had distinctly caught the music of the hunt with only two or three hounds giving tongue. He bent down his head and listened, shaking a warning finger at his master. "'They are on the scent of the cubs,' he whispered, "'straight to the Lyadov uplands.' The Count, forgetting to smooth out the smile on his face, looked into the distance straight before him, down the narrow open space, holding the snuff-box in his hand but not taking any. After the cry of the hounds came the deep tones of the wolf-call from Daniel's hunting-horn. The pack joined the first three hounds, and they could be heard in full cry, with that peculiar lift in the note that indicates that they were after a wolf. The whippers in no longer set on the hounds, but changed to the cry of, Ulyulyu, and above the others rose Daniel's voice, now a deep bass, now piercingly shrill. His voice seemed to fill the whole wood, and carried far beyond out into the open field. After listening a few moments in silence, the Count and his attendant convinced themselves that the hounds had separated into two packs. The sound of the larger pack, eagerly giving tongue, began to die away in the distance. The other pack rushed by the wood past the Count, and it was with this that Daniel's voice was heard calling, Ulyulyu! The sounds of both packs mingled and broke apart again, but both were becoming more distant. Simon sighed and stooped to straighten the leash a young Borzoi had entangled. The Count too sighed, and, noticing the snuff-box in his hand, opened it and took a pinch. "'Back!' cried Simon to a Borzoi that was pushing forward out of the wood. The Count started and dropped the snuff-box. Nastasya Ivanova dismounted to pick it up. The Count and Simon were looking at him. Then, unexpectedly, as often happens, the sound of the hunt suddenly approached, as if the hounds in full cry and Daniel Ululuing were just in front of them. The Count turned and saw on his right Mitka staring at him with eyes starting out of his head, raising his cap and pointing before him to the other side. "'Look out!' he shouted, in a voice plainly showing that he had long fretted to utter that word, and letting the Borzoi slip, he galloped toward the Count. The Count and Simon galloped out of the wood, and saw on their left a wolf which, softly swaying from side to side, was coming at a quiet lope farther to the left to the very place where they were standing. The angry Borzois whined, and getting free of the leash, rushed past the horse's feet at the wolf. The wolf paused, turned its heavy forehead toward the dogs awkwardly, like a man suffering from the quinsy, 
and still slightly swaying from side to side, gave a couple of leaps and with a swish of its tail disappeared into the skirt of the wood. At the same instant, with a cry like a wail, first one hound, then another, and then another, sprang helter-skelter from the wood opposite, and the whole pack rushed across the field toward the very spot where the wolf had disappeared. The hazel bushes parted behind the hounds, and Daniel's chestnut horse appeared, dark with sweat. On its back sat Daniel, hunched forward, capless, his disheveled gray hair hanging over his flushed, perspiring face. "'Oh, you, you, you! Oh, you, you!' he cried. When he caught sight of the Count, his eyes flashed lightning. "'Blast you!' he shouted, holding up his whip threateningly at the Count. "'You've let the wolf go! What sportsman!' And as if scorning to say more to the frightened and shamefaced Count, he lashed the heaving flanks of his sweating chestnut gilding with all the anger the Count had aroused and flew off after the hounds. The Count, like a punished schoolboy, looked round, trying by a smile to win Simon's sympathy for his plight. But Simon was no longer there. He was galloping round by the bushes while the field was coming up on both sides, all trying to head the wolf, but it vanished into the wood before they could do so. End of Book 7, Chapter 4《Book Seven, Chapter Five of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Five. Nicholas Rostov, meanwhile, remained at his post, waiting for the wolf. By the way the hunt approached and receded, by the cries of the dogs whose notes were familiar to him, by the way the voices of the huntsmen approached, receded, and rose, he realized what was happening at the copse. He knew that young and old wolves were there, that the hounds had separated into two packs, that somewhere a wolf was being chased, and that something had gone wrong. He expected the wolf to come his way any moment. He made thousands of different conjectures as to where and from what side the beast would come, and how he would set upon it. Hope alternated with despair. Several times he addressed a prayer to God that the wolf should come his way. He prayed with that passionate and shamefaced feeling with which men pray at moments of great excitement arising from trivial causes. "'What would it be to thee to do this for me?' he said to God. "'I know thou art great, and that it is a sin to ask this of thee, but for God's sake do let the old wolf come my way and let Caray spring at it, in sight of uncle who is watching from over there, and seize it by the throat in a death grip. A thousand times during that half hour Rostov cast eager and restless glances over the edge of the wood, with the two scraggy oaks rising above the aspen undergrowth and the gully with its water-worn side, and uncle's cap just visible above the bush on his right. No, I shan't have such luck, thought Rostov. Yet what wouldn't it be worth? It is not to be. Everywhere, at cards and in war, I am always unlucky." Memories of Austerlitz and of Dolokhov flashed rapidly and clearly through his mind. "'Only once in my life to get an old wolf, I want only that,' thought he, straining eyes and ears and looking to the left and then to the right and listening to the slightest variation of note in the cries of the dogs. Again he looked to the right and saw something running toward him across the deserted field. No, it can't be, thought Rostov, taking a deep breath, as a man does at the coming of something long hoped for. The height of happiness was reached, and so simply, without warning or noise or display, that Rostov could not believe his eyes and remained in doubt for over a second. The wolf ran forward and jumped heavily over a gully that lay in her path. She was an old animal with a gray back and big reddish belly. She ran without hurry evidently feeling sure that no one saw her. Rostov, holding his breath, looked round at the Borzois. They stood or lay, not seeing the wolf or understanding the situation. Old Caray had turned his head and was angrily searching for fleas, baring his yellow teeth and snapping at his hind legs. "'Oh, you, you, you!' whispered Rostov, pouting his lips. The Borzois jumped up, jerking the rings of the leashes and pricking their ears. Caray finished scratching his hindquarters and cocking his ears, 
got up with quivering tail from which tufts of matted hair hung down. "'Shall I loose them or not?' Nicholas asked himself as the wolf approached him coming from the cups. Suddenly the wolf's whole physiognomy changed. She shuddered, seeing what she had probably never seen before, human eyes fixed upon her, and turning her head a little toward Rostov, she paused. "'Back or forward?' "'Eh, no matter. Forward,' the wolf seemed to say to herself, and she moved forward without again looking round, and with a quiet, long, easy, yet resolute lope. "'Ul you cried Nicholas, in a voice not his own, and of its own accord his good horse darted headlong downhill, leaping over gullies to head off the wolf, and the borzois passed it, running faster still. Nicholas did not hear his own cry, nor feel that he was galloping, nor see the borzois, nor the ground over which he went. He saw only the wolf, who, increasing her speed, bounded on in the same direction along the hollow. The first to come into view was Milka, with her black markings and powerful quarters, gaining upon the wolf. Nearer and nearer, now she was ahead of it, but the wolf turned its head to face her, and instead of putting on speed as she usually did, Milka suddenly raised her tail and stiffened her forelegs. "'Ulyu, liu, 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 liu!' shouted Nicholas. The reddish Liubim rushed forward from behind Milka, sprang impetuously at the wolf, and seized it by its hindquarters, but immediately jumped aside in terror. The wolf crouched, gnashed her teeth, and again rose and bounded forward, followed at the distance of a couple of feet by all the borzois, who did not get any closer to her. "'She'll get away! No, it's impossible!' thought Nicholas, still shouting with a hoarse voice. "'Karay! Ulyulyu!' he shouted, looking round for the old borzoi who was now his only hope. Karay, with all the strength age had left him, stretched himself to the utmost, and watching the wolf, galloped heavily aside to intercept it. But the quickness of the wolf's lope and the borzois' slower pace made it plain that Karay had miscalculated. Nicholas could already see, not far in front of him, the wood where the wolf would certainly escape should she reach it. But coming toward him, he saw hounds and a huntsman galloping almost straight at the wolf. There was still hope. A long yellowish young borzoi, one Nicholas did not know from another leash, rushed impetuously at the wolf from in front and almost knocked her over. But the wolf jumped up more quickly than anyone could have expected, and gnashing her teeth, flew at the yellowish borzoi which, with a piercing yelp, fell with its head on the ground, bleeding from a gash in its side. "'Cray! Old fellow!' wailed Nicholas. Thanks to the delay caused by this crossing of the wolf's path, the old dog with its felted hair hanging from its thigh was within five paces of it. As if aware of her danger, the wolf turned her eyes on Cray, tucked her tail yet further between her legs, and increased her speed. But here Nicholas only saw that something happened to Caray. The borzoi was suddenly on the wolf, and they rolled together down into a gully just in front of them. That instant, when Nicholas saw the wolf struggling in the gully with the dogs, while from under them could be seen her gray hair and outstretched hind leg and her frightened choking head, with her ears laid back, Caray was pinning her by the throat, was the happiest moment of his life. With his hand on his saddle-bow, he was ready to dismount and stab the wolf, when she suddenly thrust her head up from among that mass of dogs, and then her forepaws were on the edge of the gully. She clicked her teeth, Caray no longer had her by the throat, leaped with a movement of her hind legs out of the gully, and having disengaged herself from the dogs, with tail tucked in again, went forward. Caray, his hair bristling and probably bruised or wounded, climbed with difficulty out of the gully. "'Oh, my God!' "'Why?' Nicholas cried in despair. Uncle's huntsman was galloping from the other side across the wolf's path, and his borzois once more stopped the animal's advance. She was again hemmed in. Nicholas and his attendant, with Uncle and his huntsman, were all riding round the wolf, crying, "'Ulyu!' and shouting and preparing to dismount each moment that the wolf crouched back, and starting forward again every time she shook herself and moved toward the wood where she would be safe. Already at the beginning of this chase, Daniel, hearing the ululuing, had rushed out from the wood. He saw Caray seize the wolf and checked his horse, supposing the affair to be over. But when he saw that the horseman did not dismount and that the wolf shook herself and ran for safety, 
Daniel set his chestnut galloping, not at the wolf, but straight toward the wood, just as Caray had run to cut the animal off. As a result of this, he galloped up to the wolf just when she had been stopped a second time by Uncle's Borzois. Daniel galloped up silently, holding a naked dagger in his left hand and thrashing the laboring sides of his chestnut horse with his whip as if it were a flail. Nicholas neither saw nor heard Daniel until the chestnut, breathing heavily, panted past him, and he heard the fall of a body and saw Daniel lying on the wolf's back among the dogs, trying to seize her by the ears. It was evident to the dogs, the hunters, and to the wolf herself that all was now over. The terrified wolf pressed back her ears and tried to rise, but the borzoi stuck to her. Daniel rose a little, took a step, and with his whole weight, as if lying down to rest, fell on the wolf, seizing her by the ears. Nicholas was about to stab her, but Daniel whispered, "'Don't! We'll gag her!' and, changing his position, set his foot on the wolf's neck. A stick was thrust between her jaws, and she was fastened with a leash, as if bridled, her legs were bound together, and Daniel rolled her over once or twice from side to side. With happy, exhausted faces, they laid the old wolf alive on a shying and snorting horse, and accompanied by the dogs yelping at her, took her to the place where they were all to meet. The hounds had killed one of the cubs, and the borzois three. The huntsmen assembled with their booty and their stories, and all came to look at the wolf, which, with her broad-browed head hanging down and the bitten stick between her jaws, gazed with great glassy eyes at this crowd of dogs and men surrounding her. When she was touched, she jerked her bound legs and looked wildly yet simply at everybody. Old Count Rostov also rode up and touched the wolf. "'Oh, what a formidable one!' said he. "'A formidable one, eh?' he asked Daniel, who was standing near. "'Yes, Your Excellency,' answered Daniel, quickly doffing his cap. The Count remembered the wolf he had let slip and his encounter with Daniel. "'Ah, but you're a crusty fellow, friend,' said the Count. For sole reply, Daniel gave him a shy, childlike, meek, and amiable smile. End of Book 7, Chapter 5《Book Seven, Chapter Six of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Six. The old count went home, and Natasha and Petya promised to return very soon, but as it was still early, the hunt went farther. At midday they put the hounds into a ravine thickly overgrown with young trees. Nicholas, standing in a fallow field, could see all his whips. Facing him lay a field of winter rye. There his own huntsman stood alone in a hollow behind a hazel bush. The hounds had scarcely been loosed before Nicholas heard one he knew, Voltorn, giving tongue at intervals. Other hounds joined in, now pausing and now again giving tongue. A moment later he heard a cry from the wooded ravine that a fox had been found, and the whole pack, joining together, rushed along the ravine toward the rye-field and away from Nicholas. He saw the whips in their red caps galloping along the edge of the ravine. He even saw the hounds and was expecting a fox to show itself at any moment on the rye-field opposite. The huntsman standing in the hollow moved and loosed his borzois, and Nicholas saw a queer, short-legged red fox with a fine brush going hard across the field. The borzois bore down on it. Now they drew close to the fox which began to dodge between the field in sharper and sharper curves, trailing its brush, when suddenly a strange white borzoi dashed in followed by a black one, and everything was in confusion. The borzois formed a star-shaped figure, scarcely swaying their bodies and with tails turned away from the center of the group. Two huntsmen galloped up to the dogs, one in a red cap, the other a stranger in a green coat. "'What's this?' thought Nicholas. "'Where's that huntsman from? He is not uncle's man.' The huntsman got the fox, but stayed there a long time without strapping it to the saddle. Their horses, bridled and with high saddles, stood near them, and there, too, the dogs were lying. The huntsmen waved their arms and did something to the fox. Then from that spot came the sound of a horn, with the signal agreed on in case of a fight. 
That's Elegan's huntsman having a row with our Ivan, said Nicholas Groom. Nicholas sent the man to call Natasha and Petya to him, and rode at a footpace to the place where the whips were getting the hounds together. Several of the field galloped to the spot where the fight was going on. Nicholas dismounted, and with Natasha and Petya, who had ridden up, stopped near the hounds, waiting to see how the matter would end. Out of the bushes came the huntsman who had been fighting and rode toward his young master, with the fox tied to his crupper. While still at a distance, he took off his cap and tried to speak respectfully, but he was pale and breathless and his face was angry. One of his eyes was black, but he probably was not even aware of it. "'What has happened?' asked Nicholas. "'A likely thing! Killing a fox our dogs had hunted! And it was my grey bitch that caught it! Go to law, indeed! He snatches at the fox! I gave him one with the fox! Here it is on my saddle! Do you want a taste of this?' said the huntsman, pointing to his dagger, and probably imagining himself still speaking to his foe. Nicholas, not stopping to talk to the man, asked his sister and Petya to wait for him, and rode to the spot where the enemy's Elagans hunting party was. The victorious huntsman rode off to join the field, and there, surrounded by inquiring sympathizers, recounted his exploits. The facts were that Elagan, with whom the Rostovs had a quarrel and were at law, hunted over places that belonged by custom to the Rostovs, and had now, as if purposely, sent his men to the very woods the Rostovs were hunting, and let his man snatch a fox their dogs had chased. Nicholas, though he had never seen Elagin, with his usual absence of moderation in judgment, hated him cordially from reports of his arbitrariness and violence, and regarded him as his bitterest foe. He rode in angry agitation toward him, firmly grasping his whip and fully preparing to take the most resolute and desperate steps to punish his enemy. Hardly had he passed an angle of the wood before a stout gentleman in a beaver cap came riding toward him, on a handsome raven-black horse, accompanied by two hunt-servants. Instead of an enemy, Nicholas found in Elagin a stately and courteous gentleman, who was particularly anxious to make the young Count's acquaintance. Having ridden up to Nicholas, Ilagan raised his beaver cap and said he much regretted what had occurred, and would have the man punished who had allowed himself to seize a fox hunted by someone else's borzois. He hoped to become better acquainted with the Count and invited him to draw his covert. Natasha, afraid that her brother would do something dreadful, had followed him in some excitement. Seeing the enemies exchanging friendly greetings, she rode up to them. Elagin lifted his beaver cap still higher to Natasha, and said, with a pleasant smile, that the young countess resembled Diana in her passion for the chase, as well as in her beauty, of which he had heard much. To expiate his huntsman's offence, Elagin pressed the Rostovs to come to an upland of his about a mile away, which he usually kept for himself, and which, he said, swarmed with hares. Nicholas agreed, and the hunt, now doubled, moved on. The way to Elagin's upland was across the fields. The hut servants fell into line. The masters rode together. Uncle, Rostov, and Elagin kept stealthily glancing at one another's dogs, trying not to be observed by their companions and searching uneasily for rivals to their own borzois. Rostov was particularly struck by the beauty of a small, purebred, red-spotted bitch on Elagin's leash, slender but with muscles like steel a delicate muzzle and prominent black eyes. He had heard of the swiftness of Elagin's borzois, and in that beautiful bitch saw a rival to his own Milka. In the middle of a sober conversation begun by Elagin about the year's harvest, Nicholas pointed to the red-spotted bitch. "'A fine little bitch, that,' said he in a careless tone. "'Is she swift?' "'That one? Yes, she's a good dog. Gets what she's after.' answered Elagin indifferently, of their red-spotted bitch Urza, for which, a year before, he had given a neighbor three families of house-serfs. "'So in your parts, too, the harvest is nothing to boast of, Count?' he went on, continuing the conversation they had begun. And considering it polite to return the young Count's compliment, Elagin looked at his borzois and picked out Milka, who attracted his attention by her breadth. "'That black-spotted one of yours is fine, well-shaped.' said he. 
Yes, she's fast enough, replied Nicholas, and thought, if only a full-grown hare would cross the field now, I'd show you what sort of borzoi she is. And turning to his groom, he said he would give a rouble to anyone who found a hare. I don't understand, continued Ilagin, how come sportsmen can be so jealous about game and dogs? For myself, I can tell you, Count, I enjoy riding in company such as this. What could be better? He again raised his cap to Natasha. But as for counting skins and what one takes, I don't care about that. Of course not. Or being upset because someone else's borzoi and not mine catches something. All I care about is to enjoy seeing the chase. Is it not so, Count? For I consider that— A two! came the long-drawn cry of one of the borzoi whippers in who had halted. He stood on a knoll in the stubble, holding his whip aloft, and again repeated his long-drawn cry, A two! This call and the uplifted whip meant that he saw a sitting hare. Ah, he has found one, I think, said Ilagin carelessly. Yes, we must ride up. Shall we both course it? answered Nicholas, seeing in Urza and Uncle's red rouget two rivals he had never yet had a chance of pitting against his own borzois. And suppose they outdo my Milka at once, he thought as he rode with Uncle and Ilagin toward the hare. A full-grown one? asked Ilagin as he approached the whip who had sighted the hare, and not without agitation he looked round and whistled to Urza. And you, Michael Nikonorovitch? he said, addressing Uncle. The latter was writing with a sullen expression on his face. How can I join in? Why, you've given a village for each of your borzois. That's it, come on. Yours are worth thousands. Try yours against one another, you two, and I'll look on. Rugay, hey, hey, he shouted. Rugayushka! He added, involuntarily by this diminutive, expressing his affection and the hopes he placed on this red borzoi. Natasha saw and felt the agitation the two elderly men and her brother were trying to conceal, and was herself excited by it. The huntsman stood halfway up the knoll, holding up his whip, and the gentlefolk rode up to him at a foot-pace. The hounds that were far off on the horizon turned away from the hare, and the whips, but not the gentlefolk, also moved away. All were moving slowly and sedately. "'How is it pointing?' asked Nicholas, riding a hundred paces toward the whip who had sighted the hare. But before the whip could reply, the hare, scenting the frost coming next morning, was unable to rest and leaped up. The pack on leash rushed downhill in full cry after the hare, and from all sides the borzois that were not on leash darted after the hounds and the hare. All the hunt, who had been moving slowly, shouted, Stop! calling in the hounds, while the borzoi whips, with a cry of, a two! galloped across the field, setting the borzois on the hare. The tranquil Ilagan, Nicholas, Natasha, and Uncle flew, reckless of where and how they went, seeing only the borzois and the hare, and fearing only to lose sight even for an instant of the chase. The hare they had started was a strong and swift one. When he jumped up, he did not run at once, but pricked his ears listening to the shouting and trampling that resounded from all sides at once. He took a dozen bounds, not very quickly, letting the borzois gain on him, and finally, having chosen his direction and realized his danger, laid back his ears and rushed off headlong. He had been lying in the stubble, but in front of him was the autumn sowing where the ground was soft. The two borzois of the huntsman who had sighted him, having been the nearest, were the first to see and pursue him, but they had not gone far before Ilagan's red-spotted Urza passed them got within a length, flew at the hare with terrible swiftness aiming at his scut, and thinking she had seized him, rolled over like a ball. The hare arched his back and bounded off yet more swiftly. From behind Urza rushed the broad-haunched, black-spotted Milka, and began rapidly gaining on the hare. "'Milashka, dear!' rose Nicholas' triumphant cry. It looked as if Milka would immediately pounce on the hare, but she overtook him and flew past. The hare had squatted. Again the beautiful Urza reached him, but when close to the hare's scut, paused as if measuring the distance, so as not to make a mistake this time, but seize his hind leg. "'Urza, darling!' Ilagin wailed in a voice unlike his own. Urza did not hearken to his appeal. 
At the very moment when she would have seized her prey, the hare moved and darted along the balk between the winter rye and the stubble. Again Urza and Milka were abreast, running like a pair of carriage-horses, and began to overtake the hare. But it was easier for the hare to run on the balk and the borzois did not overtake him so quickly. Ruge, Rugayushka, That's it! Come on!' came a third voice just then, and Uncle's red borzoi, straining and curving its back, caught up with the two foremost borzois, pushed ahead of them regardless of the terrible strain, put on speed close to the hare, knocked it off the balk onto the rye-field, again put on speed still more viciously, sinking to his knees in the muddy field, and all one could see was how, muddying his back, he rolled over with the hare. A ring of borzois surrounded him. A moment later everyone had drawn up round the crowd of dogs. Only the delighted uncle dismounted and cut off a pad, shaking the hair for the blood to drip off and anxiously glancing round with restless eyes while his arms and legs twitched. He spoke without himself knowing whom to or what about. "'That's it! Come on! That's a dog! There! It has beaten them all! The thousand rouble as well as the one rouble borzois! That's it! Come on!' said he, panting and looking wrathfully around as if he were abusing someone, as if they were all his enemies and had insulted him, and only now had he at last succeeded in justifying himself. "'There are your thousand-rouble ones! That's it! Come on!' "'Ruge, here's a pad for you,' he said, throwing down the hare's muddy pad. "'You've deserved it! That's it! Come on!' She tired herself out. She'd run it down three times by herself," said Nicholas, also not listening to anyone, and regardless of whether he were heard or not. "'But what is there running across it like that?' said Ilagin's groom. "'Once she had missed it and it turned away, any mongrel could take it,' Ilagin was saying at the same time, breathless from his gallop and his excitement. At the same moment, Natasha, without drawing breath, screamed joyously, ecstatically, and so piercingly that it set everyone's ear tingling. By that shriek she expressed what the others expressed by all talking at once, and it was so strange that she must herself have been ashamed of so wild a cry, and everyone else would have been amazed at it at any other time. Uncle himself twisted up the hair, threw it neatly and smartly across his horse's back, as if by that gesture he meant to rebuke everybody, and with an air of not wishing to speak to anyone, mounted his bay and rode off. The others all followed, dispirited and shamefaced, and only much later were they able to regain their former affectation of indifference. For a long time they continued to look at Red Rugay who, his arched back spattered with mud and clanking the ring of his leash, walked along just behind Uncle's horse with the serene air of a conqueror. "'Well, I am like any other dog as long as it's not a question of coursing. But when it is, then look out!' his appearance seemed to Nicholas to be saying. When, much later, Uncle rode up to Nicholas and began talking to him, he felt flattered that, after what had happened, Uncle deigned to speak to him. End of Book 7, Chapter 6「Book 7, Chapter 7 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 7, Chapter 7 Toward evening Ilagan took leave of Nicholas, who found that they were so far from home that he accepted uncle's offer that the hunting party should spend the night in his little village of Mikhailovna. "'And if you put up at my house, that will be better still. That's it, come on,' said uncle. "'You see, it's damp weather, and you could rest, and the little countess could be driven home in a trap.' Uncle's offer was accepted. A huntsman was sent to Atrodno for a trap, while Nicholas rode with Natasha and Petya to uncle's house. Some five male domestic serfs, big and little, rushed out to the front porch to meet their master. A score of women serfs, old and young, as well as children, popped out from the back entrance to have a look at the hunters who were arriving. The presence of Natasha, a woman, a lady, and on horseback, 
raised the curiosity of the serfs to such a degree that many of them came up to her, stared her in the face, and unabashed by her presence, made remarks about her as though she were some prodigy on show, and not a human being able to hear or understand what was said about her. Arinka, look, she sits sideways. There she sits, and her skirt dangles. See, she's got a little hunting horn. Good gracious, see her knife? Isn't she a tartar? How is it you didn't go head over heels? asked the boldest of them all, addressing Natasha directly. Uncle dismounted at the porch of his little wooden house, which stood in the midst of an overgrown garden, and after a glance at his retainers, shouted authoritatively that the superfluous one should take themselves off, and that all necessary preparations should be made to receive the guests and the visitors. The serfs all dispersed. Uncle lifted Natasha off her horse, and taking her hand, led her up the rickety wooden steps of the porch. The house, with its bare, unplastered log walls, was not over-clean. It did not seem that those living in it aimed at keeping it spotless, but neither was it noticeably neglected. In the entry there was a smell of fresh apples, and wolf and fox-skins hung about. Uncle led the visitors through the anteroom into a small hall with a folding-table and red chairs, then into the drawing-room with a round birchwood table and a sofa, and finally into his private room, where there was a tattered sofa, a worn carpet, and portraits of Suvarov, of the host's father and mother, and of himself in military uniform. The study smelled strongly of tobacco and dogs. Uncle asked his visitors to sit down and make themselves at home, and then went out of the room. Rouguet, his back still muddy, came into the room and lay down on the sofa, cleaning himself with his tongue and teeth. Leading from the study was a passage in which a partition with ragged curtains could be seen. From behind this came women's laughter and whispers. Natasha, Nicholas, and Petya took off their wraps and sat down on the sofa. Petya, leaning on his elbow, fell asleep at once. Natasha and Nicholas were silent. Their faces glowed, they were hungry and very cheerful. They looked at one another. Now that the hunt was over and they were in the house, Nicholas no longer considered it necessary to show his manly superiority over his sister. Natasha gave him a wink, and neither refrained long from bursting into a peal of ringing laughter even before they had a pretext ready to account for it. After a while Uncle came in, in a Cossack coat, blue trousers, and small top-boots. And Natasha felt that this costume, the very one she had regarded with surprise and amusement at Otradno, was just the right thing, and not at all worse than a swallow-tail or frock-coat. Uncle, too, was in high spirits, and far from being offended by the brothers' and sisters' laughter, it could never enter his head that they might be laughing at his way of life, he himself joined in the merriment. "'That's right, young countess, that's it, come on! I never saw anyone like her,' said he, offering Nicholas a pipe with a long stem, and with a practiced motion of three fingers taking down another that had been cut short. She's ridden all day like a man, and is as fresh as ever." Soon after Uncle's reappearance, the door was opened, evidently from the sound by a barefooted girl, and a stout, rosy, good-looking woman of about forty, with a double chin and full red lips, entered, carrying a large loaded tray. With hospitable dignity and cordiality in her glance and in every motion, she looked at the visitors and, with a pleasant smile, bowed respectfully. In spite of her exceptional stoutness, which caused her to protrude her chest and stomach and throw back her head, this woman, who was uncle's housekeeper, trod very lightly. She went to the table, set down the tray, and with her plump white hands deftly took from it the bottles and various hors d'oeuvres and dishes and arranged them on the table. When she had finished, she stepped aside and stopped at the door with a smile on her face. Here I am, I am she. Now do you understand, uncle?" her expression said to Rostov. How could one help understanding? Not only Nicholas, but even Natasha understood the meaning of his puckered brow and the happy complacent smile that slightly puckered his lips when Anisia Fedorovna entered. 
On the tray was a bottle of herb wine, different kinds of vodka, pickled mushrooms, rye cakes made with buttermilk, honey in the comb, still mead and sparkling mead, apples, nuts, raw and roasted, and nut and honey sweets. Afterwards she brought a freshly roasted chicken, ham, preserves made with honey, and preserves made with sugar. All this was the fruit of Anisia Fedorovna's housekeeping, gathered and prepared by her. The smell and taste of it all had a smack of Anisia Fedorovna herself, a savor of juiciness, cleanliness, whiteness, and pleasant smiles. "'Take this, little lady countess,' she kept saying as she offered Natasha first one thing and then another. Natasha ate of everything and thought she had never seen or eaten such buttermilk cakes, such aromatic jam, such honey and nut sweets, or such a chicken anywhere. Anisya Fedorovna left the room. After supper, over their cherry brandy, Rostov and Uncle talked of past and future hunts, of Rouguet and Elagin's dogs, while Natasha sat upright on the sofa and listened with sparkling eyes. She tried several times to wake Petya that he might eat something, but he only muttered incoherent words without waking up. Natasha felt so light-hearted and happy in these novel surroundings that she only feared the trap would come for her too soon. After a casual pause, such as often occurs when receiving friends for the first time in one's own house, Uncle, answering a thought that was in his visitors' minds, said, "'This, you see, is how I am finishing my days. Death will come. That's it, come on. Nothing will remain. Then why harm anyone?' Uncle's face was very significant and even handsome as he said this. Involuntarily, Rostov recalled all the good he had heard about him from his father and the neighbors. Throughout the whole province, Uncle had the reputation of being the most honorable and disinterested of cranks. They called him in to decide family disputes, chose him as executor, confided secrets to him, elected him to be a justice and to other posts but he always persistently refused public appointments, passing the autumn and spring in the fields on his bay gelding, sitting at home in winter and lying in his overgrown garden in summer. "'Why don't you enter the service, uncle?' "'I did once, but gave it up. I am not fit for it. That's it, come on. I can't make head or tail of it. That's for you. I haven't brains enough. Now, hunting is another matter.' That's it. Come on. Open the door there, he shouted. Why have you shut it? The door at the end of the passage led to the huntsman's room, as they called the room for the hunt servants. There was a rapid patter of bare feet, and an unseen hand opened the door into the huntsman's room, from which came the clear sounds of a balalaika on which someone, who was evidently a master of the art, was playing. Natasha had been listening to those strains for some time, and now went out into the passage to hear better. "'That's Smitka, my coachman. I have got him a good balalaika. I'm fond of it,' said Uncle. It was the custom for Mitka to play the balalaika in the huntsman's room when Uncle returned from the chase. Uncle was fond of such music. "'How good! Really, very good!' said Nicholas with some unintentional superciliousness, as if ashamed to confess that the sounds pleased him very much. "'Very good,' said Natasha reproachfully, noticing her brother's tone. "'Not very good. It's simply delicious!' Just as Uncle's pickled mushrooms, honey, and cherry brandy had seemed to her the best in the world, so also that song, at that moment, seemed to her the acme of musical delight. "'More, please, more!' cried Natasha at the door as soon as the balalaika ceased. Mika tuned up afresh, and recommenced thrumming the balalaika to the air of My Lady, with trills and variations. Uncle sat listening, slightly smiling, with his head on one side. The air was repeated a hundred times. The balalaika was retuned several times, and the same notes were thrummed again, but the listeners did not grow weary of it and wished to hear it again and again. Anisya Fedorovna came in and leaned her portly person against the doorpost. "'You like listening?' 
she said to Natasha, with a smile extremely like uncle's. "'That's a good player of ours,' she added. "'He doesn't play that part right,' said uncle suddenly, with an energetic gesture. "'Here he ought to burst out. That's it, come on. Ought to burst out.' "'Do you play, then?' asked Natasha. Uncle did not answer, but smiled. "'Anisia, go and see if the strings of my guitar are all right. I haven't touched it for a long time. That's it, come on. I've given it up.' Anisia Fedorovna, with her light step, willingly went to fulfill her errand and brought back the guitar. Without looking at anyone, Uncle blew the dust off it, and tapping the case with his bony fingers, tuned the guitar and settled himself in his armchair. He took the guitar a little above the fingerboard, arching his left elbow with a somewhat theatrical gesture, and with a wink at Anisya Fedorovna, struck a single chord, pure and sonorous, and then quietly, smoothly, and confidently began playing in a very slow time, not my lady, but the well-known song, Came a Maiden Down the Street. The tune, played with precision and in exact time, began to thrill in the hearts of Nicholas and Natasha arousing in them the same kind of sober mirth as radiated from Anisia Fedorovna's whole being. Anisia Fedorovna flushed, and drawing her kerchief over her face went laughing out of the room. Uncle continued to play correctly, carefully, with energetic firmness, looking with a changed and inspired expression at the spot where Anisia Fedorovna had just stood. Something seemed to be laughing a little on one side of his face under his gray mustaches, especially as the song grew brisker and the time quicker, and when, here and there, as he ran his fingers over the strings, something seemed to snap. "'Lovely, lovely! Go on, uncle, go on!' shouted Natasha as soon as he had finished. She jumped up and hugged and kissed him. "'Nicholas, Nicholas!' she said, turning to her brother, as if asking him. What is it moves me so?" Nicholas, too, was greatly pleased by uncle's playing, and uncle played the piece over again. Anisia Fedorovna's smiling face reappeared in the doorway, and behind hers other faces. "'Fetching water clear and sweet! Stop, dear maiden, I entreat!' played uncle once more, running his fingers skillfully over the strings, and then he stopped short and jerked his shoulders. "'Go on, uncle dear!' Natasha wailed in an imploring tone, as if her life depended on it. Uncle rose, and it was as if there were two men in him. One of them smiled seriously at the merry fellow, while the merry fellow struck a naive and precise attitude preparatory to a folk dance. "'Now then, niece!' he exclaimed, waving to Natasha the hand that had just struck a chord. Natasha threw off the shawl from her shoulders, ran forward to face uncle, and setting her arms akimbo, also made a motion with her shoulders and struck an attitude. Where, how, and when had this young countess, educated by an émigré French governess, imbibed from the Russian air she breathed that spirit and obtained that manner which the pas de chale, the French shawl dance, would, one would have supposed, long ago have effaced? but the spirit and the movements were those inimitable and unteachable Russian ones that uncle had expected of her. As soon as she had struck her pose and smiled triumphantly, proudly, and with sly merriment, the fear that had at first seized Nicholas and the others that she might not do the right thing was at an end, and they were already admiring her. She did the right thing with such precision, such complete precision, that Anisia Fedorovna, who had at once handed her the handkerchief she needed for the dance, had tears in her eyes, though she laughed as she watched this slim, graceful countess, reared in silks and velvets and so different from herself, who yet was able to understand all that was in Anisia and in Anisia's father and mother and aunt and in every Russian man and woman. "'Well, little countess, that's it, come on!' cried uncle, with a joyous laugh, having finished the dance. "'Well done, niece! Now a fine young fellow must be found as husband for you. That's it, come on!' "'He's chosen already,' said Nicholas, smiling. "'Oh?' said uncle in surprise, looking inquiringly at Natasha, who nodded her head with a happy smile. "'And such a one,' she said. 
but as soon as she had said it, a new train of thoughts and feelings arose in her. What did Nicholas Smile mean when he said, chosen already? Is he glad of it, or not? It is as if he thought my Bolkonsky would not approve of or understand our gaiety. But he would understand it all. Where is he now? she thought, and her face suddenly became serious. But this lasted only a second. Don't dare to think about it, she said to herself, and sat down again smilingly beside Uncle, begging him to play something more. Uncle played another song and a valse. Then, after a pause, he cleared his throat and sang his favorite hunting song. As twas growing dark last night, fell the snow so soft and light. Uncle sang as peasants sing, with full and naive conviction that the whole meaning of a song lies in the words, and that the tune comes of itself, and that, apart from the words, there is no tune, which exists only to give measure to the words. As a result of this, the unconsidered tune, like the song of a bird, was extraordinarily good. Natasha was in ecstasies over uncle's singing. She resolved to give up learning the harp and to play only the guitar. She asked uncle for his guitar and at once found the chords of the song. After nine o'clock, two traps and three mounted men, who had been sent to look for them, arrived to fetch Natasha and Petya. The Count and Countess did not know where they were, and were very anxious, said one of the men. Petya was carried out like a log and laid in the larger of the two traps. Natasha and Nicholas got into the other. Uncle wrapped Natasha up warmly and took leave of her with quite a new tenderness. He accompanied them on foot as far as the bridge that could not be crossed, so that they had to go round by the ford, and he sent huntsmen to ride in front with lanterns. "'Good-bye, dear niece,' his voice called out of the darkness, not the voice Natasha had known previously, but the one that had sung as twas growing dark last night. In the village through which they passed there were red lights and a cheerful smell of smoke. "'What a darling uncle is!' said Natasha, when they had come out onto the high road. "'Yes,' returned Nicholas. "'You're not cold?' "'No, I'm quite, quite all right. I feel so comfortable,' answered Natasha, almost perplexed by her feelings. They remained silent a long while. The night was dark and damp. They could not see the horses, but only heard them splashing through the unseen mud. What was passing in that receptive, childlike soul that so eagerly caught and assimilated all the diverse impressions of life? How did they all find place in her? But she was very happy. As they were nearing home, she suddenly struck up the air of As Twas Growing Dark Last Night, the tune of which she had all the way been trying to get and had at last caught. "'Got it?' said Nicholas. "'What were you thinking about just now, Nicholas?' inquired Natasha. They were fond of asking one another that question. "'I?' said Nicholas, trying to remember. "'Well, you see, first I thought that Rouguet, the Red Hound, was like Uncle, and that if he were a man he would always keep Uncle near him, if not for his writing, then for his manner. What a good fellow Uncle is! Don't you think so?' "'Well, and you?' "'I?' Wait a bit, wait. Yes, first I thought that we are driving along and imagining that we are going home, but that heaven knows where we are really going in the darkness, and that we shall arrive and suddenly find that we are not in Otradno, but in fairyland. And then I thought, no, nothing else. I know, I expect you thought of him, said Nicholas, smiling as Natasha knew by the sound of his voice. No, said Natasha, though she had in reality been thinking about Prince Andrew at the same time as of the rest, and of how he would have liked uncle. And then I was saying to myself all the way, how well Anisia carried herself, how well! And Nicholas heard her spontaneous, happy, ringing laughter. And do you know, she suddenly said, I know that I shall never again be as happy and tranquil as I am now. "'Rubbish! Nonsense! Humbug!' exclaimed Nicholas, and he thought. "'How charming this Natasha of mine is! I have no other friend like her and never shall have. 
Why should she marry? We might always drive about together." "'What a darling this Nicholas of mine is!' thought Natasha. "'Ah, there are still lights on in the drawing-room,' she said, pointing to the windows of the house that gleamed invitingly in the moist, velvety darkness of the night. End of Book 7, Chapter 7《Book Seven, Chapter Eight, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Book Seven, Chapter Eight. • Count Ilya Rostov had resigned the position of Marshal of the Nobility because it involved him in too much expense, but still his affairs did not improve. Natasha and Nicholas often noticed their parents conferring together anxiously and privately, and heard suggestions of selling the fine ancestral Rostov house and estate near Moscow. It was not necessary to entertain so freely as when the Count had been marshal, and life at Otradno was quieter than in former years, but still the enormous house and its lodges were full of people, and more than twenty sat down to table every day. These were all their own people who had settled down in the house almost as members of the family, or persons who were, it seemed, obliged to live in the Count's house. Such were Dimmler, the musician, and his wife, Vogel, the dancing-master, and his family, Belova, an old maiden lady, an inmate of the house, and many others such as Petya's tutors, the girl's former governess, and other people who simply found it preferable and more advantageous to live in the Count's house than at home. They had not as many visitors as before, but the old habits of life without which the Count and Countess could not conceive of existence remained unchanged. There was still the hunting establishment which Nicholas had even enlarged, the same fifty horses and fifteen grooms in the stables, the same expensive presents and dinner-parties to the whole district on name-days. There were still the Count's games of whist and Boston, at which, spreading out his cards so that everybody could see them, he let himself be plundered of hundreds of roubles every day by his neighbors, who looked upon an opportunity to play a rubber with Count Rostov as a most profitable source of income. The Count moved in his affairs as in a huge net, trying not to believe that he was entangled, but becoming more and more so at every step, and feeling too feeble to break the meshes or to set to work carefully and patiently to disentangle them. The Countess, with her loving heart, felt that her children were being ruined, that it was not the Count's fault for he could not help being what he was, that, though he tried to hide it, he himself suffered from the consciousness of his own and his children's ruin, and she tried to find means of remedying the position. From her feminine point of view she could see only one solution, namely, for Nicholas to marry a rich heiress. She felt this to be their last hope and that if Nicholas refused the match she had found for him, she would have to abandon the hope of ever getting matters right. This match was with Julie Karagina, the daughter of excellent and virtuous parents, a girl the Rostovs had known from childhood, and who had now become a wealthy heiress through the death of the last of her brothers. The Countess had written direct to Julie's mother in Moscow, suggesting a marriage between their children, and had received a favorable answer from her. Karagina had replied that for her part she was agreeable, and everything depend on her daughter's inclination. She invited Nicholas to come to Moscow. Several times the Countess, with tears in her eyes, told her son that, now both her daughters were settled, her only wish was to see him married. She said she could lie down in her grave peacefully if that were accomplished. Then she told him that she knew of a splendid girl and tried to discover what he thought about marriage. At other times she praised Julie to him and advised him to go to Moscow during the holidays to amuse himself. Nicholas guessed what his mother's remarks were leading to, and during one of these conversations induced her to speak quite frankly. She told him that her only hope of getting their affairs disentangled now lay in his marrying Julie Karagina. But Mama. Suppose I loved a girl who has no fortune. Would you expect me to sacrifice my feelings and my honor for the sake of money?" he asked his mother, not realizing the cruelty of his question and only wishing to show his noble-mindedness. 
No, you have not understood me, said his mother, not knowing how to justify herself. You have not understood me, Nikolenka. It is your happiness I wish for, she added, feeling that she was telling an untruth and was becoming entangled. She began to cry. Mama, don't cry. Only tell me that you wish it, and you know I will give my life, anything to put you at ease," said Nicholas. I would sacrifice anything for you, even my feelings. But the Countess did not want the question put like that. She did not want a sacrifice from her son. She herself wished to make a sacrifice for him. No, you have not understood me. Don't let us talk about it she replied, wiping away her tears. "'Maybe I do love a poor girl,' said Nicholas to himself. "'Am I to sacrifice my feelings and my honor for money? I wonder how Mama could speak so to me. Because Sonia is poor, I must not love her,' he thought. "'Must not respond to her faithful, devoted love. Yet I should certainly be happier with her than with some doll like Julie. I can always sacrifice my feelings for my family's welfare," he said to himself, but I can't coerce my feelings. If I love Sonia, that feeling is for me stronger and higher than all else. Nicholas did not go to Moscow, and the Countess did not renew the conversation with him about marriage. She saw with sorrow and sometimes with exasperation symptoms of a growing attachment between her son and the portionless Sonia. Though she blamed herself for it, she could not refrain from grumbling at and worrying Sonia, often pulling her up without reason, addressing her stiffly as, my dear, and using the formal you instead of the intimate thou in speaking to her. The kind-hearted countess was the more vexed with Sonia, because that poor, dark-eyed niece of hers was so meek, so kind, so devotedly grateful to her benefactors and so faithfully, unchangingly, and unselfishly in love with Nicholas, that there were no grounds for finding fault with her. Nicholas was spending the last of his leave at home. A fourth letter had come from Prince Andrew, from Rome, in which he wrote that he would have been on his way back to Russia long ago, had not his wound unexpectedly reopened in the warm climate, which obliged him to defer his return till the beginning of the new year. Natasha was still as much in love with her betrothed, found the same comfort in that love, and was still as ready to throw herself into all the pleasures of life as before. But at the end of the fourth month of their separation she began to have fits of depression which she could not master. She felt sorry for herself, sorry that she was being wasted all this time and of no use to anyone, while she felt herself so capable of loving and being loved things were not cheerful in the Rostovs' home. End of Book 7, Chapter 8「Book 7, Chapter 9 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 7, Chapter 9 Christmas came, and except for the ceremonial mass, the solemn and wearisome Christmas congratulations from neighbors and servants, and the new dresses everyone put on, there were no special festivities, though the calm frost of twenty degrees Réaumur, the dazzling sunshine by day, and the starlight of the winter night seemed to call for some special celebration of the season. On the third day of Christmas week, after the midday dinner, all the inmates of the house dispersed to various rooms. It was the dullest time of the day. Nicholas, who had been visiting some neighbors that morning, was asleep on the sitting-room sofa. The old Count was resting in his study. Sonia sat in the drawing-room at the round table, copying a design for embroidery. The Countess was playing patience. Nastasya Ivanovna the buffoon sat with a sad face at the window with two old ladies. Natasha came into the room, went up to Sonia, glanced at what she was doing, and then went up to her mother and stood without speaking. "'Why are you wandering about like an outcast?' asked her mother. "'What do you want?' "'Him. I want him. Now, this minute. I want him,' said Natasha with glittering eyes and no sign of a smile. 
The Countess lifted her head and looked attentively at her daughter. "'Don't look at me, Mama. Don't look. I shall cry directly.' "'Sit down with me a little,' said the Countess. "'Mama, I want him.' "'Why should I be wasted like this, Mama?' Her voice broke, tears gushed from her eyes, and she turned quickly to hide them and left the room. She passed into the sitting-room, stood there thinking a while, and then went into the maid's room. There an old maid-servant was grumbling at a young girl who stood panting, having just run in through the cold from the serfs' quarters. "'Stop playing! There's a time for everything!' said the old woman. "'Let her alone, Kontratevna," said Natasha. "'Go, Mavrushka, go!' Having released Mavrushka, Natasha crossed the dancing-hall and went to the vestibule. There an old footman and two young ones were playing cards. They broke off and rose as she entered. "'What can I do with them?' thought Natasha. "'Oh, Nikita, please go. Where can I send him? Yes, go to the yard and fetch a fowl, please, a cock. And you, Misha, bring me some oats.' "'Just a few oats,' said Misha cheerfully and readily. "'Go, go quickly,' the old man urged him. "'And you, Theodore, get me a piece of chalk.' On her way past the butler's pantry she told them to set a samovar, though it was not at all the time for tea. Foka, the butler, was the most ill-tempered person in the house. Natasha liked to test her power over him. He distrusted the order and asked whether the samovar was really wanted. "'Oh, dear, what a young lady!' said Foka, pretending to frown at Natasha. No one in the house sent people about or gave them as much trouble as Natasha did. She could not see people unconcernedly, but had to send them on some errand. She seemed to be trying whether any of them would get angry or sulky with her. But the serfs fulfilled no one's orders so readily as they did hers. "'What can I do? Where can I go?' thought she as she went slowly along the passage. "'Nastasia Ivanovna!' "'What sort of children shall I have?' she asked the buffoon, who was coming toward her in a woman's jacket. "'Why, fleas, crickets, grasshoppers,' answered the buffoon. "'Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, it's always the same. Oh, where am I to go? What am I to do with myself?' And tapping with her heels, she ran quickly upstairs to see Vogel and his wife, who lived on the upper story. The two governesses were sitting with the Vogels at a table, on which were plates of raisins, walnuts, and almonds. The governesses were discussing whether it was cheaper to live in Moscow or Odessa. Natasha sat down, listened to their talk with a serious and thoughtful air, and then got up again. "'The island of Madagascar,' she said. "'Madagascar!' she repeated, articulating each syllable distinctly, and, not replying to Madame Chausse, who asked her what she was saying, she went out of the room. Her brother Petya was upstairs, too. With the man in attendance on him, he was preparing fireworks to let off that night. "'Petya! Petya!' she called to him. "'Carry me downstairs!' Petya ran up and offered her his back. She jumped on it, putting her arms round his neck, and he pranced along with her. "'No, don't. The island of Madagascar,' she said, and jumping off his back she went downstairs. Having, as it were, reviewed her kingdom, tested her power, and made sure that everyone was submissive, but that all the same it was dull, Natasha betook herself to the ballroom, picked up her guitar, sat down in a dark corner behind a bookcase, and began to run her fingers over the strings in the bass, picking out a passage she recalled from an opera she had heard in Petersburg with Prince Andrew. What she drew from the guitar would have no meaning for other listeners, but in her imagination a whole series of reminiscences arose from those sounds. She sat behind the bookcase with her eyes fixed on a streak of light escaping from the pantry door, and listened to herself and pondered. She was in a mood for brooding on the past. Sonia passed to the pantry with a glass in her hand. Natasha glanced at her and at the crack in the pantry door, and it seemed to her that she remembered the light falling through that crack once before, and Sonia passing with a glass in her hand. "'Yes, it was exactly the same,' thought Natasha. "'Sonia, what is this?' she cried, twanging a thick string. "'Oh, you are there,' said Sonia with a start, and came near and listened. 
I don't know, a storm? She ventured timidly, afraid of being wrong. There, that's just how she started and just how she came up smiling timidly when all this happened before, thought Natasha. And in just the same way, I thought there was something lacking in her. No, it's the chorus from the water carrier. Listen. And Natasha sang the air of the chorus so that Sonia could catch it. Where were you going? she asked. To change the water in this glass. I am just finishing the design. You always find something to do, but I can't, said Natasha. And where's Nicholas? Asleep, I think. Sonia, go and wake him, said Natasha. Tell him I want him to come and sing. She sat a while, wondering what the meaning of it all having happened before could be, and without solving this problem, or at all regretting not having done so, she again passed in fancy to the time when she was with him and he was looking at her with a lover's eyes. Oh, if he would only come quicker! I am so afraid it will never be! And worst of all, I am growing old! That's the thing! There won't then be in me what there is now! But perhaps he'll come today, will come immediately! Perhaps he has come and is sitting in the drawing-room! Perhaps he came yesterday, and I have forgotten it!" She rose, put down the guitar, and went to the drawing-room. All the domestic circle, tutors, governesses, and guests, were already at the tea-table. The servants stood round the table, but Prince Andrew was not there, and life was going on as before. "'Ah, here she is,' said the old Count, when he saw Natasha enter. "'Well, sit down by me.' But Natasha stayed by her mother and glanced round as if looking for something. Mama, she muttered, give him to me, give him, Mama, quickly, quickly. And she again had difficulty in repressing her sobs. She sat down at the table and listened to the conversation between the elders and Nicholas, who had also come to the table. My God, my God, the same faces, the same talk. Papa holding his cup and blowing in the same way," thought Natasha, feeling with horror a sense of repulsion rising up in her for the whole household, because they were always the same. After tea, Nicholas, Sonia, and Natasha went to the sitting-room, to their favorite corner where their most intimate talks always began. End of Book 7, Chapter 9《Book Seven, Chapter Ten, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Book Seven, Chapter Ten. — Does it ever happen to you? said Natasha to her brother when they settled down in the sitting-room. — Does it ever happen to you to feel as if there was nothing more to come? Nothing? that everything good is past, and to feel not exactly dull, but sad?" "'I should think so,' he replied. "'I have felt like that when everything was all right and everyone was cheerful. The thought has come into my mind that I was already tired of it all and that we must all die. Once in the regiment I had not gone to some merrymaking where there was music, and suddenly I felt so depressed. Oh, yes, I know, I know, I know, Natasha interrupted him. When I was quite little, that used to be so with me. Do you remember when I was punished once about some plums? You were all dancing, and I sat sobbing in the schoolroom. I shall never forget it. I felt sad and sorry for everyone, for myself and for everyone. And I was innocent. That was the chief thing, said Natasha. Do you remember? I remember," answered Nicholas. I remember that I came to you afterwards and wanted to comfort you, but, do you know, I felt ashamed to. We were terribly absurd. I had a funny doll then and wanted to give it to you. Do you remember?" And do you remember, Natasha asked with a pensive smile, how once, long, long ago, when we were quite little, Uncle called us into the study, that was in the old house, and it was dark. We went in, and suddenly there stood. 
A negro, chimed in Nicholas with a smile of delight. Of course I remember. Even now, I don't know whether there really was a negro, or if we only dreamed it or were told about him. He was gray, you remember, and had white teeth, and stood and looked at us. Sonia, do you remember? asked Nicholas. Yes, yes, I do remember something, too, Sonia answered timidly. You know, I have asked Papa and Mama about that negro, said Natasha, and they say there was no negro at all. But you see, you remember. Of course I do. I remember his teeth as if I had just seen them. How strange it is. It's as if it were a dream. I like that. And do you remember how we rolled hard-boiled eggs in the ballroom, and suddenly two old women began spinning round on the carpet? Was that real or not? Do you remember what fun it was? Yes. And you remember how Papa in his blue overcoat fired a gun in the porch? So they went through their memories, smiling with pleasure. Not the sad memories of old age, but poetic, youthful ones, those impressions of one's most distant past in which dreams and realities blend, and they laughed with quiet enjoyment. Sonia, as always, did not quite keep pace with them, though they shared the same reminiscences. Much that they remembered had slipped from her mind, and what she recalled did not arouse the same poetic feeling as they experienced. She simply enjoyed their pleasure and tried to fit in with it. She only really took part when they recalled Sonia's first arrival. She told them how afraid she had been of Nicholas because he had on a corded jacket, and her nurse had told her that she, too, would be sewn up with cords. "'And I remember their telling me that you had been born under a cabbage,' said Natasha. "'And I remember that I dared not disbelieve it then, but knew that it was not true, and I felt so uncomfortable.' While they were talking, a maid thrust her head in at the door of the sitting-room. "'They have brought the cock, miss,' she said in a whisper. "'It isn't wanted, Polya. Tell them to take it away,' replied Natasha. In the middle of the talk in the sitting-room, Dimmler came in and went up to the harp that stood there in a corner. He took off its cloth covering, and the harp gave out a jarring sound. "'Mr. Dimmler!' Please play my favorite nocturne by field, came the old countess' voice from the drawing room. Dimmler struck a chord, and turning to Natasha, Nicholas, and Sonia, remarked, How quiet you young people are! Yes, we're philosophizing, said Natasha, glancing around for a moment and then continuing the conversation. They were now discussing dreams. Dimmler began to play. Natasha went on tiptoe noiselessly to the table took up a candle, carried it out, and returned, seating herself quietly in her former place. It was dark in the room, especially where they were sitting on the sofa, but through the big windows the silvery light of the full moon fell on the floor. Dimmler had finished the piece but still sat softly running his fingers over the strings, evidently uncertain whether to stop or to play something else. "'Do you know?' said Natasha in a whisper, moving closer to Nicholas and Sonia, that when one goes on and on recalling memories, one at last begins to remember what happened before one was in the world. That is metempsychosis, said Sonia, who had always learned well and remembered everything. The Egyptians believe that our souls have lived in animals and will go back into animals again. No, I don't believe we ever were in animals said Natasha, still in a whisper, though the music had ceased. "'But I am certain that we were angels somewhere there, and have been here, and that is why we remember.' "'May I join you?' said Dimmler, who had come up quietly, and he sat down by them. "'If we have been angels, why have we fallen lower?' said Nicholas. "'No, that can't be.' "'Not lower. Who said we were lower?' How do I know what I was before? Natasha rejoined with conviction. The soul is immortal. Well, then, 
If I shall always live, I must have lived before, lived for a whole eternity." "'Yes, but it is hard for us to imagine eternity,' remarked Dimmler, who had joined the young folk with a mildly condescending smile, but now spoke as quietly and seriously as they. "'Why is it hard to imagine eternity?' said Natasha. "'It is now today, and it will be tomorrow and always. And there was yesterday and the day before.' "'Natasha, now it's your turn. Sing me something.' they heard the countess say. Why are you sitting there like conspirators? Mama, I don't at all want to, replied Natasha, but all the same she rose. None of them, not even the middle-aged Dimmler, wanted to break off their conversation and quit that corner in the sitting-room, but Natasha got up and Nicholas sat down at the clavichord. Standing as usual in the middle of the hall and choosing the place where the resonance was best, Natasha began to sing her mother's favorite song. She had said she did not want to sing, but it was long since she had sung, and long before she again sang, as she did that evening. The Count, from his study where he was talking to Mitenka, heard her, and like a schoolboy in a hurry to run out to play, blundered in his talk while giving orders to the steward, and at last stopped, while Mitenka stood in front of him, also listening and smiling. Nicholas did not take his eyes off his sister, and drew breath in time with her. Sonia, as she listened, thought of the immense difference there was between herself and her friend, and how impossible it was for her to be anything like as bewitching as her cousin. The old countess sat with a blissful yet sad smile, and with tears in her eyes occasionally shaking her head. She thought of Natasha, and of her own youth, and of how there was something unnatural and dreadful in this impending marriage of Natasha and Prince Andrew. Dimmler, who had seated himself beside the Countess, listened with closed eyes. "'Ah, Countess,' he said at last, "'that's a European talent. She has nothing to learn. What softness, tenderness, and strength!' "'Ah, how afraid I am for her! How afraid I am!' said the Countess, not realizing to whom she was speaking. Her maternal instinct told her that Natasha had too much of something, and that because of this she would not be happy. Before Natasha had finished singing, fourteen-year-old Petya rushed in delightedly to say that some mummers had arrived. Natasha stopped abruptly. "'Idiot!' she screamed at her brother, and running to a chair, threw herself on it, sobbing so violently that she could not stop for a long time. It's nothing, Mama. really, it's nothing. Only Petya startled me, she said, trying to smile, but her tears still flowed and sobs still choked her. The mummers, some of the house serfs, dressed up as bears, Turks, innkeepers and ladies, frightening and funny, bringing in with them the cold from outside and a feeling of gaiety, crowded, at first timidly into the anteroom, then, hiding behind one another, they pushed into the ballroom where, shyly at first, and then more and more merrily and heartily, they started singing, dancing, and playing Christmas games. The Countess, when she had identified them and laughed at their costumes, went into the drawing-room. The Count sat in the ballroom, smiling radiantly and applauding the players. The young people had disappeared. Half an hour later, there appeared among the other mummers in the ballroom an old lady in a hoop skirt. This was Nicholas. A Turkish girl was Petya, a clown was Dimmler, an hussar was Natasha, and a Circassian was Sonia with burnt cork moustache and eyebrows. After the condescending surprise, non-recognition, and praise from those who were not themselves dressed up, the young people decided that their costumes were so good that they ought to be shown elsewhere. Nicholas who, as the roads were in splendid condition, wanted to take them all for a drive in his troika, proposed to take with them about a dozen of the surf-mummers and drive to uncle's. "'No, why disturb the old fellow?' said the Countess. "'Besides, you wouldn't have room to turn round there. If you must go, go to the Melyukovs.' Melyukova was a widow, who, with her family and their tutors and governesses, lived three miles from the Rostovs. "'That's right, my dear,' 
chimed in the old Count, thoroughly aroused. I'll dress up at once and go with them. I'll make Pachette open her eyes." But the Countess would not agree to his going. He had had a bad leg all these last days. It was decided that the Count must not go, but that if Louisa Ivanovna, Madame Chausse, would go with them, the young ladies might go to the Melyukovs. Sonia, generally so timid and shy, more urgently than anyone begging Louisa Ivanova not to refuse. Sonia's costume was the best of all. Her mustache and eyebrows were extraordinarily becoming. Everyone told her she looked very handsome, and she was in a spirited and energetic mood unusual with her. Some inner voice told her that now or never her fate would be decided, and in her male attire she seemed quite a different person. Louisa Ivanovna consented to go, and in half an hour four troika sleighs with large and small bells, the runners squeaking and whistling over the frozen snow, drove up to the porch. Natasha was foremost in setting a merry holiday tone, which, passing from one to another, grew stronger and reached its climax when they all came out into the frost and got into the sleighs, talking, calling to one another, laughing and shouting. Two of the troikas were the usual household slaves. The third was the old Count's with a trotter from the Orlov's stud as shaft-horse. The fourth was Nicholas' own, with a short, shaggy, black shaft-horse. Nicholas, in his old lady's dress over which he had belted his hussar overcoat, stood in the middle of the sleigh, reins in hand. It was so light that he could see the moonlight reflected from the metal harness discs and from the eyes of the horses who looked round in alarm at the noisy party under the shadow of the porch-roof. Natasha, Sonia, Madame Chausse, and two maids got into Nicholas' sleigh, Dimmler, his wife and Petya into the old Count's, and the rest of the mummers seated themselves in the other two sleighs. "'You go ahead, Zakhar!' shouted Nicholas to his father's coachman, wishing for a chance to race past him. The old Count's troika, with Dimmler and his party, started forward, squeaking on its runners as though freezing to the snow, its deep-toned bell clanging. The side-horses, pressing against the shafts of the middle horse, sank in the snow, which was dry and glittered like sugar, and threw it up. Nicholas set off, following the first sleigh. Behind him the others moved noisily, their runners squeaking. At first, they drove at a steady trot along the narrow road. While they drove past the garden, the shadows of the bare trees often fell across the road and hid the brilliant moonlight. But as soon as they were past the fence, the snowy plain, bathed in moonlight and motionless, spread out before them, glittering like diamonds and dappled with bluish shadows. Bang! Bang! went the first sleigh over a cradle-hole in the snow of the road, and each of the other sleighs jolted in the same way and rudely breaking the frost-bound stillness the troikas began to speed along the road one after the other. "'A hare's track! A lot of tracks!' rang out Natasha's voice through the frost-bound air. "'How light it is, Nicholas!' came Sonia's voice. Nicholas glanced round at Sonia and bent down to see her face closer. Quite a new, sweet face with black eyebrows and mustaches peeped up at him from her sable furs so close and yet so distant in the moonlight. That used to be Sonia, thought he, and looked at her closer and smiled. What is it, Nicholas? Nothing, said he, and turned again to the horses. When they came out onto the beaten high road, polished by sleigh runners and cut up by rough shod hoofs, the marks of which were visible in the moonlight, the horses began to tug at the reins of their own accord and increased their pace. The near side horse, arching his head and breaking into a short canter, tugged at his traces. The shaft horse swayed from side to side, moving his ears as if asking, Isn't it time to begin now? In front, already far ahead, the deep bell of the sleigh ringing farther and farther off, the black horses driven by Zakhar could be clearly seen against the white snow. From that sleigh one could hear the shouts, laughter, and voices of the mummers. "'Gee up, my darlings!' shouted Nicholas, pulling the reins to one side and flourishing the whip. It was only by the keener wind that met them and the jerks given by the side-horses who pulled harder, 
ever increasing their gallop, that one noticed how fast the troika was flying. Nicholas looked back. With screams, squeals, and waving of whips that caused even the shaft horses to gallop, the other sleighs followed. The shaft horse swung steadily beneath the bow over its head, with no thought of slackening pace and ready to put on speed when required. Nicholas overtook the first sleigh. They were driving downhill and coming out upon a broad trodden track across a meadow near a river. Where are we? thought he. It's the Kosoi Meadow, I suppose. But no, this is something new I've never seen before. This isn't the Kosoi Meadow, nor the Demkin Hill, and heaven only knows what it is. It is something new and enchanted. Well, whatever it may be. And shouting to his horses, he began to pass the first sleigh. Zakar held back his horses and turned his face, which was already covered with hoarfrost to his eyebrows. Nicholas gave the horses the rein, and Zakar, stretching out his arms, clucked his tongue and let his horses go. "'Now look out, master!' he cried. Faster still the two troikas flew side by side, and faster moved the feet of the galloping side-horses. Nicholas began to draw ahead. Zakar, while still keeping his arms extended, raised one hand with the reins. "'No, you won't, master!' he shouted. Nicholas put all his horses to a gallop and passed Zakar. The horses showered the fine dry snow on the faces of those in the sleigh. Beside them sounded quick ringing bells and they caught confused glimpses of swiftly moving legs and the shadows of the troika they were passing. The whistling sound of the runners on the snow and the voices of girls shrieking were heard from different sides. Again checking his horses, Nicholas looked around him. They were still surrounded by the magic plain bathed in moonlight and spangled with stars. Zakar is shouting that I should turn to the left, but why to the left? thought Nicholas. Are we getting to the Melyukovs? Is this Melyukova? Heaven only knows where we are going, and heaven knows what is happening to us, but it is very strange and pleasant, whatever it is. And he looked round in the sleigh. Look! His mustache and eyelashes are all white," said one of the strange, pretty, unfamiliar people, the one with fine eyebrows and mustache. I think this used to be Natasha, thought Nicholas, and that was Madame Schoss, but perhaps it's not, and the Circassian with the mustache, I don't know, but I love her. Aren't you cold? he asked. They did not answer, but began to laugh. Dimmler from the sleigh behind shouted something, probably something funny, but they could not make out what he said. "'Yes, yes!' some voices answered, laughing. But here was a fairy forest, with black moving shadows, and a glitter of diamonds, and a flight of marble steps, and the silver roofs of fairy buildings, and the shrill yells of some animals. And if this is really Melyukovka, it is still stranger that we drove heaven knows where and have come to Melyukovka," thought Nicholas. It really was Melyukovka, and maids and footmen with merry faces came running out to the porch carrying candles. "'Who is it?' asked someone in the porch. "'The mummers from the Counts. I know by the horses,' replied some voices. End of Book 7 Chapter 10《Book Seven, Chapter Eleven, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Book Seven, Chapter Eleven. • Pelageya Danilovna Melyukova, a broadly built, energetic woman wearing spectacles, sat in the drawing room in a loose dress, surrounded by her daughters, whom she was trying to keep from feeling dull. They were quietly dropping melted wax into snow and looking at the shadows the wax figures would throw on the wall, when they heard the steps and voices of new arrivals in the vestibule. Hussars, ladies, witches, clowns, and bears, after clearing their throats and wiping the hoarfrost from their faces in the vestibule, came into the ballroom where candles were hurriedly lighted. The clown, Dimmler, and the lady, Nicholas, started a dance. 
surrounded by the screaming children, the mummers, covering their faces and disguising their voices, bowed to their hostess and arranged themselves about the room. "'Dear me! There's no recognizing them! And Natasha! See whom she looks like! She really reminds me of somebody! But Herr Dimmler, isn't he good! I didn't know him! And how he dances! Dear me! There's a Circassian! Really, how becoming it is to dear Sonia! And who is that? Well, you have cheered us up! Nikita and Vanya, clear away the tables! And we were sitting so quietly! Ha, ha, ha! The hussar, the hussar! Just like a boy! And the legs! I can't look at him! Different voices were saying. Natasha, the young Melyakov's favorite, disappeared with them into the back rooms, where a cork and various dressing-gowns and male garments were called for and received from the footman by bare girlish arms from behind the door. Ten minutes later all the young Melyakovs joined the mummers. Pelageya Danilovna, having given orders to clear the rooms for the visitors and arranged about refreshments for the gentry and the serfs, went about among the mummers without removing her spectacles, peering into their faces with a suppressed smile and failing to recognize any of them. It was not merely Dimmler and the Rostovs she failed to recognize, she did not even recognize her own daughters, or her late husband's dressing-gowns and uniforms which they had put on. "'And who is this?' she asked her governess, peering into the face of her own daughter dressed up as a Kazan Tartar. "'I suppose it is one of the Rostovs. Well, Mr. Hussar, and what regiment do you serve in?' she asked Natasha. "'Here, hand some fruit jelly to the Turk.' she ordered the butler who was handing things round. That's not forbidden by his law. Sometimes, as she looked at the strange but amusing capers cut by the dancers, who, having decided once for all that being disguised, no one would recognize them, were not at all shy, Pelageya Danilovna hid her face in her handkerchief, and her whole stout body shook with irrepressible, kindly, elderly laughter. "'My little Sasha! Look at Sasha!' she said. After Russian country dances and chorus dances, Pelageya Danilovna made the serfs and gentry join in one large circle. A ring, a string, and a silver rouble were fetched, and they all played games together. In an hour all the costumes were crumpled and disordered. The corked eyebrows and mustaches were smeared over the perspiring, flushed, and merry faces. Pelageya Danilovna began to recognize the mummers admired their cleverly contrived costumes, and particularly how they suited the young ladies, and she thanked them all for having entertained her so well. The visitors were invited to supper in the drawing-room, and the serfs had something served to them in the ballroom. "'Now, to tell one's fortune in the empty bathhouse is frightening,' said an old maid who lived with the Melyukovs during supper. "'Why?' said the eldest Melyukov girl. "'You wouldn't go. It takes courage.' I'll go," said Sonia. "'Tell what happens to the young lady,' said the second Melyukov girl. "'Well,' began the old maid, "'a young lady once went out, took a cock, laid the table for two, all properly, and sat down. After sitting a while she suddenly hears someone coming. A slave drives up with harness bells. She hears him coming. He comes in, just in the shape of a man, like an officer comes in and sits down to table with her. "'Ah! ah!' screamed Natasha, rolling her eyes with horror. "'Yes, and how did he speak?' "'Yes, like a man. Everything quite all right, and he began persuading her, and she should have kept him talking till cockcrow, but she got frightened, just got frightened, and hid her face in her hands. Then he caught her up. It was lucky the maids ran in just then.' Now why frighten them?" said Pelageya Danilovna. "'Mama, you used to try your fate yourself,' said her daughter. "'And how does one do it in a barn?' inquired Sonia. "'Well, say you went to the barn now and listened. It depends on what you hear. Hammering and knocking, that's bad. But a sound of shifting grain is good, and one sometimes hears that too. "'Mama, tell us what happened to you in the barn.' Pelageya Danilovna smiled. "'Oh, I've forgotten,' she replied. "'But none of you would go?' 
"'Yes, I will. Pelagea Danilovna, let me. I'll go,' said Sonia. "'Well, why not, if you're not afraid?' "'Luisa Ivanovna, may I?' asked Sonia. Whether they were playing the ring-and-string game or the rouble game or talking as now, Nicholas did not leave Sonia's side, and gazed at her with quite new eyes. It seemed to him that it was only today, thanks to that burnt cork moustache, that he had fully learned to know her. And really, that evening, Sonia was brighter, more animated, and prettier than Nicholas had ever seen her before. "'So that's what she is like. What a fool I have been!' he thought, gazing at her sparkling eyes, and under the moustache a happy, rapturous smile dimpled her cheeks, a smile he had never seen before. "'I am not afraid of anything,' said Sonia. "'May I go at once?' She got up. They told her where the barn was and how she should stand and listen, and they handed her a fur cloak. She threw this over her head and shoulders and glanced at Nicholas. "'What a darling that girl is,' thought he and what have I been thinking of till now?" Sonia went out into the passage to go to the barn. Nicholas went hastily to the front porch, saying he felt too hot. The crowd of people really had made the house stuffy. Outside there was the same cold stillness and the same moon, but even brighter than before. The light was so strong, and the snow sparkled with so many stars, that one did not wish to look up at the sky, and the real stars were unnoticed. The sky was black and dreary, while the earth was gay. "'I am a fool, a fool! What have I been waiting for?' thought Nicholas, and running out from the porch he went round the corner of the house and along the path that led to the back porch. He knew Sonia would pass that way. Halfway lay some snow-covered piles of firewood, and across and along them a network of shadows from the bare old lime-trees fell on the snow and on the path. This path led to the barn. The log walls of the barn and its snow-covered roof, that looked as if hewn out of some precious stone, sparkled in the moonlight. A tree in the garden snapped with the frost, and then all was again perfectly silent. His bosom seemed to inhale not air but the strength of eternal youth and gladness. From the back porch came the sound of feet descending the steps. The bottom step, upon which snow had fallen, gave a ringing creak, and he heard the voice of an old maidservant saying, "'Straight, straight along the path, miss. Only don't look back.' "'I am not afraid,' answered Sonia's voice and along the path toward Nicholas came the crunching, whistling sound of Sonia's feet in her thin shoes. Sonia came along, wrapped in her cloak. She was only a couple of paces away when she saw him, and to her, too, he was not the Nicholas she had known and always slightly feared. He was in a woman's dress, with tousled hair and a happy smile new to Sonia. She ran rapidly toward him. "'Quite different, and yet the same,' thought Nicholas looking at her face, all lit up by the moonlight. He slipped his arms under the cloak that covered her head, embraced her, pressed her to him, and kissed her on the lips that wore a moustache and had a smell of burnt cork. Sonia kissed him full on the lips, and disengaging her little hands, pressed them to his cheeks. Sonia, Nicholas, was all they said. They ran to the barn and then back again, re-entering, he by the front, and she by the back porch. End of Book Seven, Chapter Eleven. Book Seven, Chapter Twelve of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Chapter Twelve. When they all drove back from Pelagea Danilovna's, Natasha, who always saw and noticed everything, arranged that she and Madame Schoss should go back in the sleigh with Dimmler, and Sonia with Nicholas and the maids. On the way back, Nicholas drove at a steady pace instead of racing, and kept peering by that fantastic, all-transforming light into Sonia's face, and searching beneath the eyebrows and moustache for his former and his present Sonia, from whom he had resolved never to be parted again. He looked, 
and recognizing in her both the old and the new Sonia, and being reminded by the smell of burnt cork of the sensation of her kiss, inhaled the frosty air with a full breast, and looking at the ground flying beneath him and at the sparkling sky, felt himself again in fairyland. "'Sonia, is it well with thee?' he asked from time to time. "'Yes,' she replied, "'and with thee?' When halfway home, Nicholas handed the reins to the coachman and ran for a moment to Natasha's sleigh and stood on its wing. "'Natasha,' he whispered in French, "'do you know I have made up my mind about Sonia?' "'Have you told her?' asked Natasha, suddenly beaming all over with joy. "'Oh, how strange you are with that moustache and those eyebrows! Natasha, are you glad?' "'I am so glad, so glad! I was beginning to be vexed with you. I did not tell you, but you have been treating her badly. What a heart she has, Nicholas! I am horrid sometimes, but I was ashamed to be happy while Sonia was not,' continued Natasha. "'Now I am so glad. Well, run back to her.' "'No, wait a bit. Oh, how funny you look!' cried Nicholas, peering into her face and finding in his sister, too, something new, unusual, and bewitchingly tender, that he had not seen in her before. "'Natasha, it's magical, isn't it?' "'Yes,' she replied. "'You have done splendidly.' "'Had I seen her before as she is now,' thought Nicholas, "'I should long ago have asked her what to do, and have done whatever she told me, and all would have been well.' So. You are glad, and I have done right? Oh, quite right. I had a quarrel with Mama some time ago about it. Mama said she was angling for you. How could she say such a thing? I nearly stormed at Mama. I will never let anyone say anything bad of Sonia, for there is nothing but good in her. Then it's all right, said Nicholas, again scrutinizing the expression of his sister's face to see if she was in earnest. Then he jumped down, and his boots crunching the snow ran back to his sleigh. The same happy, smiling Circassian, with mustache and beaming eyes looking up from under a sable hood, was still sitting there, and that Circassian was Sonia, and that Sonia was certainly his future happy and loving wife. When they reached home and had told their mother how they had spent the evening at the Melyukovs, the girls went to their bedroom. When they had undressed, but without washing off the cork mustaches, they sat a long time talking of their happiness. They talked of how they would live when they were married, how their husbands would be friends, and how happy they would be. On Natasha's table stood two looking-glasses which Dunyasha had prepared beforehand. "'Only when will it all be? I'm afraid never. It would be too good,' said Natasha, rising and going to the looking-glasses. "'Sit down, Natasha. Perhaps you'll see him,' said Sonia. Natasha lit the candles, one on each side of one of the looking-glasses, and sat down. "'I see someone with a mustache," said Natasha, seeing her own face. "'You mustn't laugh, miss,' said Dunyasha. With Sonia's help and the maid's, Natasha got the glass she held into the right position opposite the other. Her face assumed a serious expression, and she sat silent. She sat a long time looking at the receding line of candles reflected in the glasses, and expecting, from the tale she had heard, to see a coffin, or him, Prince Andrew, in that last dim, indistinctly outlined square. But ready as she was to take the smallest speck for the image of a man or of a coffin, she saw nothing. She began blinking rapidly and moved away from the looking-glasses. "'Why is it others see things and I don't?' she said. You sit down now, Sonia. You absolutely must tonight. Do it for me. Today I feel so frightened. Sonia sat down before the glasses, got the right position, and began looking. Now, Miss Sonia is sure to see something, whispered Dunyasha. Well, you do nothing but laugh. Sonia heard this, and Natasha's whisper, I know she will. She saw something last year. For about three minutes all were silent. "'Of course she will,' whispered Natasha, but did not finish. Suddenly Sonia pushed away the glass she was holding and covered her eyes with her hand. "'Oh, Natasha!' she cried. "'Did you see? Did you? What was it?' 
exclaimed Natasha, holding up the looking-glass. Sonia had not seen anything. She was just wanting to blink and to get up when she heard Natasha say, Of course she will. She did not wish to disappoint either Dunyasha or Natasha, but it was hard to sit still. She did not herself know how or why the exclamation escaped her when she covered her eyes. "'You saw him?' urged Natasha, seizing her hand. "'Yes. Wait a bit. I... saw him,' Sonia could not help saying, not yet knowing whom Natasha meant by him, Nicholas or Prince Andrew. "'But why shouldn't I say I saw something? Others do see. Besides, who can tell whether I saw anything or not?' flashed through Sonia's mind. "'Yes, I saw him,' she said. "'How? Standing or lying?' "'No, I saw. At first there was nothing. Then I saw him lying down.' "'Andrew's lying? Is he ill?' asked Natasha, her frightened eyes fixed on her friend. "'No, on the contrary, on the contrary. His face was cheerful, and he turned to me.' And when saying this, she herself fancied she had really seen what she described. "'Well, and then, Sonia?' After that I could not make out what there was, something blue and red. "'Sonia, when will he come back? When shall I see him? Oh, God, how afraid I am for him and for myself and about everything!' Natasha began, and without replying to Sonia's words of comfort she got into bed, and long after her candle was out lay open-eyed and motionless, gazing at the moonlight through the frosty window-panes. End of Book 7, Chapter 12《Book 7, Chapter 13 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 7, Chapter 13 Soon after the Christmas holidays, Nicholas told his mother of his love for Sonia and of his firm resolve to marry her. The Countess, who had long noticed what was going on between them and was expecting this declaration, listened to him in silence and then told her son that he might marry whom he pleased, but that neither she nor his father would give their blessing to such a marriage. Nicholas, for the first time, felt that his mother was displeased with him, and that despite her love for him she would not give way. Coldly, without looking at her son, she sent for her husband, and when he came, tried briefly and coldly to inform him of the facts in her son's presence, but unable to restrain herself she burst into tears of vexation and left the room. The old Count began irresolutely to admonish Nicholas and beg him to abandon his purpose. Nicholas replied that he could not go back on his word, and his father, sighing and evidently disconcerted, very soon became silent and went in to the Countess. In all his encounters with his son, the Count was always conscious of his own guilt toward him for having wasted the family fortune, and so he could not be angry with him for refusing to marry an heiress and choosing the dowerless Sonia. On this occasion he was only more vividly conscious of the fact that, if his affairs had not been in disorder, no better wife for Nicholas than Sonia could have been wished for and that no one but himself, with his Matenka and his uncomfortable habits, was to blame for the condition of the family finances. The father and mother did not speak of the matter to their son again, but a few days later the Countess sent for Sonia, and, with a cruelty neither of them expected, reproached her niece for trying to catch Nicholas and for ingratitude. Sonia listened silently with downcast eyes to the Countess' cruel words, without understanding what was required of her. She was ready to sacrifice everything for her benefactors. Self-sacrifice was her most cherished idea, but in this case she could not see what she ought to sacrifice or for whom. She could not help loving the Countess and the whole Rostov family, but neither could she help loving Nicholas and knowing that his happiness depended on that love. She was silent and sad and did not reply. Nicholas felt the situation to be intolerable and went to have an explanation with his mother. He first implored her to forgive him and Sonia and consent to their marriage, 
Then he threatened that if she molested Sonia, he would at once marry her secretly. The Countess, with a coldness her son had never seen in her before, replied that he was of age, that Prince Andrew was marrying without his father's consent, and he could do the same, but that she would never receive that intriguer as her daughter. Exploding at the word intriguer, Nicholas, raising his voice, told his mother he had never expected her to try to force him to sell his feelings, but if that were so, he would say for the last time. But he had no time to utter the decisive word which the expression of his face caused his mother to await with terror, and which would perhaps have forever remained a cruel memory to them both. He had not time to say it, for Natasha, with a pale and set face, entered the room from the door at which she had been listening. "'Nicholas, you are talking nonsense! Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, I tell you!' she almost screamed so as to drown his voice. "'Mama, darling, it's not at all so. My poor, sweet darling,' she said to her mother, who, conscious that they had been on the brink of a rupture, gazed at her son with terror, but in the obstinacy and excitement of the conflict could not and would not give way. "'Nicholas, I'll explain to you. Go away.' "'Listen, Mama, darling,' said Natasha. Her words were incoherent, but they attained the purpose at which she was aiming. The Countess, sobbing heavily, hid her face on her daughter's breast, while Nicholas rose, clutching his head, and left the room. Natasha set to work to effect a reconciliation, and so far succeeded that Nicholas received a promise from his mother that Sonia should not be troubled, while he on his side promised not to undertake anything without his parents' knowledge. Firmly resolved, after putting his affairs in order in the regiment, to retire from the army and return and marry Sonia, Nicholas, serious, sorrowful, and at variance with his parents, but, as it seemed to him, passionately in love, left at the beginning of January to rejoin his regiment. After Nicholas had gone, things in the Rostov household were more depressing than ever, and the Countess fell ill from mental agitation. Sonia was unhappy at the separation from Nicholas, and still more so on account of the hostile tone the Countess could not help adopting toward her. The Count was more perturbed than ever by the condition of his affairs, which called for some decisive action. Their townhouse and estate near Moscow had inevitably to be sold, and for this they had to go to Moscow. But the Countess' health obliged them to delay their departure from day to day. Natasha, who had borne the first period of separation from her betrothed lightly and even cheerfully, now grew more agitated and impatient every day. The thought that her best days, which she would have employed in loving him, were being vainly wasted, with no advantage to anyone, tormented her incessantly. His letters for the most part irritated her. It hurt her to think that, while she lived only in the thought of him, he was living a real life, seeing new places and new people that interested him. The more interesting his letters were, the more vexed she felt. Her letters to him, far from giving her any comfort, seemed to her a wearisome and artificial obligation. She could not write, because she could not conceive the possibility of expressing sincerely in a letter even a thousandth part of what she expressed by voice, smile, and glance. She wrote to him formal, monotonous, and dry letters, to which she attached no importance herself and in the rough copies of which the Countess corrected her mistakes in spelling. There was still no improvement in the Countess' health, but it was impossible to defer the journey to Moscow any longer. Natasha's trousseau had to be ordered and the house sold. Moreover, Prince Andrew was expected in Moscow, where old Prince Bolkonsky was spending the winter, and Natasha felt sure he had already arrived. So the Countess remained in the country, and the Count, taking Sonia and Natasha with him, went to Moscow at the end of January. End of Book 7, Chapter 13。Book 8, Chapter 1 of War and Peace, Volume 2 by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, eighteen eleven to eighteen twelve. Chapter One. 
After Prince Andrew's engagement to Natasha, Pierre, without any apparent cause, suddenly felt it impossible to go on living as before. Firmly convinced as he was of the truths revealed to him by his benefactor, and happy as he had been in perfecting his inner man, to which he had devoted himself with such ardor, all the zest of such a life vanished after the engagement of Andrew and Natasha and the death of Joseph Alexeyevich, the news of which reached him almost at the same time. Only the skeleton of life remained. His house, a brilliant wife, who now enjoyed the favors of a very important personage, acquaintance with all Petersburg, and his court service with its dull formalities. And this life suddenly seemed to Pierre unexpectedly loathsome. He ceased keeping a diary, avoided the company of the brothers, began going to the club again, drank a great deal, and came once more in touch with the bachelor sets, leading such a life that the Countess Elaine thought it necessary to speak severely to him about it. Pierre felt that she was right, and to avoid compromising her, went away to Moscow. In Moscow, as soon as he entered his huge house in which the faded and fading princesses still lived with its enormous retinue, as soon as driving through the town he saw the Iberian shrine, with innumerable tapers burning before the golden covers of the icons, the Kremlin Square, with its snow undisturbed by vehicles, the sleigh-drivers and hovels of the Siftsev Vrajak, those old Muscovites who desired nothing, hurried nowhere, and were ending their days leisurely. When he saw those old Moscow ladies, the Moscow balls and the English club, he felt himself at home in a quiet haven. In Moscow he felt at peace, at home, warm and dirty as in an old dressing-gown. Moscow society, from the old women down to the children, received Pierre like a long-expected guest whose place was always ready waiting for him. For Moscow society Pierre was the nicest, kindest, most intellectual, merriest and most magnanimous of cranks, a heedless genial nobleman of the old Russian type. His purse was always empty because it was open to everyone. Benefit performances, poor pictures, statues, benevolent societies, gypsy choirs, schools, subscription dinners, sprees, Freemasons, churches and books, no one and nothing met with a refusal from him, and had it not been for two friends who had borrowed large sums from him and taken him under their protection, he would have given everything away. There was never a dinner or soiree at the club without him. As soon as he sank into his place on the sofa, after two bottles of Margot, he was surrounded, and talking, disputing, and joking began. When there were quarrels, his kindly smile and well-timed jest reconciled the antagonists. The Masonic dinners were dull and dreary when he was not there. When, after a bachelor supper, he rose with his amiable and kindly smile, yielding to the entreaties of the festive company to drive off somewhere with them, shouts of delight and triumph arose among the young men. At balls he danced if a partner was needed. Young ladies, married and unmarried, liked him, because without making love to any of them he was equally amiable to all, especially after supper. Il est charmant. Il n'a pas de sexe. He is charming, he has no sex, they said of him. Pierre was one of those retired gentlemen-in-waiting of whom there were hundreds good-humouredly ending their days in Moscow. How horrified he would have been seven years before when he first arrived from abroad, had he been told that there was no need for him to seek or plan anything, that his rut had long been shaped, eternally predetermined, and that, wriggle as he might, he would be what all in his position were. He could not have believed it. Had he not at one time longed with all his heart to establish a republic in Russia, then himself to be a Napoleon, then to be a philosopher, and then a strategist and the conqueror of Napoleon? Had he not seen the possibility of, and passionately desired, the regeneration of the sinful human race, and his own progress to the highest degree of perfection? Had he not established schools and hospitals and liberated his serfs? But instead of all that, here he was, the wealthy husband of an unfaithful wife, a retired gentleman-in-waiting, fond of eating and drinking, and, as he unbuttoned his waistcoat, of abusing the government a bit, a member of the Moscow English Club, and a universal favorite in Moscow society. For a long time he could not reconcile himself to the idea 
that he was one of those same retired Moscow gentlemen-in-waiting he had so despised seven years before. Sometimes he consoled himself with the thought that he was only living this life temporarily, but then he was shocked by the thought of how many, like himself, had entered that life and that club temporarily, with all their teeth and hair, and had only left it when not a single tooth or hair remained. In moments of pride, when he thought of his position, it seemed to him that he was quite different and distinct from those other retired gentlemen-in-waiting he had formerly despised. They were empty, stupid, contented fellows, satisfied with their positions. While I am still discontented and want to do something for mankind. But perhaps all these comrades of mine struggled just like me and sought something new, a path in life of their own, and like me were brought by force of circumstances, society, and race, by that elemental force against which man is powerless, to the condition I am in said he to himself in moments of humility. And after living some time in Moscow, he no longer despised, but began to grow fond of, to respect, and to pity his comrades in destiny, as he pitied himself. Pierre no longer suffered moments of despair, hypochondria, and disgust with life, but the malady that had formerly found expression in such acute attacks was driven inwards and never left him for a moment. What for? Why? What is going on in the world?" he would ask himself in perplexity several times a day, involuntarily beginning to reflect anew on the meaning of the phenomena of life. But knowing by experience that there were no answers to these questions, he made haste to turn away from them, and took up a book, or hurried off to the club, or to Apollon Nikolaevich's to exchange the gossip of the town. Elaine, who has never cared for anything but her own body, and is one of the stupidest women in the world," thought Pierre, is regarded by people as the acme of intelligence and refinement, and they pay homage to her. Napoleon Bonaparte was despised by all as long as he was great, but now that he has become a wretched comedian, the Emperor Francis wants to offer him his daughter in an illegal marriage. The Spaniards, through the Catholic clergy, offer praise to God for their victory over the French on the 14th of June and the French, who also through the Catholic clergy, offer praise because on that same 14th of June they defeated the Spaniards. My brother Masons swear by the blood that they are ready to sacrifice everything for their neighbor, but they do not give a rouble each to the collections for the poor, and they intrigue, they astray a lodge against the manna-seekers, and fuss about an authentic Scotch carpet and a charter that nobody needs and the meaning of which the very man who wrote it does not understand. We all profess the Christian law of forgiveness of injuries and love of our neighbors, the law in honor of which we have built in Moscow forty times forty churches, but yesterday a deserter was knouted to death and a minister of that same law of love and forgiveness, a priest, gave the soldier a cross to kiss before his execution." So thought Pierre and the whole of this general deception which every one accepts, accustomed as he was to it, astonished him each time as if it were something new. "'I understand the deception and confusion,' he thought, "'but how am I to tell them all that I see? I have tried, and have always found that they too in the depths of their souls understand it as I do, and only try not to see it. So it appears that it must be so. But I—' What is to become of me?" thought he. He had the unfortunate capacity many men, especially Russians, have, of seeing and believing in the possibility of goodness and truth, but of seeing the evil and falsehood of life too clearly to be able to take a serious part in it. Every sphere of work was connected, in his eyes, with evil and deception. Whatever he tried to be, whatever he engaged in, the evil and falsehood of it repulsed him and blocked every path of activity. Yet he had to live and to find occupation. It was too dreadful to be under the burden of these insoluble problems, so he abandoned himself to any distraction in order to forget them. He frequented every kind of society, drank much, bought pictures, engaged in building, and above all, read. He read, and read everything that came to hand. On coming home, while his valets were still taking off his things, he picked up a book and began to read. 
From reading he passed to sleeping, from sleeping to gossip in drawing-rooms of the club, from gossip to carousals and women, from carousals back to gossip, reading, and wine. Drinking became more and more a physical and also a moral necessity. Though the doctors warned him that with his corpulence wine was dangerous for him, he drank a great deal. He was only quite at ease when, having poured several glasses of wine mechanically into his large mouth, he felt a pleasant warmth in his body, an amiability toward all his fellows, and a readiness to respond superficially to every idea without probing it deeply. Only after emptying a bottle or two did he feel dimly that the terribly tangled skein of life which previously had terrified him was not as dreadful as he had thought. He was always conscious of some aspect of that skein, as with a buzzing in his head after dinner or supper he chatted or listened to conversation or read. But under the influence of wine he said to himself, "'It doesn't matter. I'll get it unraveled. I have a solution ready, but have no time now. I'll think it all out later on." But the later on never came. In the morning, on an empty stomach, all the old questions appeared as insoluble and terrible as ever, and Pierre hastily picked up a book, and if anyone came to see him he was glad. Sometimes he remembered how he had heard that soldiers in war, when entrenched under the enemy's fire, if they have nothing to do, try hard to find some occupation the more easily to bear the danger. To Pierre all men seemed like those soldiers seeking refuge from life, some in ambition, some in cards, some in framing laws, some in women, some in toys, some in horses, some in politics, some in sport, some in wine, and some in governmental affairs. Nothing is trivial, and nothing is important. It's all the same. Only to save oneself from it as best one can," thought Pierre. Only not to see it, that dreadful it. End of Book Eight, Chapter One Book Eight, Chapter Two of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Two At the beginning of winter, Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky and his daughter moved to Moscow. At that time enthusiasm for the Emperor Alexander's regime had weakened, and a patriotic and anti-French tendency prevailed there, and this, together with his past and his intellect and his originality, at once made Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky an object of particular respect to the Moscovites and the center of the Moscow opposition to the government. The prince had aged very much that year. He showed marked signs of senility by a tendency to fall asleep, forgetfulness of quite recent events, remembrance of remote ones, and the childish vanity with which he accepted the role of head of the Moscow opposition. In spite of this, the old man inspired in all his visitors alike a feeling of respectful veneration, especially of an evening when he came into tea in his old-fashioned coat and powdered wig, and, aroused by anyone, told his abrupt stories of the past, or uttered yet more abrupt and scathing criticisms of the present. For them all, that old-fashioned house with its gigantic mirrors, pre-revolution furniture, powdered footmen, and the stern shrewd old man, himself a relic of the past century, with his gentle daughter and the pretty French woman who were reverently devoted to him, presented a majestic and agreeable spectacle. But the visitors did not reflect that, besides the couple of hours during which they saw their host, there were also twenty-two hours in the day during which the private and intimate life of the house continued. Latterly that private life had become very trying for Princess Mary. There in Moscow she was deprived of her greatest pleasures, talks with the pilgrims and the solitude which refreshed her at Bald Hills, and she had none of the advantages and pleasures of city life. She did not go out into society. Everyone knew that her father would not let her go anywhere without him, and his failing health prevented his going out himself, so that she was not invited to dinners and evening parties. She had quite abandoned the hope of getting married. She saw the coldness and malevolence with which the old prince received and dismissed the young men, possibly suitors who sometimes appeared at their house. 
she had no friends. During this visit to Moscow she had been disappointed in the two who had been nearest to her. Mademoiselle Bourienne, with whom she had never been able to be quite frank, had now become unpleasant to her, and for various reasons Princess Mary avoided her. Julie, with whom she had corresponded for the last five years, was in Moscow, but proved to be quite alien to her when they met. Just then Julie, who by the death of her brothers had become one of the richest heiresses in Moscow, was in the full world of society pleasures. She was surrounded by young men who, she fancied, had suddenly learned to appreciate her worth. Julie was at that stage in the life of a society woman when she feels that her last chance of marrying has come, and that her fate must be decided now or never. On Thursdays Princess Mary remembered with a mournful smile that she now had no one to write to, since Julie, whose presence gave her no pleasure, was here, and they met every week. Like the old émigré who declined to marry the lady with whom he had spent his evenings for years, she regretted Julie's presence, and having no one to write to. In Moscow Princess Mary had no one to talk to, no one to whom to confide her sorrow, and much sorrow fell to her lot just then. The time for Prince Andrew's return in marriage was approaching, but his request to her to prepare his father for it had not been carried out. In fact, it seemed as if matters were quite hopeless, for at every mention of the young Countess Rostova, the old prince, who apart from that was usually in a bad temper, lost control of himself. Another lately added sorrow arose from the lessons she gave her six-year-old nephew. To her consternation she detected in herself in relation to little Nicholas some symptoms of her father's irritability. However often she told herself that she must not get irritable when teaching her nephew, almost every time that, pointer in hand, she sat down to show him the French alphabet, she so longed to pour her own knowledge quickly and easily into the child, who was already afraid that Auntie might at any moment get angry, that at his slightest inattention she trembled, became flustered and heated, raised her voice, and sometimes pulled him by the arm and put him in the corner. Having put him in the corner she would herself begin to cry over her cruel, evil nature, and little Nicholas, following her example, would sob, and without permission would leave his corner, come to her, pull her wet hands from her face, and comfort her. But what distressed the princess most of all was her father's irritability, which was always directed against her, and had of late amounted to cruelty. Had he forced her to prostrate herself to the ground all night, had he beaten her or made her fetch wood or water, it would never have entered her mind to think her position hard. But this loving despot, the more cruel because he loved her and for that reason tormented himself and her, knew how not merely to hurt and humiliate her deliberately, but to show her that she was always to blame for everything. Of late he had exhibited a new trait that tormented Princess Mary more than anything else. This was his ever-increasing intimacy with Mademoiselle Bourienne. The idea that at the first moment of receiving the news of his son's intentions had occurred to him in jest, that if Andrew got married he himself would marry Bourienne, had evidently pleased him and latterly he had persistently, and as it seemed to Princess Mary merely to offend her, shown special endearments to the companion, and expressed his dissatisfaction with his daughter by demonstrations of love of Bourienne. One day in Moscow, in Princess Mary's presence, she thought her father did it purposely when she was there, the old prince kissed Mademoiselle Bourienne's hand, and drawing her to him, embraced her affectionately. Princess Mary flushed and ran out of the room. A few minutes later Mademoiselle Bourienne came into Princess Mary's room, smiling and making cheerful remarks in her agreeable voice. Princess Mary hastily wiped away her tears, went resolutely up to Mademoiselle Bourienne, and, evidently unconscious of what she was doing, began shouting in angry haste at the Frenchwoman, her voice breaking, "'It's horrible, vile, inhuman to take advantage of the weakness!' She did not finish. "'Leave my room!' she exclaimed and burst into sobs. Next day the prince did not say a word to his daughter, but she noticed that at dinner he gave orders that Mademoiselle Bourienne should be served first. After dinner, when the footman handed coffee and from habit began with the princess, the prince suddenly grew furious, 
threw his stick at Philip, and instantly gave instructions to have him conscripted for the army. "'He doesn't obey! I said it twice! And he doesn't obey! She is the first person in this house! She's my best friend!' cried the prince. "'And if you allow yourself—' he screamed in a fury, addressing Princess Mary for the first time. To forget yourself again before her as you dared to do yesterday, I will show you who is master in this house. Go! Don't let me set eyes on you. Beg her pardon." Princess Mary asked Mademoiselle Brienne's pardon, and also her father's pardon for herself and for Philip the footman, who had begged for her intervention. At such moments something like a pride of sacrifice gathered in her soul. And suddenly that father whom she had judged would look for his spectacles in her presence, fumbling near them and not seeing them, or would forget something that had just occurred, or take a false step with his failing legs and turn to see if anyone had noticed his feebleness, or, worst of all, at dinner, when there were no visitors to excite him, would suddenly fall asleep letting his napkin drop and his shaking head sink over his plate. "'He is old and feeble, and I dare to condemn him,' she thought at such moments, with a feeling of revulsion against herself. End of Book Eight, Chapter Two Book Eight, Chapter Three of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Three. In 1811, there was living in Moscow a French doctor, Metivier, who had rapidly become the fashion. He was enormously tall, handsome, amiable as Frenchmen are, and was, as all Moscow said, an extraordinarily clever doctor. He was received in the best houses not merely as a doctor, but as an equal. Prince Nicholas had always ridiculed medicine, but latterly, on Mademoiselle Burienne's advice, had allowed this doctor to visit him, and had grown accustomed to him. Metivier came to see the prince about twice a week. On December 6, St. Nicholas Day and the prince's name day, all Moscow came to the prince's front door but he gave orders to admit no one and to invite to dinner only a small number, a list of whom he gave to Princess Mary. Metivier, who came in the morning with his felicitations, considered it proper in his quality of doctor de Forcer la Consigne to force the guard, as he told Princess Mary, and went in to see the prince. It happened that on that morning of his name-day the prince was in one of his worst moods. He had been going about the house all morning finding fault with everyone, and pretending not to understand what was said to him, and not to be understood himself. Princess Mary well knew this mood of quiet, absorbed querulousness, which generally culminated in a burst of rage, and she went about all that morning as though facing a cocked and loaded gun, and awaited the inevitable explosion. Until the doctor's arrival the morning had passed off safely. After admitting the doctor, Princess Mary sat down with a book in the drawing-room, near the door through which she could hear all that passed in the study. At first she heard only Metivier's voice, then her father's, then both voices began speaking at the same time, the door was flung open, and on the threshold appeared the handsome figure of the terrified Metivier with his shock of black hair, and the prince in his dressing-gown and fez his face distorted with fury, and the pupils of his eyes rolled downwards. "'You don't understand?' shouted the prince. "'But I do! French spy! Slave of Bonaparte! Spy! Get out of my house! Be off, I tell you!' And he slammed the door. Metivier, shrugging his shoulders, went up to Mademoiselle Bourienne, who, at the sound of shouting, had run in from an adjoining room. "'The prince is not very well.' bile and rush of blood to the head. Keep calm, I will call again tomorrow," said Metivier, and putting his fingers to his lips he hastened away. Through the study door came the sound of slippered feet and the cry, "'Spies! Traitors! Traitors everywhere! Not a moment's peace in my own house!' After Metivier's departure the old prince called his daughter in, and the whole weight of his wrath fell on her. 
She was to blame that a spy had been admitted. Had he not told her, yes, told her to make a list, and not to admit anyone who was not on that list? Then why was that scoundrel admitted? She was the cause of it all. With her, he said, he could not have a moment's peace and could not die quietly. No, ma'am, we must part, we must part. Understand that, understand it. I cannot endure any more, he said, and left the room. Then, as if afraid she might find some means of consolation, he returned, and trying to appear calm, added, And don't imagine I have said this in a moment of anger. I am calm. I have thought it over, and it will be carried out. We must part. So find some place for yourself. But he could not restrain himself, and with the virulence of which only one who loves is capable, evidently suffering himself, he shook his fists at her and screamed, if only some fool would marry her! Then he slammed the door, sent for Mademoiselle Bourienne, and subsided into his study. At two o'clock the six chosen guests assembled for dinner. These guests, the famous Count Rostopchin, Prince Lepukhin with his nephew, General Chatrov, an old war comrade of the princes, and of the younger generation, Pierre and Boris Drubetskoy, awaited the prince in the drawing-room. Boris, who had come to Moscow on leave a few days before, had been anxious to be presented to Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky, and had contrived to ingratiate himself so well that the old prince, in his case, made an exception to the rule of not receiving bachelors in his house. The prince's house did not belong to what is known as fashionable society, but his little circle, though not much talked about in town, was one it was more flattering to be received in than any other. Boris had realized this the week before when the commander-in-chief in his presence invited Rostopchin to dinner on St. Nicholas Day, and Rostopchin had replied that he could not come. On that day I always go to pay my devotions to the relics of Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky. Oh, yes, yes, replied the commander-in-chief. How is he? The small group that assembled before dinner in the lofty, old-fashioned drawing-room with its old furniture resembled the solemn gathering of a court of justice. All were silent or talked in low tones. Prince Nicholas came in serious and taciturn. Princess Mary seemed even quieter and more diffident than usual. The guests were reluctant to address her, feeling that she was in no mood for their conversation. Count Rostopchin alone kept the conversation going, now relating the latest town news and now the latest political gossip. Lepukhin and the old general occasionally took part in the conversation. Prince Bolkonsky listened as a presiding judge receives a report, only now and then, silently or by a brief word, showing that he took heed of what was being reported to him. The tone of the conversation was such as indicated that no one approved of what was being done in the political world. Incidents were related evidently confirming the opinion that everything was going from bad to worse but whether telling a story or giving an opinion, the speaker always stopped, or was stopped, at the point beyond which his criticism might touch the sovereign himself. At dinner the talk turned on the latest political news. Napoleon's seizure of the Duke of Oldenburg's territory and the Russian note, hostile to Napoleon, which had been sent to all the European courts. Bonaparte treats Europe as a pirate does a captured vessel said Count Rostopchin, repeating a phrase he had uttered several times before. One only wonders at the long-suffering or blindness of the crowned heads. Now the Pope's turn has come, and Bonaparte doesn't scruple to depose the head of the Catholic Church. Yet all keep silent. Our sovereign alone has protested against the seizure of the Duke of Oldenburg's territory, and even— Count Rostopchin paused, feeling that he had reached the limit beyond which censure was impossible. "'Other territories have been offered in exchange for the Duchy of Oldenburg,' said Prince Bolkonsky. "'He shifts the dukes about as I might move my serfs from Bald Hills to Bogacharovo or my Ryazan estates.' "'The Duke of Oldenburg bears his misfortunes with admirable strength of character and resignation,' remarked Boris, joining in respectfully. He said this because on his journey from Petersburg he had had the honor of being presented to the Duke. Prince Bolkonsky glanced at the young man as if about to say something in reply, but changed his mind, evidently considering him too young. 
I have read our protest about the Oldenburg affair, and was surprised how badly the note was worded," remarked Count Rostopchin, in the casual tone of a man dealing with a subject quite familiar to him. Pierre looked at Rostopchin with naive astonishment, not understanding why he should be disturbed by the bad composition of the note. "'Does it matter, Count, how the note is worded?' he asked, so long as its substance is forcible. "'My dear fellow, with our five hundred thousand troops it should be easy to have a good style,' returned Count Rostopchin. Pierre now understood the Count's dissatisfaction with the wording of the note. "'One would have thought quill-drivers enough had sprung up,' remarked the old prince. "'There in Petersburg they are always writing, not notes only, but even new laws. My Andrew there has written a whole volume of laws for Russia. Nowadays they are always writing.' And he laughed unnaturally. There was a momentary pause in the conversation. The old general cleared his throat to draw attention. Did you hear of the last event at the review in Petersburg? The figure cut by the new French ambassador? Eh? Yes, I heard something. He said something awkward in His Majesty's presence. His Majesty drew attention to the Grenadier Division and to the march past, continued the general and it seems the ambassador took no notice and allowed himself to reply that, "'We in France pay no attention to such trifles.' The emperor did not condescend to reply. At the next review, they say, the emperor did not once deign to address him." All were silent. On this fact relating to the emperor personally, it was impossible to pass any judgment. "'Impudent fellows,' said the prince. "'You know Metivier. I turned him out of my house this morning. He was here. They admitted him in spite of my request that they should let no one in," he went on glancing angrily at his daughter. And he narrated his whole conversation with the French doctor and the reasons that convinced him that Metivier was a spy. Though these reasons were very insufficient and obscure, no one made any rejoinder. After the roast, champagne was served. The guests rose to congratulate the old prince. Princess Mary, too, went round to him. He gave her a cold, angry look and offered her his wrinkled, clean-shaven cheek to kiss. The whole expression of his face told her that he had not forgotten the morning's talk, that his decision remained in force, and only the presence of visitors hindered his speaking of it to her now. When they went into the drawing-room, where coffee was served, the old men sat together. Prince Nicholas grew more animated and expressed his views on the impending war. He said that our wars with Bonaparte would be disastrous so long as we sought alliances with the Germans, and thrust ourselves into European affairs, into which we have been drawn by the peace of Tilsit. We ought not to fight either for or against Austria. Our political interests are all in the East, and in regard to Bonaparte, the only thing is to have an armed frontier and a firm policy and he will never dare to cross the Russian frontier, as was the case in 1807." "'How can we fight the French, Prince?' said Count Rostopchin. "'Can we arm ourselves against our teachers and divinities? Look at our youths, look at our ladies. The French are our gods. Paris is our kingdom of heaven.' He began speaking louder, evidently to be heard by everyone. "'French dresses, French ideas, French feelings!' There, now, you turn Metivier out by the scruff of his neck because he's a Frenchman and a scoundrel, but our ladies crawl after him on their knees. I went to a party last night, and there out of five ladies three were Roman Catholics and had the Pope's indulgence for doing woolwork on Sundays. And they themselves sit there nearly naked, like the signboards at our public baths, if I may say so. Ah, when one looks at our young people, Prince, one would like to take Peter the Great's old cudgel out of the museum and belabor them in the Russian way till all the nonsense jumps out of them." All were silent. The old prince looked at Rostopchin with a smile and wagged his head approvingly. "'Well, good-bye, Your Excellency. Keep well,' said Rostopchin, getting up with characteristic briskness and holding out his hand to the prince. "'Good-bye, my dear fellow. His words are music. I never tire of hearing him said the old prince, keeping hold of the hand and offering his cheek to be kissed. 
Following Rostopchin's example, the others also rose. End of Book 8, Chapter 3《Book Eight, Chapter Four, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Book Eight, Chapter Four Princess Mary, as she sat listening to the old men's talk and fault-finding, understood nothing of what she heard. She only wondered whether the guests had all observed her father's hostile attitude toward her. She did not even notice the special attentions and amiabilities shown her during dinner by Boris Trubetskoy, who was visiting them for the third time already. Princess Mary turned with absent-minded questioning look to Pierre, who, had in hand and with a smile on his face, was the last of the guests to approach her after the old prince had gone out, and they were left alone in the drawing-room. "'May I stay a little longer?' he said, letting his stout body sink into an armchair beside her. Oh, yes, she answered. You noticed nothing? her look asked. Pierre was in an agreeable after dinner mood. He looked straight before him and smiled quietly. Have you known that young man long, princess? he asked. Who? Drubetskoy. No, not long. Do you like him? Yes, he is an agreeable young man. Why do you ask me that? said Princess Mary, still thinking of that morning's conversation with her father. "'Because I have noticed that when a young man comes on leave from Petersburg to Moscow, it is usually with the object of marrying an heiress.' "'You have observed that?' said Princess Mary. "'Yes,' returned Pierre with a smile. "'And this young man now manages matters so that where there is a wealthy heiress, there he is too. I can read him like a book.' At present he is hesitating whom to lay siege to, you or Mademoiselle Julie Karagina. He is very attentive to her. He visits them? Yes, very often. And do you know the new way of courting? said Pierre with an amused smile, evidently in that cheerful mood of good-humoured raillery for which he so often reproached himself in his diary. No, replied Princess Mary. To please Moscow girls nowadays, one has to be melancholy. He is very melancholy with Mademoiselle Karagina," said Pierre. Really? asked Princess Mary, looking into Pierre's kindly face and still thinking of her own sorrow. It would be a relief, thought she, if I ventured to confide what I am feeling to someone. I should like to tell everything to Pierre. He is kind and generous. It would be a relief. He would give me advice. Would you marry him? Oh, my God, Count, there are moments when I would marry anybody!" she cried suddenly to her own surprise and with tears in her voice. Ah, how bitter it is to love someone near to you and to feel that, she went on in a trembling voice, that you can do nothing for him but grieve him, and to know that you cannot alter this. Then there is only one thing left, to go away. But where could I go? What is wrong? What is it, Princess? But without finishing what she was saying, Princess Mary burst into tears. "'I don't know what is the matter with me today. Don't take any notice. Forget what I have said.' Pierre's gaiety vanished completely. He anxiously questioned the princess, asked her to speak out fully and confide her grief to him. But she only repeated that she begged him to forget what she had said, that she did not remember what she had said, and that she had no trouble except the one she knew of that Prince Andrew's marriage threatened to cause a rupture between father and son. "'Have you any news of the Rostovs?' she asked to change the subject. "'I was told they are coming soon. I am also expecting Andrew any day. I should like them to meet here.' "'And how does he now regard the matter?' asked Pierre, referring to the old prince. Princess Mary shook her head. "'What is to be done?' In a few months the year will be up. The thing is impossible. I only wish I could spare my brother the first moments. I wish they would come sooner. I hope to be friends with her. You have known them a long time," said Princess Mary. Tell me honestly the whole truth. What sort of girl is she, 
And what do you think of her? The real truth, because you know Andrew is risking so much doing this against his father's will that I should like to know." An undefined instinct told Pierre that these explanations, a repeated request to be told the whole truth, expressed ill-will on the princess' part toward her future sister-in-law, and a wish that he should disapprove of Andrew's choice. But in reply he said what he felt rather than what he thought. "'I don't know how to answer your question,' he said, blushing without knowing why. "'I really don't know what sort of girl she is. I can't analyze her at all. She is enchanting, but what makes her so, I don't know. That is all one can say about her." Princess Mary sighed, and the expression on her face said, "'Yes, that's what I expected and feared.' "'Is she clever?' she asked. Pierre considered. "'I think not,' he said. "'And yet, yes. She does not deign to be clever. Oh, no, she is simply enchanting, and that is all.' Princess Mary again shook her head disapprovingly. "'Ah, I so long to like her. Tell her so if you see her before I do.' "'I hear they are expected very soon,' said Pierre. Princess Mary told Pierre of her plan to become intimate with her future sister-in-law as soon as the Rostovs arrived, and to try to accustom the old prince to her. End of Book Eight, Chapter Four Book Eight, Chapter Five, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Five. Boris had not succeeded in making a wealthy match in Petersburg, so with the same object in view, he came to Moscow. There he wavered between the two richest heiresses, Julie and Princess Mary. Though Princess Mary, despite her plainness, seemed to him more attractive than Julie, he, without knowing why, felt awkward about paying court to her. When they at last met on the old prince's name-day, she had answered at random all his attempts to talk sentimentally, evidently not listening to what he was saying. Julie, on the contrary, accepted his attentions readily, though in a manner peculiar to herself. She was twenty-seven. After the death of her brothers she had become very wealthy. She was by now decidedly plain, but thought herself not merely as good-looking as before, but even far more attractive. She was confirmed in this delusion by the fact that she had become a very wealthy heiress, and also by the fact that the older she grew the less dangerous she became to men, and the more freely they could associate with her and avail themselves of her suppers, soirees, and the animated company that assembled at her house, without incurring any obligation. A man who would have been afraid ten years before of going every day to the house when there was a girl of seventeen there, for fear of compromising her and committing himself, would now go boldly every day, and treat her not as a marriageable girl, but as a sexless acquaintance. That winter the Karagins' house was the most agreeable and hospitable in Moscow. In addition to the formal evening and dinner parties, a large company, chiefly of men, gathered there every day, supping at midnight and staying till three in the morning. Julie never missed a ball, a promenade, or a play. Her dresses were always of the latest fashion. But in spite of that she seemed to be disillusioned about everything and told everyone that she did not believe either in friendship or in love, or any of the joys of life, and expected peace only yonder. She adopted the tone of one who has suffered a great disappointment, like a girl who has either lost the man she loved or been cruelly deceived by him. Though nothing of the kind had happened to her she was regarded in that light, and had even herself come to believe that she had suffered much in life. This melancholy which did not prevent her amusing herself, did not hinder the young people who came to her house from passing the time pleasantly. Every visitor who came to the house paid his tribute to the melancholy mood of the hostess, and then amused himself with society gossip, dancing, intellectual games, and bourrime, which were in vogue at the Karagans. Only a few of these young men, among them Boris, entered more deeply into Julie's melancholy 
and with these she had prolonged conversations in private on the vanity of all worldly things, and to them she showed her albums filled with mournful sketches, maxims, and verses. To Boris Julie was particularly gracious. She regretted his early disillusionment with life, offered him such consolation of friendship as she who had herself suffered so much could render, and showed him her album. Boris sketched two trees in the album, and wrote, Rustic trees, your dark branches shed gloom and melancholy upon me. On another page he drew a tomb and wrote, La mort est secrable et la mort est tranquille. Ah, contre le douleur il n'a pas d'autre asile. Death gives relief and death is peaceful. Ah, from suffering there is no other refuge. Julie said this was charming. There is something so enchanting in the smile of melancholy, she said to Boris, repeating word for word a passage she had copied from a book. It is a ray of light in the darkness, a shade between sadness and despair, showing the possibility of consolation. In reply, Boris wrote these lines. Aliment des boisons d'un homme trop sensible. Toi, sans que le bonheur me sera impossible. Tant de mélancolie, ah, viens me consoler. Viens calmer la tourmente de ma sombre retrait. Et mêle une douceur secrète à ces pleurs qui sont coulés. Poisonous nourishment of a too sensitive soul, thou without whom happiness would be for me impossible, tender melancholy, ah, come to console me, come to calm the torments of my gloomy retreat, and mingle a secret sweetness with these tears that I feel to be flowing. For Boris, Julie played most doleful nocturnes on her harp. Boris read poor Liza aloud to her, and more than once interrupted the reading because of the emotions that choked him. Meeting at large gatherings, Julie and Boris looked on one another as the only souls who understood one another in a world of indifferent people. Anna Mikhailovna, who often visited the Karagans, while playing cards with the mother, made careful inquiries as to Julie's dowry. She was to have two estates in Penza and the Nizhogorod forests. Anna Mikhailovna regarded the refined sadness that united her son to the wealthy Julie with emotion and resignation to the divine will. "'You are always charming and melancholy, my dear Julie,' she said to the daughter. "'Boris says his soul finds repose at your house. He has suffered so many disappointments and is so sensitive,' said she to the mother. "'Ah, my dear, I can't tell you how fond I have grown of Julie latterly she said to her son. But who could help loving her? She is an angelic being. Oh, Boris, Boris! She paused. And how I pity her mother! She went on. Today she showed me her accounts and letters from Penza. They have enormous states there, and she, poor thing, has no one to help her, and they do cheat her so. Boris smiled almost imperceptibly while listening to his mother. He laughed blandly at her naive diplomacy, but listened to what she had to say, and sometimes questioned her carefully about the Panza and Nizhogorod estates. Julie had long been expecting a proposal from her melancholy adorer and was ready to accept it, but some secret feeling of repulsion for her, for her passionate desire to get married, for her artificiality, and a feeling of horror at renouncing the possibility of real love still restrained Boris his leave was expiring. He spent every day and whole days at the Kragans, and every day, on thinking the matter over, told himself that he would propose tomorrow. But in Julie's presence, looking at her red face and chin, nearly always powdered, her moist eyes, and her expression of continual readiness to pass at once from melancholy into an unnatural rapture of married bliss, Boris could not utter the decisive words though in imagination he had long regarded himself as the possessor of those Penza and Nishigarod estates, and had apportioned the use of the income from them. Julie saw Boris' indecision, and sometimes the thought occurred to her that she was repulsive to him, but her feminine self-deception immediately supplied her with consolation, and she told herself that he was only shy from love. 
Her melancholy, however, began to turn to irritability, and not long before Boris' departure she formed a definite plan of action. Just as Boris' leave of absence was expiring, Anatole Karagin made his appearance in Moscow, and of course in the Karagin's drawing-room, and Julie, suddenly abandoning her melancholy, became cheerful and very attentive to Karagin. "'My dear,' said Anna Mikhailovna to her son, "'I know from a reliable source that Prince Vasily has sent his son to Moscow to get him married to Julie. I am so fond of Julie that I should be sorry for her. What do you think of it, my dear?' The idea of being made a fool of and having thrown away that whole month of arduous melancholy service to Julie, and of seeing all the revenue from the Penza estates, which he had already mentally apportioned and put to proper use, fall into the hands of another, and especially into the hands of that idiot Anatole, pained Boris. He drove to the Karagans with the firm intention of proposing. Julie met him in a gay, careless manner, spoke casually of how she had enjoyed yesterday's ball, and asked him when he was leaving. Though Boris had come intentionally to speak of his love and therefore meant to be tender, he began speaking irritably of feminine inconstancy, of how easily women can turn from sadness to joy, and how their moods depend solely on who happens to be paying court to them. Julie was offended, and replied that it was true that a woman needs variety, and the same thing over and over again would weary anyone. Then I should advise you, Boris began, wishing to sting her. But at that instant the galling thought occurred to him that he might have to leave Moscow without having accomplished his aim, and have vainly wasted his efforts, which was a thing he never allowed to happen. He checked himself in the middle of the sentence, lowered his eyes to avoid seeing her unpleasantly irritated and irresolute face, and said, "'I did not come here at all to quarrel with you. On the contrary, he glanced at her to make sure that he might go on. Her irritability had suddenly quite vanished, and her anxious, imploring eyes were fixed on him with greedy expectation. "'I can always arrange so as not to see her often,' thought Boris. "'The affair has begun and must be finished.' He blushed hotly, raised his eyes to hers, and said, "'You know my feelings for you.' There was no need to say more. Julie's face shone with triumph and self-satisfaction, but she forced Boris to say all that is said on such occasions, that he loved her and had never loved any other woman more than her. She knew that for the Penza estates and the Nezhogorod forests she could demand this, and she received what she demanded. The affianced couple, no longer alluding to trees that shed gloom and melancholy upon them, planned the arrangements of a splendid house in Petersburg, paid calls, and prepared everything for a brilliant wedding. End of Book 8, Chapter 5「Book 8, Chapter 6 Of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8, Chapter 6 At the end of January, old Count Rostov went to Moscow with Natasha and Sonia. The Countess was still unwell and unable to travel, but it was impossible to wait for her recovery. Prince Andrew was expected in Moscow any day, the trousseau had to be ordered, and the estate near Moscow had to be sold besides which the opportunity of presenting his future daughter-in-law to old Prince Bolkonsky while he was in Moscow could not be missed. The Rostovs' Moscow house had not been heated that winter, and as they had come only for a short time and the Countess was not with them, the Count decided to stay with Maria Dmitrievna Akrasimova, who had long been pressing her hospitality on them. Late one evening, the Rostovs' four sleighs drove into Maria Dmitrievna's courtyard in the old Konyushiny street. Maria Dmitrievna lived alone. She had already married off her daughter, and her sons were all in the service. She held herself as erect, told everyone her opinion as candidly, loudly, and bluntly as ever, and her whole bearing seemed a reproach to others for any weakness, passion, or temptation, the possibility of which she did not admit. From early in the morning, 
wearing a dressing jacket, she attended to her household affairs, and then she drove out, on holy days to church and after the service to jails and prisons on affairs of which she never spoke to anyone. On ordinary days, after dressing, she received petitioners of various classes, of whom there were always some. Then she had dinner, a substantial and appetizing meal at which there were always three or four guests. After dinner she played a game of Boston, and at night she had the newspapers or a new book read to her while she knitted. She rarely made an exception and went out to pay visits, and then only to the most important persons in the town. She had not yet gone to bed when the Rostovs arrived, and the pulley of the hall door squeaked from the cold as it led in the Rostovs and their servants. Maria Dmitrievna, with her spectacles hanging down on her nose and her head flung back, stood in the hall doorway looking with a stern, grim face at the new arrivals. One might have thought she was angry with the travellers and would immediately turn them out, had she not at the same time been giving careful instructions to the servants for the accommodation of the visitors and their belongings. "'The Count's things? Bring them here,' she said, pointing to the portmanteaus and not greeting anyone. "'The young ladies? There, to the left. Now what are you dawdling for?' she cried to the maids. "'Get the samovar ready.' "'You've grown plumper and prettier.' she remarked, drawing Natasha, whose cheeks were glowing from the cold, to her by the hood. "'Foo! You are cold! Now take off your things, quick!' she shouted to the Count, who was going to kiss her hand. "'You're half-frozen, I'm sure. Bring some rum for tea!' "'Bonjour, Sonia, dear,' she added, turning to Sonia and indicating by this French greeting her slightly contemptuous though affectionate attitude toward her. When they came in to tea, having taken off their outdoor things and tidied themselves up after their journey, Maria Dmitrievna kissed them all in due order. "'I'm heartily glad you have come and are staying with me. It was high time,' she said, giving Natasha a significant look. "'The old man is here, and his son's expected any day. You'll have to make his acquaintance. But we'll speak of that later on,' she added glancing at Sonia with a look that showed she did not want to speak of it in her presence. "'Now listen,' she said to the Count. "'What do you want tomorrow? Whom will you send for? Shinshin? She crooked one of her fingers. "'The sniveling Anna Mikhailovna? That's two. She's here with her son. The son is getting married. Then Bazukov, eh? He is here, too, with his wife.' He ran away from her and she came galloping after him. He dined with me on Wednesday. As for them, and she pointed to the girls, tomorrow I'll take them first to the Iberian shrine of the Mother of God, and then we'll drive to the Super Rogues. I suppose you'll have everything new. Don't judge by me. Sleeves nowadays are this size. The other day young Princess Irina Vesalevna came to see me. She was an awful sight looked as if she had put two barrels on her arms. You know, not a day passes now without some new fashion. And what have you to do yourself? she asked the Count sternly. One thing has come on top of another. Her rags to buy, and now a purchaser has turned up for the Moscow estate and for the house. If you will be so kind, I'll fix a time and go down to the estate just for a day. I'll leave my lassies with you. All right, all right. They'll be safe with me, as safe as in Chancery. I'll take them where they must go, scold them a bit, and pet them a bit," said Maria Dmitrievna, touching her goddaughter and favorite Natasha on the cheek with her large hand. Next morning Maria Dmitrievna took the young ladies to the Iberian shrine of the Mother of God, and to Madame Super Rouguet, who was so afraid of Maria Dmitrievna that she always let her have costumes at a loss, merely to get rid of her. Maria Dmitrievna ordered almost the whole trousseau. When they got home she turned everybody out of the room except Natasha, and then called her pet to her armchair. "'Well, now we'll talk. I congratulate you on your betrothed. You've hooked a fine fellow. I am glad for your sake, and I've known him since he was so high.' She held her hand a couple of feet from the ground. Natasha blushed happily. "'I like him and all his family. Now listen. You know that old Prince Nicholas much dislikes his son's marrying. 
the old fellow's crotchety. Of course, Prince Andrew is not a child and can shift without him, but it's not nice to enter a family against a father's will. One wants to do it peacefully and lovingly. You're a clever girl and you'll know how to manage. Be kind and use your wits. Then all will be well." Natasha remained silent, from shyness Maria Dmitrievna supposed, but really because she disliked anyone interfering in what touched her love of Prince Andrew, which seemed to her so apart from all human affairs that no one could understand it. She loved and knew Prince Andrew, he loved her only, and was to come one of these days and take her. She wanted nothing more. You see, I have known him a long time, and am also fond of Mary, your future sister-in-law. Husband's sisters bring up blisters, but this one wouldn't hurt a fly. She has asked me to bring you two together. Tomorrow you'll go with your father to see her. Be very nice and affectionate to her. You're younger than she. When he comes, he'll find you already know his sister and father and are liked by them. Am I right or not? Won't that be best?" "'Yes, it will,' Natasha answered reluctantly. End of Book Eight, Chapter Six Book Eight, Chapter Seven of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Seven. Next day, by Maria Dmitrievna's advice, Count Rostov took Natasha to call on Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky. The Count did not set out cheerfully on this visit. At heart, he felt afraid. He well remembered the last interview he had had with the old prince at the time of the enrollment, when, in reply to an invitation to dinner, he had to listen to an angry reprimand for not having provided his full quota of men. Natasha, on the other hand, having put on her best gown, was in the highest spirits. "'They can't help liking me,' she thought. "'Everybody always has liked me, and I am so willing to do anything they wish, so ready to be fond of him, for being his father, and of her, for being his sister, that there is no reason for them not to like me.' They drove up to the gloomy old house on the Vazvezenka and entered the vestibule. "'Well, the Lord have mercy on us,' said the Count, half in jest, half in earnest. But Natasha noticed that her father was flurried on entering the anteroom, and inquired timidly and softly whether the prince and princess were at home. When they had been announced, a perturbation was noticeable among the servants. The footman who had gone to announce them was stopped by another in the large hall, and they whispered to one another. Then a maidservant ran into the hall and hurriedly said something, mentioning the princess. At last an old, cross-looking footman came and announced to the Rostovs that the prince was not receiving, but that the princess begged them to walk up. The first person who came to meet the visitors was Mademoiselle Bourienne. She greeted the father and daughter with special politeness and showed them to the princess' room. The princess, looking excited and nervous, her face flushed in patches, ran in to meet the visitors, treading heavily and vainly trying to appear cordial and at ease. From the first glance Princess Mary did not like Natasha. She thought her too fashionably dressed, frivolously gay and vain. She did not at all realize that, before having seen her future sister-in-law, she was prejudiced against her by involuntary envy of her beauty, youth and happiness, as well as by jealousy of her brother's love for her. Apart from this insuperable antipathy to her, Princess Mary was agitated just then because on the Rostovs' being announced, the old prince had shouted that he did not wish to see them, that Princess Mary might do so if she chose, but they were not to be admitted to him. She had decided to receive them, but feared lest the prince might at any moment indulge in some freak, as he seemed much upset by the Rostovs' visit. "'There, my dear princess, I brought you my songstress,' said the Count, bowing and looking round uneasily, as if afraid the old prince might appear. "'I am so glad you should get to know one another. Very sorry the prince is still ailing.' And after a few more commonplace remarks he rose. 
If you'll allow me to leave my Natasha in your hands for a quarter of an hour, Princess, I'll drive round to see Anna Semenovna. It's quite near in the Dog Square, and then I'll come back for her." The Count had devised this diplomatic ruse, as he afterwards told his daughter, to give the future sisters-in-law an opportunity to talk to one another freely, but another motive was to avoid the danger of encountering the old prince, of whom he was afraid. He did not mention this to his daughter, but Natasha noticed her father's nervousness and anxiety, and felt mortified by it. She blushed for him, grew still angrier at having blushed, and looked at the princess with a bold and defiant expression which said that she was not afraid of anybody. The princess told the Count that she would be delighted, and only begged him to stay longer at Anna Semenovna's, and he departed. Despite the uneasy glances thrown at her by Princess Mary, who wished to have a tete-a-tete -tete with Natasha, Mademoiselle Bourienne remained in the room, and persistently talked about Moscow amusements and theatres. Natasha felt offended by the hesitation she had noticed in the anteroom, by her father's nervousness, and by the unnatural manner of the princess, who, she thought, was making a favour of receiving her, and so everything displeased her. She did not like Princess Mary, whom she thought very plain, affected, and dry. Natasha suddenly shrank into herself, and involuntarily assumed an off-hand air which alienated Princess Mary still more. After five minutes of irksome, constrained conversation, they heard the sound of slippered feet rapidly approaching. Princess Mary looked frightened. The door opened, and the old prince, in a dressing-gown and a white nightcap, came in. "'Ah! Madam!' he began. "'Madam! Countess! Countess Rostova, if I am not mistaken! I beg you to excuse me, to excuse me. I did not know, madam. God is my witness. I did not know you had honored us with a visit, and I came in such a costume only to see my daughter. I beg you to excuse me. God is my witness. I didn't know. He repeated, stressing the word God so unnaturally and so unpleasantly, that Princess Mary stood with downcast eyes, not daring to look either at her father or at Natasha. Nor did the latter, having risen and curtsied, know what to do. Mademoiselle Burienne alone smiled agreeably. "'I beg you to excuse me, excuse me. God is my witness. I did not know,' muttered the old man, and after looking Natasha over from head to foot, he went out. Mademoiselle Burienne was the first to recover herself after this apparition, and began speaking about the prince's indisposition. Natasha and Princess Mary looked at one another in silence, and the longer they did so without saying what they wanted to say, the greater grew their antipathy to one another. When the Count returned, Natasha was impolitely pleased and hastened to get away. At that moment she hated the stiff, elderly Princess, who could place her in such an embarrassing position, and had spent half an hour with her without once mentioning Prince Andrew. "'I couldn't begin talking about him in the presence of that French woman thought Natasha. The same thought was meanwhile tormenting Princess Mary. She knew what she ought to have said to Natasha, but she had been unable to say it because Mademoiselle Bourienne was in the way, and because, without knowing why, she felt it very difficult to speak of the marriage. When the Count was already leaving the room, Princess Mary went up hurriedly to Natasha, took her by the hand, and said with a deep sigh, "'Wait! I must—' Natasha glanced at her ironically, without knowing why. "'Dear Natalie,' said Princess Mary, "'I want you to know that I am glad my brother has found happiness.' She paused, feeling that she was not telling the truth. Natasha noticed this and guessed its reason. "'I think, Princess, it is not convenient to speak of that now,' she said with external dignity and coldness, though she felt the tears choking her. What have I said, and what have I done?" thought she, as soon as she was out of the room. They waited a long time for Natasha to come to dinner that day. She sat in her room crying like a child, blowing her nose and sobbing. Sonia stood beside her, kissing her hair. "'Natasha, what is it about?' she asked. "'What do they matter to you? It will all pass, Natasha.' "'But if you only knew how offensive it was! As if I—' Don't talk about it, Natasha. It wasn't your fault, so why should you mind? Kiss me," said Sonia. 
Natasha raised her head and, kissing her friend on the lips, pressed her wet face against her. "'I can't tell you. I don't know. No one's to blame,' said Natasha. "'It's my fault. But it all hurts terribly. Oh, why doesn't he come?' She came into dinner with red eyes. Marya Dmitrievna, who knew how the prince had received the Rostovs, pretended not to notice how upset Natasha was, and jested resolutely and loudly at the table with the Count and the other guests. End of Book 8, Chapter 7「Book Eight, Chapter Eight of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Eight. That evening, the Rostovs went to the opera, for which Maria Dmitrievna had taken a box. Natasha did not want to go but could not refuse Maria Dmitrievna's kind offer, which was intended expressly for her. When she came ready-dressed into the ballroom to await her father, and looking in the large mirror there saw that she was pretty, very pretty, she felt even more sad, but it was a sweet, tender sadness. "'Oh, God! If he were here now, I would not behave as I did then, but differently. I would not be silly and afraid of things. I would simply embrace him, cling to him, and make him look at me with those searching, inquiring eyes with which he has so often looked at me, and then I would make him laugh as he used to laugh. And his eyes! How I see those eyes!" thought Natasha. And what do his father and sister matter to me? I love him alone, him, him, with that face and those eyes, with his smile, manly and yet childlike. No, I had better not think of him, not think of him, but forget him, quite forget him for the present. I can't bear this waiting, and I shall cry in a minute." And she turned away from the glass, making an effort not to cry. And how can Sonia love Nicholas so calmly and quietly, and wait so long and so patiently? thought she, looking at Sonia, who also came in quite ready, with a fan in her hand. No, she's altogether different. I can't." Natasha at that moment felt so softened and tender that it was not enough for her to love and know she was beloved. She wanted now, at once, to embrace the man she loved, to speak and hear from him words of love such as filled her heart. While she sat in the carriage beside her father, pensively watching the lights of the street lamps flickering on the frozen window, she felt still sadder and more in love and forgot where she was going and with whom. Having fallen into the line of carriages, the Rostovs' carriage drove up to the theatre, its wheels squeaking over the snow. Natasha and Sonia, holding up their dresses, jumped out quickly. The Count got out helped by the footman, and passing among men and women who were entering and the program sellers, they all three went along the corridor to the first row of boxes. Through the closed doors the music was already audible. Natasha, your hair," whispered Sonia. An attendant deferentially and quickly slipped before the ladies and opened the door of their box. The music sounded louder, and through the door rows of brightly lit boxes in which ladies sat with bare arms and shoulders, and noisy stalls brilliant with uniforms glittered before their eyes. A lady entering the next box shot a glance of feminine envy at Natasha. The curtain had not yet risen, and the overture was being played. Natasha, smoothing her gown, went in with Sonia and sat down, scanning the brilliant tiers of boxes opposite. A sensation she had not experienced for a long time, that of hundreds of eyes looking at her bare arms and neck, suddenly affected her both agreeably and disagreeably, and called up a whole crowd of memories, desires, and emotions associated with that feeling. The two remarkably pretty girls, Natasha and Sonia, with Count Rostov, who had not been seen in Moscow for a long time, attracted general attention. Moreover, everybody knew vaguely of Natasha's engagement to Prince Andrew, and knew that the Rostovs had lived in the country ever since, and all looked with curiosity at a fiancé who was making one of the best matches in Russia. 
Natasha's looks, as everyone told her, had improved in the country, and that evening, thanks to her agitation, she was particularly pretty. She struck those who saw her by her fullness of life and beauty, combined with her indifference to everything about her. Her black eyes looked at the crowd without seeing anyone, and her delicate arm, bare to above the elbow, lay on the velvet edge of the box, while evidently, unconsciously, she opened and closed her hand in time to the music, crumpling her program. "'Look, there's Alanina,' said Sonia. "'With her mother, isn't it?' "'Dear me! Michael Kirillovich has grown still stouter,' remarked the Count. "'Look at our Anna Mikhailovna. What a headdress she has on!' "'The Karagans, Julie, and Boris with them. One can see at once that they're engaged. Drubetskoy has proposed.' "'Oh, yes, I heard it to-day,' said Shinshin, coming into the Rostov's box. Natasha looked in the direction in which her father's eyes were turned, and saw Julie sitting beside her mother with a happy look on her face, and a string of pearls round her thick red neck, which Natasha knew was covered with powder. Behind them, wearing a smile and leaning over with an ear to Julie's mouth, was Boris' handsome, smoothly brushed head. He looked at the Rostovs from under his brows and said something smiling to his betrothed. "'They are talking about us, about me and him,' thought Natasha. "'And he no doubt is calming her jealousy of me. They needn't trouble themselves. If only they knew how little I am concerned about any of them.' Behind them sat Anna Mikhailovna wearing a green headdress, and with a happy look of resignation to the will of God on her face. Their box was pervaded by that atmosphere of an affianced couple which Natasha knew so well and liked so much. She turned away and suddenly remembered all that had been so humiliating in her morning's visit. "'What right has he not to wish to receive me into his family? Oh, better not to think of it, not till he comes back,' she told herself and began looking at the faces, some strange and some familiar in the stalls. In the front, in the very center, leaning back against the orchestra rail, stood Dolokhov in a Persian dress, his curly hair brushed up into a huge shock. He stood in full view of the audience, well aware that he was attracting everyone's attention, yet as much at ease as though he were in his own room. Around him thronged Moscow's most brilliant young men, whom he evidently dominated. The Count, laughing, nudged the blushing Sonia and pointed to her former adorer. "'Do you recognize him?' said he. "'And where has he sprung from?' he asked, turning to Shinshin. "'Didn't he vanish somewhere?' "'He did,' replied Shinshin. "'He was in the Caucasus and ran away from there. "'They say he has been acting as minister to some ruling prince in Persia, where he killed the Shah's brother. Now all the Moscow ladies are mad about him. It's Dolokhov the Persian that does it. We never hear a word but Dolokhov is mentioned. They swear by him. They offer him to you as they would a dish of choice sterlet. Dolokhov and Anatol Karagin have turned all our ladies' heads. A tall, beautiful woman with a mass of plaited hair and much exposed plump white shoulders and neck round which she wore a double string of large pearls, entered the adjoining box, rustling her heavy silk dress, and took a long time settling into her place. Natasha involuntarily gazed at that neck, those shoulders and pearls and coiffure, and admired the beauty of the shoulders and the pearls. While Natasha was fixing her gaze on her for the second time, the lady looked round and, meeting the Count's eyes, nodded to him and smiled. She was the Countess Bezukhova, Pierre's wife, and the Count, who knew everybody in society, leaned over and spoke to her. "'Have you been here long, Countess?' he inquired. "'I'll call. I'll call to kiss your hand. I'm here on business, and have brought my girls with me. They say Semenova acts marvelously. Count Pierre never used to forget us. Is he here?' "'Yes, he meant to look in.' answered Elaine, and glanced attentively at Natasha. Count Rostov resumed his seat. "'Handsome, isn't she?' he whispered to Natasha. "'Wonderful,' answered Natasha. 
she's a woman one could easily fall in love with." Just then the last chords of the overture were heard, and the conductor tapped with his stick. Some latecomers took their seats in the stalls, and the curtain rose. As soon as it rose, everyone in the boxes and stalls became silent, and all the men, old and young, in uniform and evening dress, and all the women with gems on their bare flesh, turned their whole attention with eager curiosity to the stage. Natasha, too, began to look at it. End of Book Eight, Chapter Eight Book Eight, Chapter Nine of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Nine The floor of the stage consisted of smooth boards. At the sides was some painted cardboard representing trees, and at the back was a cloth stretched over boards. In the center of the stage sat some girls in red bodices and white skirts. One very fat girl in a white dress sat apart on a low bench, to the back of which a piece of green cardboard was glued. They all sang something. When they had finished their song, the girl in white went up to the prompter's box, and a man with tight silk trousers over his stout legs, and holding a plume and a dagger, went up to her and began singing, waving his arms about. First the man in tight trousers sang alone, then she sang, then they both paused while the orchestra played, and the man fingered the hand of the girl in white, obviously awaiting the bee to start singing with her. They sang together and everyone in the theatre began clapping and shouting, while the man and woman on the stage, who represented lovers, began smiling, spreading out their arms and bowing. After her life in the country, and in her present serious mood, all this seemed grotesque and amazing to Natasha. She could not follow the opera, nor even listen to the music. She saw only the painted cardboard and the queerly dressed men and women who moved, spoke, and sang so strangely in that brilliant light. She knew what it was all meant to represent, but it was so pretentiously false and unnatural that she first felt ashamed for the actors and then amused at them. She looked at the faces of the audience, seeking in them the same sense of ridicule and perplexity she herself experienced but they all seemed attentive to what was happening on the stage, and expressed delight which to Natasha seemed feigned. "'I suppose it has to be like this,' she thought. She kept looking round, in turn at the rows of pomaded heads in the stalls, and then at the semi-nude women in the boxes, especially at Elaine in the next box, who, apparently quite unclothed, sat with a quiet tranquil smile not taking her eyes off the stage and feeling the bright light that flooded the whole place and the warm air heated by the crowd, Natasha, little by little, began to pass into a state of intoxication she had not experienced for a long while. She did not realize who and where she was, nor what was going on before her. As she looked and thought, the strangest fancies unexpectedly and disconnectedly passed through her mind. The idea occurred to her of jumping onto the edge of the box and singing the aria the actress was singing, then she wished to touch with her fan an old gentleman sitting not far from her, then to lean over to Elaine and tickle her. At a moment when all was quiet before the commencement of a song, a door leading to the stalls on the side nearest the Rostovs' box creaked, and the steps of a belated arrival were heard. "'There's Kragan," whispered Shinshin. Countess Bezikova turned smiling to the newcomer, and Natasha, following the direction of that look, saw an exceptionally handsome adjutant approaching their box with a self-assured yet courteous bearing. This was Anatole Karagin, whom she had seen and noticed long ago at the ball in Petersburg. He was now in an adjutant's uniform with one epaulette and a shoulder knot. He moved with a restrained swagger, which would have been ridiculous had he not been so good-looking and had his handsome face not worn such an expression of good-humored complacency and gaiety. Though the performance was proceeding, he walked deliberately down the carpeted gangway, his sword and spurs slightly jingling and his handsome perfumed head held high. Having looked at Natasha, he approached his sister, 
laid his well-gloved hand on the edge of her box, nodded to her, and leaning forward asked a question with a motion toward Natasha. "'Mais charmante,' said he, evidently referring to Natasha, who did not exactly hear his words but understood them from the movement of his lips. He then took his place in the first row of the stalls, and sat down beside Dolokhov, nudging with his elbow, in a friendly and off-hand way, that Dolokhov whom others treated so fawningly. He winked at him gaily, smiled, and rested his foot against the orchestra screen. "'How like the brother is to the sister,' remarked the Count. "'And how handsome they both are!' Shinshin, lowering his voice, began to tell the Count of some intrigue of Karagin's in Moscow, and Natasha tried to overhear it just because he had said she was charmant. The first act was over. In the stalls everyone began moving about, going out and coming in. Boris came to the Rostovs' box, received their congratulations very simply, and raising his eyebrows with an absent-minded smile conveyed to Natasha and Sonia his fiancée's invitation to her wedding and went away. Natasha, with a gay, coquettish smile, talked to him, and congratulated on his approaching wedding that same Boris with whom she had formerly been in love. In the state of intoxication she was in, everything seemed simple and natural. The scantily clad Elaine smiled at everyone in the same way, and Natasha gave Boris a similar smile. Elaine's box was filled and surrounded from the stalls by the most distinguished and intellectual men, who seemed to vie with one another in their wish to let everyone see that they knew her. During the whole of that entr'acte, Karagin stood with Dolokhov in front of the orchestra partition, looking at the Rostovs' box. Natasha knew he was talking about her, and this afforded her pleasure. She even turned so that he should see her profile in what she thought was its most becoming aspect. Before the beginning of the second act, Pierre appeared in the stalls. The Rostovs had not seen him since their arrival. His face looked sad, and he had grown still stouter since Natasha last saw him. He passed up to the front rows, not noticing anyone. Anatole went up to him and began speaking to him, looking at and indicating the Rostovs' box. On seeing Natasha, Pierre grew animated, and hastily passing between the rows came toward their box. When he got there he leaned on his elbows and, smiling, talked to her for a long time. While conversing with Pierre, Natasha heard a man's voice in Countess Bezukhova's box, and something told her it was Karagin. She turned and their eyes met. Almost smiling, he gazed straight into her eyes, with such an enraptured caressing look, that it seemed strange to be so near him, to look at him like that, to be so sure he admired her and not to be acquainted with him. In the second act, there was scenery representing tombstones, there was a round hole in the canvas to represent the moon, shades were raised over the footlights, and from horns and contrabass came deep notes while many people appeared from right and left wearing black cloaks and holding things like daggers in their hands. They began waving their arms. Then some other people ran in and began dragging away the maiden who had been in white and was now in light blue. They did not drag her away at once but sang with her for a long time and then at last dragged her off, and behind the scenes something metallic was struck three times, and everyone knelt down and sang a prayer. All these things were repeatedly interrupted by the enthusiastic shouts of the audience. During this act, every time Natasha looked toward the stalls, she saw Anatole Karagin with an arm thrown across the back of his chair staring at her. She was pleased to see that he was captivated by her, and it did not occur to her that there was anything wrong in it. When the second act was over, Countess Bezukhova rose, turned to the Rostovs' box, her whole bosom completely exposed, beckoned the old count with a gloved finger, and paying no attention to those who had entered her box, began talking to him with an amiable smile. "'Do make me acquainted with your charming daughters,' said she. "'The whole town is singing their praises, and I don't even know them.' Natasha rose and curtsied to the splendid countess. She was so pleased by praise from this brilliant beauty that she blushed with pleasure. "'I want to become a Muscovite too now,' said Elaine. "'How is it you're not ashamed to bury such pearls in the country?' 
Countess Bezukhova quite deserved her reputation of being a fascinating woman. She could say what she did not think, especially what was flattering, quite simply and naturally. "'Dear Count, you must let me look after your daughters. Though I am not staying here long this time, nor are you, I will try to amuse them. I have already heard much of you in Petersburg and wanted to get to know you,' said she to Natasha with her stereotyped and lovely smile. I had heard about you from my page, Drubetskoy. Have you heard he is getting married? And also from my husband's friend Bolkonsky, Prince Andrew Bolkonsky, she went on with special emphasis, implying that she knew of his relation to Natasha. To get better acquainted, she asked that one of the young ladies should come into her box for the rest of the performance, and Natasha moved over to it. The scene of the third act represented a palace in which many candles were burning and pictures of knights with short beards hung on the walls. In the middle stood what were probably a king and a queen. The king waved his right arm and, evidently nervous, sang something badly and sat down on a crimson throne. The maiden, who had been first in white and then in light blue, now wore only a smock and stood beside the throne with her hair down. She sang something mournfully, addressing the queen but the king waved his arm severely, and men and women with bare legs came in from both sides and began dancing all together. Then the violins played very shrilly and merrily, and one of the women with thick bare legs and thin arms, separating from the others, went behind the wings, adjusted her bodice, returned to the middle of the stage, and began jumping and striking one foot rapidly against the other. In the stalls everyone clapped and shouted, Bravo! Then one of the men went into a corner of the stage. The cymbals and horns in the orchestra struck up more loudly, and this man with bare legs jumped very high and waved his feet about very rapidly. He was Dupour, who received sixty thousand roubles a year for this art. Everybody in the stalls, boxes and galleries began clapping and shouting with all their might, and the man stopped and began smiling and bowing to all sides. Then other men and women danced with bare legs. Then the king again shouted to the sound of music, and they all began singing. But suddenly a storm came on. Chromatic scales and diminished sevenths were heard in the orchestra. Everyone ran off, again dragging one of their number away, and the curtain dropped. Once more there was a terrible noise and clatter among the audience, and with rapturous faces everyone began shouting, To poor! To poor! To poor! Natasha no longer thought this strange. She looked about with pleasure, smiling joyfully. "'Isn't to poor delightful?' Elaine asked her. "'Oh, yes,' replied Natasha. End of Book 8, Chapter 9